In an undisclosed location, two people are being kept prisoner. One of them is wearing military-like clothing, while the other has a simple tracksuit on him. The military guy begins speaking, expressing his apology to the professor. The professor rebukes this apology, saying that all of this happened because of him. The soldier starts thinking about the events that got him in this situation, expressing his anger at the informant who had betrayed them, saying that the enemy force was much larger than anticipated, and that they knew their route and attack timings perfectly. This was a trap from the very beginning. Some clanks happened beyond the door, and it shortly opens, one of the guards throwing another soldier into the holding cell, who we find out is named Sergeant Kim. The other soldier is visibly angry at seeing another soldier treated this way, and gets up to spout insults at their captor. The guard saying something in a language that we can't understand, and promptly bashes the soldier's head with an assault rifle. We get a peek at this captor, showing us that he is of African descent, meaning this whole ordeal might be happening in one of the many war-torn countries in that continent. Kim asks the other soldier if he's okay, calling him lieutenant. The lieutenant says he's fine, and asks about the other troops, who Kim says that they were dragged off someplace else. More clanks happened outside the door, and again, it shortly opens after. One of the guards looking down at them, that's when he falls to the ground, knocked out by a person who was behind him, who asks if Lieutenant Kang Ham Chan is here. The lieutenant is surprised to hear Korean coming from this stranger's mouth, and asks who he is. The stranger says that he is here to rescue them, and they all begin following him. We see the results of this stranger's arrival, with multiple guards knocked out cold, Kang expressing his surprise. Kong then asks the stranger about his division, and how many people he is with. The stranger says that he cannot disclose this information, and that he is alone. Kong is again surprised by this, thinking that how could a single person do this? Stealthily, too. A door suddenly opens and a guard comes out, who is reaching for his gun after he saw them. Kong is prepared to open fire, but before he can do anything the stranger sprints at the guards, and incapacitates the first one with two swift blows, and taking the other one out with a knife throw. The stranger talks with the soldiers, saying that they will increase their pace, and that he will take care of the enemies. Kang agrees, annoyed at the fact that he's basically treating them like baggage. The stranger moves swiftly, and quickly defeats any guards that try to stop him. Kang noticed that there will be multiple enemies beyond the next corner, and that the stranger will need help with this one. The stranger, however, keeps moving, and dashes in front of the guards, silently taking all of them out. Kang is shocked at his disregard for life, saying that he is a true monster, but he is too reckless, and it's clear that he's not from the military. They make it outside, and the stranger tells them to wait here for one minute. Kang is puzzled by this, but notice the other soldiers behind them, who are clearly out of breath, showing the stranger's ability to observe. Kang notices the stranger's black pupils, and his clumsy but overall good Korean. Kang asks if he is Korean, but the stranger doesn't respond, and waits a bit until saying that time is up, and they begin moving again, Kang wondering if he is correct. After a while they make it to a clearing, where the other soldiers who were captured are waiting for them, both parties happy that they reunited. Kong asks what happened to them, and they say that the stranger also saved them, and told them to wait here. The stranger proclaims that this is where they part ways, and that if they go southwest there will be people waiting for them. Kong expresses his gratitude, but the stranger says there's no need for thanks, and that he simply carried out a request. Kang confirms his suspicion of him being a mercenary, and offers him a handshake, saying that even if it was a request, he would still like to give his thanks. The stranger looks at Kang's hand, and that's when an explosion comes out of the bushes, surprising them both. The stranger screams for everyone to get down, an explosion occurring right as he finished his sentence. Kang gets discombobulated by the explosion, but he manages to survive, saying that the explosion was from mortar rounds. He looks for his people and finds that they are safe, the explosion having missed them. Suddenly gunshots can be heard, and we see the stranger retaliating at the attackers. Kong is extremely surprised by his appearance, and rightly so, because the stranger looks just like a teenager, showing us that he is quite young. It cuts to six months later, and we see the outside of a school. Inside, a teacher is presenting a new student to a class, who is the stranger that helped the soldiers escape. While presenting himself, we finally get his name, Yu Ijin. Inside the school, a girl thinks about her brother. 
Her thinking gets cut short after a girl come into class screaming about a new student, who is apparently very good looking. The girl knows that they are talking about her brother, the brother she never expected to be alive due to a plane crash that occurred while he was inside. Inside an airport, she looks longingly at Ijin, who we find out is her brother. Next to him is an old man, who is gently touching his face while crying, expressing his surprise and happiness at him returning alive. The girl question if that is really her brother. That's when Ijin looks at her, and gently smiles at her, saying that she must be Dayun. Her thinking is interrupted by a girl, who is annoyed at Dayun for ignoring her for so long. The girl demands Dayun's gym clothes later during PE, and asks if he brought them. Dayun says that she did, but if she gives the to the girl, what will she wear? The girl scoffs at Dayun, and calls her insane for talking back to them, slapping her across the head. The girl is clearly bullying Dayun, and asks if she wants to get beaten up in front of everyone to the point of crying again, showing us that this bullying has gone on for a while. We cut back to the class that Ijin is attending, where the teacher is still presenting him to the class, saying that he was living abroad for personal reasons, and that they should help him adjust to his new life. The girls are all quite infatuated with him. The teacher tells him to take a seat in an empty seat, and he obliges. While walking to his seat, a guy with red hair and an orange tracksuit glares at him, wondering why people are fawning over him, and that he looks pretty weak, big words coming from someone that looks like he's trying to cosplay a Oompa Loompa. The guy tries to humiliate Ijin by trying to trip him, but Ijin notices instantly and stops. The guy is surprised by this, thinking that he timed it perfectly. Ijin glares at him, which annoys him. That's when Ijin thinks about what he discussed with Kong, the lieutenant. Kong told him to avoid fighting while living in Korea, and Ijin obliges, saying that he won't engage in battle if he doesn't have enough data about the place, and that he has no intention of moving too hastily and getting killed. Ijin says that he is a professional who lived on the battlefield for ten years, quite a lot considering his age. Kang stops him from his rant, saying that's not why he's telling him this, and more so for his opponent, expressing his worry for anyone he faces. The teacher noticed that Ijin is standing still, and asks why he stopped moving. Ijin apologies, and continues walking to the seat. The guy says that Ijin is scared out loud, but Ijin ignores him. The teacher tells the student next to Ijin to take care of him, and we find that the student is named Park Yunchen. Yunchen obliges and exchanges greeting with Ijin. Yunchen warns Ijin about the person who tried to trip him, who is named Lee Jaehyun. He says to be careful around him and his friend, Ju Hyukjin, who is now chatting with Lee. Ijin thanks him for all the information. That's when the math teacher walks into class and begins the lesson. Ijin notices the people around him, some sleeping, some laughing at something on the phone, and some are outside in gym clothes. He thinks about his mercenary days, and we see a glimpse of the hellish training he went through, noting that this country is peaceful while looking into the sky. School ends, and we see Dayun walking to the school gates. She spots Ijin, who was waiting for her. She is quite surprised by this. Ijin asks if she wants to go home together, and she obliges. While walking back, a silence falls on them. Ijin saying that this must be quite awkward, Dayun saying that it's not really that awkward, only just a little. Ijin says that there's no need to be so flustered, and that he feels the same. He was only nine during the incident, meaning that he barely has memories of her or their grandfather, saying that it must be worse for her since she was only seven. This means that Ijin is 19, and Dayun is 17. They walk silently for a while, but one of girls who was bullying her spots Dayun, who gets nervous, thinking about what she should do. The girl taunts Dayun, asking who the boy next to her is, mocking her by saying it must be her boyfriend, and that even she can date. Dayun jumps at the notion, saying that it's her brother, the girl surprised by this notion. Ijin asks if she's a friend, and Dayun sheepishly says that she is. The girl gets annoyed by this, and asks Dayun if she is her friend. Dayun is visibly shaking, and the girl asks again. Ijin stares at the group, one of them being angry at his staring, getting up from his seat, the other one asking if he's out of his mind. Ijin thinks that they are picking a fight, one of them slowly approaching them, proclaiming that you meet all kinds out here. He stands face to face with Ijin, and says that he's only trying to act cool in front of his sister. Ijin notes all his mistakes, thinking that he's closing in the distance like it's nothing, with his weak spots exposed and without a weapon to boot. He is puzzled at his confidence, 
and he remembers the words of Kong, deciding to leave this guy alone. The guy fed up with Ijin ignoring him, he grabs him by the shirt and prepares to slap him. That's when Dayun bows her head in apologies, saying that he lived abroad for a long time, and he is not used to the culture. The guy rebukes this, asking what does that have to do with him. Ijin looks at his sister, who is looking horrified at what is transpiring. Ijin suddenly jabs the guy's hand and drops his backpack on the ground. He goes to Dayun and tell her to stand still for a bit, gently putting his blazer on her head. The guy tries to come from behind with an attack, but he swiftly gets knocked out with one punch. The other two surprised at this performance. Ijin is annoyed that he had to break the promise he made to the lieutenant in the first day. The other guy is now visibly sweating and is very confused at what just occurred. It cuts to a military zone where some people are training. We see Kong looking at them. That's when a soldier comes behind him, saying that today is the day that Ijin goes to school. It seems that they have educated him for half a year, and they hope that he adjusts well. Kang confidently says that he will be fine. He trained Ijin after all. It cuts to the conflict MC is in, right when he knocks the first guy out. The guy is knocked out cold, just from one hit. Ijin swiftly dashes to the other person and punches him right in the gut, throwing him over the small balcony and knocking him out instantly as well. The girl is shocked at the outcome of the fight, and Ijin looks at her with killing intent. Dayun take the blazer that was on her head off, and wonders what happened to the guys that were picking a fight, seeing them knocked out cold. Ijin walks past the girl, right to Dayun, and asks her if she was surprised, offering to buy some food for her, Dayun reassuring him that it's okay. Ijun says that they should go home, and we get a glimpse of just how well billed he is, with his muscles showing even through his clothes. The girl looks at him for a second, asking if it's really the same person that knocked two people out in an instant, because he's treating Dayun so gently. They leave, and the girl is left dumbfounded. While walking back, Dayun asks if he knocked out the guys that were threatening them, and he says yes. Dayun says that it's rude to stare at people, and they might get angry. Ijin says that he knows, but he did all of that because it looked like they were causing her trouble. She flares up at this notion, and blushes heavily, Ijin wondering if it's because it's something he said. At home, his grandpa is pleading with him to not do the dishes, and instead sit and to eat some fruit. Ijin refuses, saying that he should sit down while he does the dishes. While doing the dishes, his grandpa says that he hopes the food was to his liking, and that he prepared the food to the best of his abilities. Ijin says that he always enjoys his cooking, and the food is always delicious, his grandpa clearly being happy about the compliment. He then asks about the first day of school, and says if there were any problems. Ijin looks back at Dayun, and says that there were none. They all wish each other good night, and head to bed. While sitting in his bed, Ijin thinks about the things that happened up to this point, at how his grandpa kindly welcomed him, showing the amount of food he made for him. While sleeping, Ijin dreams about the day of the crash, and we see a glimpse of what happened, his parents protecting him while the plane was falling to its doom. He jolts awake, relieved that it was just a dream. He goes out of his room and sees Dayun preparing him breakfast. Ijin notices that his grandfather is missing, Dayun noting that he left for work. Ijin slightly surprised at the notion. Dayun also hurries to the door, saying that she has to leave early. Ijin looks at the food on the table, which is quite a lot of leftovers from last night. It cuts to the girl who witnessed the fight previously, who is explaining to the girl that is bullying Dayun, her name being Heejin, that the guy who knocked all her friends out was Dayun's brother. We then see that after Ijin and Dayun left, Heejin happened to pass the group of bullies, demanding to know what happened to them. The girl asks herself if they would really be okay if they keep bullying Dayun, remembering what Ijin did and the glare he gave her afterwards. But she reassures herself, saying that Heejin's brother is the alpha among the third years. We cut to Dayun suddenly being slapped across the head, and we see that it was Heejin who demands for Dayun to follow her. Dayun does so, and it cuts to outside of the school, where Dayun is now getting beaten up. Heejin saying that she warned her about acting out. Heejin says that her brother's life is going to be tiresome too, implying that her brother is going to Ijin right now, and that he probably met him already. Dayun screams in retaliation, but gets slapped. Heejin annoyed at her screaming. Dayun gets up and runs to Ijin's class, where we see that Heejin's brother and his goons are already inside it. She makes it before they could do anything, and screams for her brother. Ijin sees her all tattered, red across the face due to the slap, and her clothing all muddied. 
his eyes turning predatory. Heejin's brother scoffs at this and asks Dayun if she's worried about him. Heejin coming out of the doorway and saying that even she would be worried if her brother got beat up. Judging by Heejin's look, things will not end well for them. A few moments prior to the incident, we see Lee and Ju bullying Yung Chan, throwing erasers at him, trying to aim for his head. Ju asks a classmate for his eraser rather intimidatingly, and he obliges. This eraser is quite big, and he hits Yung Chan in the head, who is uncomfortable with this. Lee and Ju bicker between each other, with Lee saying that he just got lucky, and it's just because he did it with a big eraser. He picks up a bigger eraser, who looks quite hard, and throws it with all his might, but that's when Ejin comes in front of the victim, blocking the projectile with his backpack. They are quite annoyed at this, and when Ejin sits down, they plan to call him over after school to make him stop being annoying. Ejin asks Yongchan if he is okay, and he reluctantly says yes, with Ejin noticing the bullies looking at him and laughing. Yongchan asks Ejin if he is doing anything after school. If not, he can show him around. Ejin declines, saying that he has to go home with his sister today. Young Chan is interested at this notion, asking if they transferred together. Ejin says that she was already in school, and Young Chan asks her name. When he hears the name Dayun, he immediately panics, and with sadness on his face, he tells Ejin that his sister's school life is rather difficult, because she was quite popular with the boys since middle school due to her being pretty, and there was a girl who had a crush on one of the boys. That's how they started bullying Dayun. Ejin is surprised that people would just let this happen, but Young Chan says that it's because the girl's older brother is Kim Kisu, the top dog in the third year's class three. Young Chan continues, saying that this harassment got even worse, as she was in the same class as the main girl bully when they started school, getting so bad that people were surprised she was still attending school. Ejin tries to understand all this, finding it quite dumb that she would bully Dayun for such an idiotic reason. Young Chan says that once you learn the truth, it's nothing special. People like them don't need any special reason to bully. Ejin thinks back at what they talked with his grandpa, who asked Dayun if her school life is going well. Dayun obviously lying that it is, with a tinge of sadness on her face. Ejin thanks him for the information, and that's when one a large guy, the same one Ejin beat up at the store, bashes the door of the class, with a group of other people following him. Ju asks what they're doing here, but that's when Kim Kisu responds, saying that there's something that he wants, with the group surprised that he is here. Kim's goons point him to Ejin, who bashes them for losing against such a guy, noting that he looks quite frail. He beckons Ejin to get up, and he does so. Ejin asks if he is Kim, with Kim surprised that he already knows his name. Ejin glares at him, which annoys Kim, ordering one of his goons to bring him over here. While the goon approaches Ejin, his sister suddenly rushes in, bruised and dirty. Ejin takes in the sight, and his eyes turn cold. Kim says that he is quite jealous Ejin has such a caring sister, with Haijin suddenly responding that she would be worried too if her brother was about to be beaten up. Dayun looks at the amount of people that are going after Ejin and begins crying, apologizing to him. Ejin says that there is no need to apologize, suddenly throwing a right hook at the guy that's in front of him, knocking him out cold. Ejin assures her that none of this is her fault. Another goon tries to punch Ejin, but to no avail, as Ejin redirects his punch, hitting his exposed windpipe. The goon instantly falls to his knees, surely having a hard time breathing. One of the last goons panics, desperately trying to hit Ejin. This, however, is what dooms him, as he is extremely exposed. Ejin throws a kidney shot, landing the hit and toppling the guy over. Everyone is left shocked at this outcome, even Kim. Ejin glares at the brother and sister, who are left shaken by this. Kim notes that Ejin knows a few tricks, Ejin ignoring him completely. Kim tries to hit Ejin in the neck with his leg, thinking at first that he got him. His illusions disappear, however, as he sees that Ejin blocked the attack perfectly. Kim panics and throws another attack on the other side, Ejin easily blocking this one. He grabs Kim's leg and punches him directly in the face, throwing him on the ground. Ejin glares at him with murderous intent, and with one final attack, he knocks Kim out. Everyone is surprised he could defeat Kim, Lee, and Ju even more so. He approaches Heijin, clenching his fist as he does so. Heijin is sure that he will hit her, but that's when Dayun stops him, saying it's enough. Ejin retorts this notion, asking if these aren't the same people that bullied her. She says that it's fine now, and he should stop. 
Ijin does so, and offers to take her back to class. In the class, Kim's sister is fuming at the sight of her brother and his friends beaten up. While walking, Dayun notes that Ijin is quite good at fighting, and also apologizes again, saying that it's because of her he got into fights two days in a row. Ijin says that he would happily fight for her, saying that from where he used to live, people would just think only about themselves. There were exceptions, however. It was when family got involved. It cuts to a flashback Ijin as a mercenary, wondering what exactly a family was, seeing a man protecting his daughter from his attacks. Dayun asks how can this be, knowing that he barely remembers her and grandpa. He says that she is right, but he knows for sure that they are family. Dayun gets embarrassed at this, and tells Ijin that she will walk the rest of the way alone. Ijin asks why, but they are already in front of her class. She waves goodbye, Ijin smiling at her shyness. He arrives back to class, Lee and Ju congratulating him over his victory, with Ju saying that it looked like he was smurfing. He sits in his seat, and Yongchan shyly says that he thinks Ijin looked cool too. In another place, Kim and his goons lament what happened, with Kim noting that Ijin is in a completely different league. His sister keeps bashing him, wondering how they could lose to one person. Kim, having had enough of her yapping, tells her to shut up, with her not backing down at all. With one final menacing glare from Kim, she gets so mad a tear forms in her eye, and leaves, slamming the door behind her. She goes back to class, where she mockingly says to Dayun that her life will be easy from now on, as she can rely on her brother for anything. Dayun ignores Haijin, which makes her extremely mad. She wonders if she just has to watch Dayun quietly from now on, saying that there's no way she would do such a thing. While walking to the school gate, Dayun thinks about her brother, who protected her, but also at the bullying she has received up until now, wondering if it's really over. With this much thinking, she passes Ijin without noticing him, who asks her if she has something on her mind. She apologizes for not noticing him, but he doesn't mind. Dayun says that they should stop by the store to pick up some things, as their grandpa likes to have dinner prepared when he comes home. Behind them, Heijin glares and smiles a sinister smile, clearly plotting something. Inside the shop, Dayun notices how popular Ijin is based off just his looks, with a couple of girls talking about him. She asks if he's ever had a girlfriend before, who says that he hasn't. Dayun is surprised, noting how popular he is here. He surely must have been there too. Ijin looks at the ground for a second, before replying that he was just busy. He asks her the same question the answer being the same as his. Inside the apartment, Ijin's grandpa gifts him a phone, apparently the newest model. The grandpa says that he had to unbox the phone to put the phone numbers in, hoping Ijin is not upset at this. He also says that he will buy Dayun a phone too, once he has money. Dayun shuts down this notion, saying that her current one works just fine. While they chat, Ijin thanks his grandpa, who is giddy at Ijin's appreciation. Inside his bedroom, he smiles at his new gift, sending a text message to the lieutenant, who wonders why Ijin has a new phone, considering he already bought him an expensive one. In the morning, while getting out of the bathroom after a shower, he sees Dayun rushing for the door, saying that she is late. She also prepared him a meal. While running, she says that she'll make it on time. We find out why she is late, saying that Grandpa liked the soup so much that she remade it in the morning as well. While thinking about her grandpa's appreciation, she suddenly gets kicked to the ground by a pack of thugs, who are all female. One of them says to watch where she's going. Dayun apologizes, but gets slapped instantly. One of them suggests they should go to karaoke, with everyone agreeing. One of them crouches to Dayun's level, saying she must come too. From Dayun observation and her blonde hair, this seems to be Heejin. They go inside the karaoke building, but only the three of them come out. The worker, seeing that they have finished singing, notes how loud they were screaming in there, saying they must have a lot of energy. He opens the booth that they were in, and is shocked to find Dayun on the ground, beaten to a pulp. She gets up, and refusing a 911 call, leaves the premises on her last legs. At school, the teacher makes attendance, with Dayun not being there. Heijin smiles at this, knowing why she isn't in class. One of her lackeys asks if they're gonna be okay, but she says to stop worrying, as they had nothing to do with it, almost sure Ijin won't find out. He waits outside the school gate for her, and seeing that she isn't coming, calls her. 
He calls her, but she doesn't respond, as Dayun is curled up inside her sheets, most likely crying. Ijin arrives home, noting her shoes. He goes to her door, knocking on it. She responds to his questions in a raspy voice, him noticing this as well. Dayun makes the excuse of being sick, Ijin not pushing this matter any further. While going back, he spots her shoes once again, but this time he observes that there is blood on them, his eyes once again growing cold at the sight. We cut to Ijin treating her wounds, probably barging in her room out of concern. She lies about what happened, saying that she tried to dodge a bike and fell down some stairs, thus getting the injuries. Ijin asks her if she doesn't want to go to the hospital, but she declines, because they will find out it wasn't some stairs that caused this. We see a bit of her past, probably when this bullying first began, where Dayun tries to blame Heijin for her injuries, saying that she bullies her constantly. It seems that Dayun also called some cops to the scene, but to no avail, as her accusations get shut down by Heijin's mother, who is furious at this. The mother asks Dayun to call her parents. With this being the last drop, she breaks down crying. Ijin notices that she is deep in thought, saying that even though the injuries aren't that severe, she will have to suffer for a few days. Dayun notices Ijin's skill in medical care, and also that their grandpa might not take this well, as he has heart problems. Ijin assures her that he will talk to him, walking out of her room. Dayun stop him to say thanks, thinking that it was a good decision to not tell Ijin what really happened. Students like them can't do anything. Outside of her room, Ijin is surrounded by an frightening red aura. Inside a club, Kim talks with his goons about the situation, still bruised up. One of the says that they can't let this go, and that they went unprepared. Kim suggests that they don't need to fight one-on-one, -on -one, as they aren't martial artists, all of them grinning in agreement. His sister calls him, who tells him about what she did. Kim is surprised by this, but also very pleased, saying that they were planning to do something to Ijin too. A figure pops out of the shadows, that figure being Ijin. Kim is shocked at his presence, saying that he wanted to have a revenge match anyway. He doesn't get to finish his sentence, as Ijin grabs the head of a goon, bashing him in the ground. Another tries to swing but gets a left hook instead, knocking him out. They all try to rush him, with one of them being kicked and thrown into the wall. He moves on to his next target, and one of them pops up behind him with a bottle, seeming like they've taken him by surprise. His reaction is swift, however, as he disarms one of them and knocks both of his attackers out. He takes care of the last one, Kim again shocked at his combat skills. Ijin glares at him, this being the first time he seems genuinely mad. He warns Kim one last that they should not mess with his sister. Kim is shaking, thinking of the battle prowess of his opponent, wondering how he could beat such a guy. He grabs an empty glass and throws it, missing Ijin. He swiftly grabs a bottle and attacks Ijin, who quickly makes short work of him. In his frenzy, he breaks the bottle, trying to shank Ijin. Without a single shred of fear inside him, Ijin moves fast to incapacitate Kim, grabbing him by the neck and choking him. Ijin threatens Kim, saying that this is his final warning, and if he doesn't oblige, he will do unspeakable things to them, a red tinge lighting up in his eyes. He lets go of Kim and slowly walks out of the bar, the patrons shocked at this display. Outside the bar, Haijin rushes to the entrance, wondering what could have happened to her brother that he would end the call so abruptly. She sees Ijin slowly rise from the bar stairs and is rightly terrified. Haijin backs up in fear, tripping on her hand, dislocating it. Ijin suddenly gets a call from his grandfather and leaves. She goes into the bar in awe at what happened to her brother. Haijin bashes him once again, with Kim replying that they shouldn't go after his sister anymore. He warns her, but she doesn't listen. The dam breaks, and he lets out a shout, calling Heijin by her full name. She is horrified, and he exclaims that if she ever lays his hands on Heijin's sister again, he will beat her instead. Outside, Heijin meets with his grandfather, both sitting on a bench. They talk about what happened with Dayun, him saying that it was difficult to raise her, as he's never had a girl before, and also that he hasn't done enough for her. He looks back, saying that she did much more for him, because she helped him get through the loss of Ijin's parents. He notes that it hurts him that Dayun doesn't confide in him, but Ijin gently reassures him that from what he saw, he loves Dayun, but she also loves him. A sense of relief washing over him. Ijin says that he will watch over her at school. His grandfather says that Ijin has no idea how happy he is that he's here. Inside of a hospital, Kim and Heijin's parents talk with them. 
The father is not surprised to see Kim in this state, as he is quite the troublemaker. The mother gets angry at this, wondering why her husband is not angry at the sight of their children getting hurt. With a final farewell, the parents leave, with only the siblings remaining in the room. We find out that Heijin was the one who told her parents what happened and who did it. Kim wonders if it was really Ijin who injured her arm. Heijin, obviously lying, says that it really was him, sweating while doing so. While leaving, Heijin brags that he should take it easy, as they will show him who he decided to mess with. While walking through a hall, their parents talk about the situation, the mother saying that she contacted the chief. He is annoyed at this, saying they should just leave it to the school. The mother is mad at him once again to his carelessness, saying that she doesn't know the kind of man the chief is. It also seems that Heijin has been listening to this conversation. Outside of a construction site, we see the chief, a pretty well-built man with quite a gangsterous look, donning a black suit. He expresses his frustration, wondering why he got dragged into this children's squabble. Inside his home, Ijin thinks at what happened, wondering if this is the end of it. It appears not, however, as two large men are asking for him outside of his door, the grandpa quite puzzled at this. Ijin gets out of his room and says that they are acquaintances of his, and that he will be right back, leaving his grandfather shocked. They take him back to the warehouse, one of them saying to the chief that he decided to come quietly. The chief says to get it over with quickly, with one of them grabbing a bat, saying the other one should grab his arm. One of them quips that Ijin shouldn't have messed with those kids, letting Ijin know that this is about Kisu. The chief is slightly annoyed at his underlings spouting unnecessary information, noting that he will have to punish him later. He takes a quick peek at Ijin, but is surprised to find Ijin not showing any emotion, let alone be scared. Ijin quickly grabs the arm of one of the underlings and strikes him, leaving him confused. The other one quickly swings for his head, but Ijin swiftly and skillfully grabs the bat in his arm and uppercuts the attacker, leaving him knocked out with just a few hits. The other one wakes from his confusion, grabbing Ijin from behind with all his might, but with two rapid elbow strikes, he is down a swell. The chief notes his combat skills, saying that he can't be a normal high schooler, lamenting the idea of having to fight one at his age while approaching Ijin. He notes that he is full of openings, but that's when he strikes. Ijin shocked at his speed. He dodges most of his blows and tries to go in for an attack, but the chief moves swiftly, Ijin having to retreat while blocking a blow. The chief asks once again who he is, Ijin replying that he is just a normal high schooler. The chief notes that he is very different from some street thugs, accounting for his skill. Ijin gets into a stance, and the chief rushes him, but to no avail, as Ijin only blocks and counters his attacks, him getting annoyed at this. He charges a mighty punch, but it's redirected by Ijin, who looks at him knowingly. He blitzes the chief, leaving him on the ground. With the last of his conscience, he thinks that those kids messed with the wrong person. Inside of a building, Haijin's parents wait for the news, the mother being surprised it's been so much time without any news. The phone finally rings, and the father answers. He apologizes his wife sent out such a pointless task, but the chief says he should be apologizing instead, as he has been beaten. The father is shocked at this, noting that the chief is respected even in the underworld. A door slowly opens, Ijin coming out of it, much to the surprise of the family. Outside of this room, we see Ijin has taken care of the guards quietly. The call abruptly closes, leaving the chief to think that Ijin probably already got there. Inside, Haijin suddenly rises up in shock, making her mother throw a tantrum at Ijin, threatening him. The father promptly shuts his wife's mouth and talks with Ijin, asking how he got here. Ijin mockingly says that there were guards guarding it, making him think about what the chief said, wondering how he even found this place. The mother, having had enough of this, calls the police, Haijin giddy at her mother's actions. She thinks of calling a prosecutor, while asking Ijin if he knows who he is messing with. Ijin responds, saying that he does. The father is a congressman elected twice and running for the next election too. Haijin smirks, whispering to Ijin that his life is over. While the mother is speaking with the congressman, Ijin pulls out his phone and plays a video. The video contains content of Haijin bullying and stealing from a fellow classmate. The mother seeing this, closes the call immediately. Haijin wonders how he got this footage, and it seems like Ijin got it from the surveillance cameras, keeping it safe inside a memory stick. Haijin tries to plead with her father, but to no avail, as he has had enough of her. Ijin says that he has footage of Kim too, 
noting that these two would often film themselves bullying. With the amount of footage amassed, the mother bashes Ijin, wondering if he thinks these threats will work. Ijin shuts her down, saying it isn't his fault to begin with, and that he also filmed what happened to him at the warehouse. The father caves in, noting Ijin's dedication to his sister. He says that he will provide money for the medical bills and such, but Ijin shuts this offer down. He asks if he wants his kids to apologize, with Heijin noting that she would rather bite her tongue. Ijin rejects this offer too, saying that he wants both Kim and Heijin to permanently stay out of his sister's sight. The defeated father says that he will move them overseas, much to the dismay of Heijin and her mother. Ijin says he will like her gone by tomorrow. Heijin bursts in tears at the thought. The father asks for the footage but Ijin glares at him, his eyes turning a bloody red, asking if he thinks he's an idiot. The father, scared, apologizes. Ijin arrives home, where his family worrisomely welcomes him, who is surprised at this. He talks with them, his grandpa saying he thought those people were dangerous, Dayun adding that they gave off a bad vibe. He says not to worry, as she should look after herself, asking how she is doing now. She sheepishly says she is fine. Ijin tells her that she won't be falling down the stairs anymore, as he cleared it out, she being quite puzzled at this. The next day at school, they talk outside of Dayun's classroom, who says that he doesn't have to take her anymore, as she is almost fully recovered. She goes inside the classroom and hears the news that Haijin and her brother are transferring overseas, the other students glad at this piece of information. Dayun remembers what her brother said and runs back into the hall where Ijin is. She calls for him, but no words come out of her mouth, wondering what she could say to him. He gently smiles at her and give a knowing see you later, making her burst into tears. Inside a karaoke place, Haijin's click talk about her, wondering if she really will be moving abroad. The attention goes to Iyung, who is in the same class as her. She says that it must be so, because Haijin isn't responding to anything. Iyung wonders if it's because of Ijin, scared while doing so. Suddenly Haijin comes in the room, much to the surprise of the girls. They ask if she is really moving abroad, and she says it's for one semester, thinking that her father will take care of it. She also says that it's a family matter. She can't say it's because of Ijin after all. One of them asks about Ijin, wondering if her brother took care of it. She dodges the question, instead proposing to educate Dayun one more time. She also thinks they should target her grandpa, saying she will contact her mother to put him out of work. Someone speaks from behind them, a masked figure appearing, who is Ijin. Heijin gets up and screams his name, but he plays stupid, saying he is not him. He says that they were having an interesting conversation, and also that everyone from the video is here, the video where Dayun got beaten up. They all freeze in fear. Ijin asks them if they are not going to play any music, since they like being noisy, closing the door with malicious intent while doing so. Inside the hospital where Kim is kept, his parents talks with him, asking where Haijin is. He says that she went to say goodbye to her friends, but that's when one of the congressman's subordinates opens the TV to show something. The news article is about Haijin's and Kim's gruesome actions, seeming like Ijin leaked the videos, much to the dismay of the parents. Outside, the chief asks Ijin why he did such a thing, wondering if he didn't have a deal. Ijin thinks about it. With their parents being politicians, he had to solve this quietly. He responds and says that he has a twister personality with the chief saying that it's foolish to think the congressman will let this go quietly. He will have no time for that, however, as Ijin has stolen some dirt the chief had on the congressman. It seems like he has committed multiple accounts of fraud, money laundering, and solicitation. It's so bad the members of his own party are asking for a thorough investigation. He falls down on a bed, crushed and defeated. The chief wonders if this guy really is a normal high schooler like he says. The next day at school, Ijin looks outside a window, but suddenly gets a message from Dayun, saying she will go home alone today, and that he should go have some fun, with him wondering what he can do. Yung Chan greets him, and asks if he has anything to do today, proposing they hang out after school. Ijin agrees, but that's when Li and Ju approach them, asking if Ijin was the one who sent the two siblings overseas. He denies this, but they keep saying that he did with rumors going around that Ijin went to Kim's base and taking them all down. They invite him to join their group, but he declines, 
saying he has plans with Yung Chan today. They turn their attention to him, terrifyingly looking at him while saying they should all hang out together then. He reluctantly agrees, wondering if they are going to bully him around Ijin too. The teacher comes to class with two new students, a stunning beauty and a handsome boy. Yung Chan is surprised by their presence, saying that the girl is named Shin Yuna, the granddaughter of the owner of SW, biggest corporation in the country. And next to her is Go Sukju, who was always together with her, being raised to be her secretary and bodyguard. The teacher says that they studied in America for two years, and they will be joining the class from now on, much to the dismay of Lee and Ju who are lamenting that they have such troublesome schoolmates. They walk to their seats, Ijin and Sukju locking eyes while doing so. Yuna looks at him and asks Sukju who he is, wondering if he is a celebrity. He doesn't know, saying he will check. She looks at him, and they suddenly meet gazes, gently smiling at him. He turns his head around without a moment's thought, her pouting at him for doing his. Yung-chan suggests that they should go to a PC cafe, Ijin remembering his training on such things, apparently being instructed by the lieutenant. He was also informed about coca, or coin karaoke. Yung-chan sees Ijin in deep thought, wondering if he doesn't like the things he recommended. When school finished, Yuna sits in class looking down a window. Sukju informs her about Ijin, noting how he suddenly came back to life after such a long window of time. He is suspicious about the fact that it was right before they came, saying he will conduct a thorough investigation. While walking back to his house, he looks at the group chat that they formed, with Lee noting how much Yung Chan carried the game they played. It cuts back to what happened, showing us that Ijin is not that skilled at games. Lee and Ju ask what rank Yung Chan is, who says that he is challenger. They stare in shock, treating him like a god. While they talk in the group chat, Ijin bumps into his sister who just came out of the store. He asks what he bought, her saying that they ran out of garbage bags and had to go get some. He offers to carry the luggage, but she refuses, saying it's pretty light. Dayun asks about his day, wondering where he went. He says he went to a PC cafe and also asks her how she's doing at school. She says that it's been fine being able to be comfortable at school for a while. She asks if he had dinner and says that she hasn't eaten yet, as she always wait for grandpa. Even though he ate with his friends, he still accepts the offer, saying he only ate a little. While having dinner, they both compliment Dayun's cooking skills, their grandpa saying it's improving by the day. While enjoying his family time, he can't help but think of the gruesome life he had before. Inside his room, he gets a call from his lieutenant, who asks how he is doing and if there are any problems. Ijin sits in silence for a while, causing the lieutenant to worry that he killed somebody. Ijin calms him down, saying it was a small issue, but he fixed it right away. The lieutenant says that if he ever has trouble, Ijin should call him. The next day at school, Yung Chan talks with Lee and Ju about Ijin and Sukju, wondering who would win in a fight. They say that Sukju is out of this league, apparently taking out 30 people on his own, unscathed. They come to the conclusion Ijin has no chance against Sukju. Inside the school, they meet face to face, with Sukju interrogating him as to his real identity. He asks about what happened to Kim and Haijin, Ijin responding that they had some friction, but their transfer has nothing to do with him. Sukju drops one final piece of information, saying that the school where Ijin claimed to have gone before, there was never a student like him. Inside the school, Yuna and Dayun take a break from their classes, relaxing in a break room. They begin talking, mostly about Ijin. Yuna saying that she didn't know Dayun had a brother. She says that they thought he died alongside her parents ten years ago, and six months ago, they found out he was alive. We cut to the moment they received the news, with the grandfather giving Dayun the news while crying his eyes out. Yuna finds it weird that he didn't contact them all this time, but apparently he lost his memories after the incident, with them only coming back recently, clearly a lie done to hide Ijin's past. Yuna finds this curious, being quite suspicious of Ijin now. She still smiles and says that their grandpa must be happy, Dayun saying he even took cooking lessons to prepare for Ijin's coming. Yuna gets serious for a moment, asking Dayun if he really is her brother. She takes a step back instead asking if they've done a DNA test. Dayun says that they must have done a DNA test before sending him here. Besides, the grandfather says that he looks a lot like he did when he was just a kid. 
Dayun is curious as to why Yuna is so infatuated with Ijin all of a sudden. She tries to make up an excuse, suddenly asking if Ijin has a girlfriend. It cuts back to Sukju's confrontation, implying that Ijin's documents are fake, saying that his investigation showed that the school he previously attended said that nobody of his likeness ever attended. Ijin asks him for evidence, puzzling Sukju, who thinks that he found this out through word of mouth, and that he doesn't have any physical evidence, but is also surprised at Ijin's expression, making it seem like he was the one making a mistake. Ijin asks why he decided to investigate him, Sukju saying he was too suspicious to not investigate. Silence falls, but Ijin shortly breaks it, saying that his objective was to come back home. Sukju still has suspicions, and will surely try to find any dirt he can on Ijin. Inside the class, Ijin notes how much they found out after only one day. Class ends, and Lee invites them all to play at the PC Cafe. Ijin says that he can't, as it's his grandfather's birthday today. Ju says that just the three of them will go, letting us that they are quite friendly with Yongchan now. Sukju tells Yuna all he knows, saying that Dayun was also bullied by Haijin for the last two years, thinking it was Ijin who took down Kim's gang, twice. Yuna finds this funny, saying it's almost like a fairy tale that he came back to rescue his sister after so much time. Meanwhile, her siblings are just waiting for the opportunity to take her down, smiling a sad smile while speaking. Yuna says that if he really is coming after her, he should have been more quiet, Sukju agreeing. She asks about the insurance money the grandpa received after the crash, apparently being quite a large sum, growing even more so because he didn't touch it. However, he instantly gave it all to Ijin when he arrived, implying that Ijin's goal was the money. Yuna thinks Dayun might be in danger, as they live in the same house. While shopping, Dayun shyly asks Ijin what he did after the plane crash, his expression instantly turning grim. Dayun notices this, saying he doesn't need to answer. He lies, saying that because of the psychological trauma, he couldn't function that well. After all, he had to survive in a place where he couldn't understand the language. He smiles, saying it was just a busy life. She also tells him that Yuna, apparently a good friend of Dayun's, asked if he has a girlfriend, shocking Ijin a bit. When their grandfather arrives home, they celebrate his birthday, Dayun buying him a gift, a phone case. His voice breaks a bit, saying that he already got a really big present, the fact that Ijin came home. Dayun's phone suddenly rings, and the caller is Yuna, setting Ijin on alert. She says that Yuna invited her to the convenience store, apparently having to tell Dayun something. Ijin is now on full alert, knowing what might happen next. They talk outside of the convenience store, mostly about Yuna's school activities outside of the country. Yuna asks if she ever wanted to study abroad, but Dayun says no. She wouldn't want to leave her grandpa alone after all, but she is a little less worried now that her brother is back home. Yuna is conflicted, thinking about what Sukju said earlier, that all the documents and history of Ijin were all forged or faked, her wanting to tell Dayun everything. Dayun is glad that she was able to talk with someone like this, noting it has been a long time since she did something like this. Ijin spots them talking, trying to approach them slowly. He gets stopped by Sukju, however, who asks him to wait here. He says there is no need to bother two people who are catching up, but that's when a van suddenly hits them, sending both flying. Ijin rises his head and sees that Yuna and his sister have been kidnapped, instantly rising from the ground and running as fast as he can. He cannot catch up, however, as the van disappears into the distance. Sukju and Ijin immediately grab each other by their clothes, Ijin asking who the perpetrators are. Sukju is puzzled, thinking at first that Ijin was somehow involved. They let go and Sukju calls someone, telling them the details of the kidnapping. Ijin tries to leave but gets stopped, Sukju asking if he is involved in this. Ijin says he has no time to waste, exclaiming he will find his sister. Inside a building, the chief relaxes after a long day, but his relaxation gets cut short, as Ijin appears in front of him. Inside of a tall building, a woman who looks quite similar to Yuna receives the news that she's been kidnapped. She wonders if her grandfather should continue to go after that company. Because if he does without bowing to threats, Yuna is surely going to die. The chief looks at Ijin, Sukju taken aback by his appearance. He apparently knows about him already, his name being Cha Dusik, a respectable figure in the underworld. He asks Ijin what he wants, Ijin saying he needs information, and that the granddaughter of the SW Group CEO got kidnapped. 
His eyes widen, and he immediately says it was not them. You'd have to be insane to mess with such powerful people. Eugene asks if he would have any idea who could have done such a thing. Dusik says that he already got him into so much trouble. Why would he tell him? Eugen says that his sister got kidnapped as well. After hearing this, Dusik finally caves in, saying that he heard reports of people who aren't Korean asking his men for a warehouse, also asking for a large sum of cars, and even some men of his. He declined, saying that kind of work gets pretty iffy. He also heard that a different group took them up on the offer, and that they are based in Incheon. He throws his phone at Eugen, saying to put his number in there, saying that he will call him if his men find the exact location. Eugen also asks for his motorcycle, which was just outside the premises. He gets on the bike, Sukju asking how he could be going after unconfirmed information. Eugen says that Yuna will probably be safe, but the same can't be said for his sister. Who knows what they will do with her? Sukju notes his quick response and his swiftness in getting information. Eugen revs up the bike, dashing on the road, hoping to find Dayun safe. Dayun groggily wakes up, realizing they have been kidnapped, and Yuna apologizes for making her a part of it. The kidnappers approach, and Yuna asks what they want to do with her. One of them says that she doesn't need to know, and that it will all be over soon. Another asks what they should do with Dayun, the other saying to get rid of her, as she serves no purpose. Yuna is furious at this notion, saying that if they touch Dayun, she will bite her tongue and end herself. One of them crouches to her level, saying that she doesn't have the will to do it, encouraging her. He is proven wrong, however, as blood comes from Yuna's mouth from biting her tongue. He gives up, saying she bought some time with that bluff. Ijin and Sukju arrive at the warehouse, seeming like the information Dusik gave was true. Ijin begins to walk towards it, but Sukju tries to stop him, saying there will be reinforcements soon. Ijin doesn't have time to spare, however, as Dayun is in much more danger than Yuna. They make short work of a few guards, taking them out silently. Sukju notes how used Ijin is to this kind of thing, asking once again who he is. Ijin replies, saying that he is just his classmate. With a fiery red in his eyes, he seems determined to rescue his sister. The SW CEO sits inside his office, and a subordinate of his says they have received the demands from the kidnappers. They want him to cancel the recently settled business venture, also saying that if he doesn't respond in an hour, Yuna dies. The CEO asks when the escort team will arrive at Yuna's location, the subordinate saying in approximately 50 minutes. He shakes a bit after hearing this. Outside the warehouse, two guards wonder why they were made to do this many patrols. They speak, but suddenly, Ijin hits the nape of a guard, knocking him on his face. He tries to get up quickly, but Ijin has already taken care of his colleague, also knocking him out with a swift kick. Ijin asks Sukju how many he took down, apparently the number being five. Ijin notes how many they took down, saying that if they combined their numbers, they would get a total of 14 guards, Sukju taken aback by Ijin taking down nine guards. He asks Sukju about the identity of these kidnappers, but he doesn't know a thing, as they have many enemies. Ijin notes that the real group is with Yuna, saying that these other guys are really useless. He asks Sukju about his wound, his arm being badly hurt from the car hitting them earlier, Ijin's leg also being quite hurt from this. They don't have time to rest, however, as another group of guards notes the missing people. One spots the knocked out group, but it's too late, as Ijin jumps in for a knee hit, knocking the guy out. The other guy is also shortly dispatched by Ijin, with only a few jabs. Sukju calls for Ijin, saying that after this is over, he will properly apologize for investigating him. Hearing the commotion that was happening outside, the leader of the kidnappers sends some of them out to investigate, unfortunately finding Ijin. They think they should make short work of him, Ijin glaring at them, assessing their abilities. Sukju gets inside, approaching Yuna, who asks how many of her people are outside. Sukju says that none have arrived yet, but doesn't get to finish, as the leader and another person approach from behind, saying he was a real pain since he was always with Yuna. The leader says it was a mistake to come here alone, and the other guy rushed Sukju. They trade blows, him noticing that Ijin was right. These people are way different than the ones outside. Sukju lands a gut punch and a kick, giving him the chance to grab the guy's arm, hitting him in the back with his knee. The leader notes Sukju's abilities, being quite impressed. This is not a friendly spar, however, as the guy Sukju was fighting pulls out a knife, slashing him in three different spots. The leader orders his subordinate to finish this quickly, 
as they need to move locations before the escort team comes. Sukju tries to fight him, but to no avail, as the cuts he received were quite deep, nerfing his abilities. The leader, with a red tinge in his eyes, throws a knife at Dayun, trying to end her. Yuna jumps in front of her, but Sukju jumps in front of Yuna, taking the knife in his lower back. The leader applauds Sukju's stupidity and orders the subordinate to end both Sukju and Dayun. A door slowly opens, however, as Ijin has taken care of all of the goons outside, now more determined than ever to end this. Inside Dusik's building, a subordinate of his asks why he helped Ijin, given that most of the troubles they have now is because of him, and that the Goseong faction is involved, most likely being the kidnappers. Dusik replies that his sister got kidnapped, what can you do? He had to at least help with this. Inside the warehouse, the leader asks who that guy is, finding out it's Dayun's brother, laughing at the thought of him coming to rescue his sister. Ijin asks Dayun if she is hurt anywhere, but she doesn't hear it, as she is screaming at him to get out, as this is much too dangerous. Yuna laments that two innocent people got dragged into this because of her. The leader having had enough of this, already being behind schedule, orders his subordinate to end Ijin first. He tries to attack Ijin, but he redirects the attack directly into the attacker's arm. While holding the knife in the attacker's arm, he gently tells Dayun to close her eyes. She does so, and Ijin lacerates the arm of the attacker, leaving him on the ground, rolling in pain. Sukju notes his knife skills, saying he targeted specific muscles and ligaments to take him down. The leader says that he is not from the escort team, noting his skill and his expression. He pulls out a knife, much larger than Ijin's. He slashes at Ijin, but he dodges instantly, making them trade blows. Ijin stops his attack with a palm attack, causing the leader to back out for a second. They begin fighting once again, with Ijin slashing most of his arm in a second, making the leader wonder if Ijin is better at using the knife. Ijin slashes his arm once again, kicking him in the face also, causing the mask he was wearing to fall off. Angry at Ijin for beating him, he pulls out a handgun, prepared to shoot Ijin. He doesn't get to, however, as Ijin throws the knife into his upper body and swiftly moves to incapacitate him, doing so with one hard palm attack. Yuna and Sukju look at him, sitting still in fear of him. He says to Dayun that she can open her eyes now, gently smiling at her, saying he came to rescue her. Dayun gently caresses Ijin's head, asking if he is hurt. Ijin is taken aback by this, replying that he is fine. She breaks down crying, worrying Ijin quite a bit. Behind them, Yuna looks at Ijin longingly. Inside of a SW-owned hospital, Ijin is waiting at a door, presumably for Dayun. He gets a text, and it's from the group chat he formed with his school friends. They talk a bit, causing Ijin to smile. He leans into his chair, looking at the department he is in, the Mental Health Institute. It cuts to the aftermath of that eventful night, where the kidnappers were arrested. Dayun is getting a checkup, Yuna coming from behind Ijin, saying she should go to the hospital not only for possible invisible injuries she may have, but also for her psychological health, noting the problems she had with the bully siblings previously. She might need plenty of therapy and treatment. She comes out of the room, saying there's nothing to worry about, and she will have to come only once a week. She asks about Ijin's condition, who says that he only had some bruises and small cuts, but that's about it. She sighs in relief, while Ijin is thinking about what happened and how she might be affected. Dayun goes to ask a question, but stops, thinking that she can't ask him. She can't ask what kind of life he lived before coming to Korea to be able to fight so well. They meet with Yuna, who asks about their checkups and counseling. She also apologizes profusely, with Dayun saying she should stop, as she also apologized yesterday too. Ijin locks eyes with Yuna's guard, who looks at him diligently. Dayun asks about Sukju, saying to Ijin that they should visit him. Inside his hospital room, Dayun thanks him, bowing her head while doing so. He gets flustered, saying it's okay, there's no need for that. She also asks how he is doing, his condition improving by a lot. Yuna and her guard look at Ijin from behind, staring. They say their farewells and leave the room. They begin to discuss Ijin, with the guard saying he can't believe someone so young could defeat so many people. Yuna wonders if it's as impressive, but the guard begins explaining. This isn't as simple as him beating up a lot of people. He silently took down over 10 people who were standing outside, not ending them, only incapacitating them or knocking them out. 
and even injuries of the two guys in the warehouse, there aren't many people who can use a knife at that level of skill and training, much less in combat. Plus, the two kidnappers in the warehouse and four of the soldiers outside were highly trained from a foreign country. Considering this and Sukju's report, Ijin is most likely a trained professional with extensive experience in combat. While walking to their house, Dayun thanks Ijin, saying she's always getting helped. Ijin retorts this, saying he should be the one thanking her, as he feels he can understand Alidi. He thinks of the time Dayun worried for him, being the first time someone genuinely was worried for his safety. He can finally begin to understand what a family is. Inside the tall building, the woman who is affiliated with Yuna somehow talks about Sukju, praising his capability to rescue her in such a short amount of time. She also laments that Yuna has him, saying that she should be the one to own him. Her subordinate says that there is a strange rumor, however. Sukju did a lot, but it was mostly done by a student from the same class as him, the CEO showing interest in this matter. She is surprised that her grandpa would be involved, wondering if the rumor really is true. While training inside his room, Ijin thinks of how he looked in front of Dayun, training even harder in the process. She calls him to the dining room, saying he should eat some fruit. While there, he asks about her condition, with her saying that he already asked that earlier and that she is fine. She smiles at him, saying he doesn't have to worry about that, her noting that Ijin was worried about the way he looked in front of her. He must think that she's really surprised and would ask him how he learned those moves. But she won't, as he did all of those things to save her. She also won't press him about the past, saying that she couldn't tell Grandpa about the bullying that was occurring either. Some things you just can't say. Dayun's phone suddenly rings, causing her to jump a bit. It's a call from Yuna, inviting Ijin to the convenience store close by. He arrives, seeing the many guards she now has due to the incident. She tells him to sit down, and he does so. She apologizes for getting Dayun mixed up in all of this, but also thanks him for rescuing her. He says that he only did it for Dayun, and knowing this, she would still like to thank him. She says she also won't investigate him no more, his eyes growing cold while staring at her. Yuna says that she had to investigate him, as he was quite suspicious, and a lot of bad things have been happening to her due to the circumstances she is in. Apparently almost being kidnapped in America too, Ijin gets up to leave, but she stops him, saying that her grandfather wants to meet him, wanting to show his gratitude in person. He refuses, saying he wasn't trying to rescue her in the first place. While walking back to his house, he spots one of Dusik's subordinates walking out of an alleyway, bloodied up and bruised. He spots Ijin, saying he, it's his fault. Evidently, the Gosyong clan found out he helped Ijin, causing them to storm Dusik's hideout. At the place, a myriad of goons and their leader corner Dusik, the leader asking why he doesn't give up. Dusik laughs at him, saying that even though he knew his men were on vacation, he was still scared to come alone. One perks up, saying he messed with the congressman and also with the Gosiong guys recently. He tauntingly says he just had to educate them, causing the leader to get mad, ordering his men to tear Dusik up. They try to incapacitate him, but he dodges and deals with them one by one, quite skillfully too. One takes him by surprise, hitting him on the back with a piece of wood. He makes short work of this attacker, but the attack injured him. He notes how many people are him to end him, saying this must be the end of him. He also thinks about Ijin, wondering if he saved his sister. Outside of the building, Ijin arrives on Dusik's bike, with one of the goons that were outside cussing him out, exclaiming he can't be here. His mouth closes, however, when Ijin kicks him right in the chin. It seems he has come to rescue Dusik. He makes short work of the rest that were outside, and while going inside, a terrifying red aura emanates from him. While inside, he gets spotted by a pack of goons who warn him to get out. He is having none of it, however, as he knocks one out instantly, causing the rest to rush him. But with a few quick punches and kicks, he knocks out all but one, who tries to run away. To no avail, as Ijin rushes him with a flying kick, incapacitating the goon instantly. While Dusik is fighting, the leader thinks about his fighting prowess, saying they wouldn't have been able to win if he had more forces. He fights valiantly, but there are too many, and they slowly whittle him down. One says that he should just give up, as they will treat him well if he does so. He refuses, smiling sinisterly, saying they should go until the end, causing everyone to sweat a bit at his expression. They begin hearing the commotion Ijin is causing, wondering what is happening. He arrives, 
coming out of a hallway directly into the room, one wondering who this brat might be. Dusik asks him why he's here, and Ejin says he just had to return the motorcycle. One of the leaders laughs at this notion, ordering his men to mess Ejin up too. Dusik warns them, saying they should let him go. The leader scoffs, saying they can't let him go. But it would be Ejin who would let them go, as he eliminates the goons that attacked him swiftly, causing the leaders to panic. Dusik says he forgot to tell them something about him, that being that even he can't beat that guy. More rush him, but no dice, as Ejin is unbeatable. While having their attention set on Ejin, Dusik takes this opportunity to eliminate the leaders. After the fight, Dusik falls down, huffing from how tired he is. Ejin stands above him, with his knuckles bloodied up. He says that the debt has been repaid, with Dusik thinking it must be about the information he gave Ejin. He asks what happened to his sister, Ejin saying that thanks to him, they managed to save her in time. Dusik's subordinate wakes up in a hospital bed, screaming for his boss. He is right next to him, however, looking at his subordinate with tired eyes. He asks his boss how he got here, who says he got hurt and took a cab here. He asks about the clans that attacked him, the Goseong and the Xiongsu clans. He says they've all been taken care of. Dusik also says that he must have met Ijin, the subordinate saying that he got pissed after the attack and went to look for him. When he met Ijin, he wasn't thinking straight, so he ran up to him in rage. He was quickly knocked out by Ijin, however, sending him to the hospital in the process. Dusik thought he was at death's door when he saw all the clan men kept pouring in, but Ijin appeared, taking down everyone on both sides, leaving without looking back afterwards, saying his debt was paid. Hi, subordinate notes how cool that is, wondering what kind of monster he really is. Dusik jokes, saying he is just a normal high schooler. While playing football, Ijin catches the ball out of instinct, much to the dismay of his friends. The game ends, and they ask Ijin if he wants to go play at the PC cafe. Ijin says that he will come later, since he has to take his sister home today. They say that a spot will be saved for him. While packing up to go home, Dayun thinks about what kind of soup she should make when she arrives home. But her thoughts get interrupted, as she hears Ijin's name coming out of a classmate's mouth. A few girls are looking outside at the boys, all of them admiring Ijin. They go to Dayun, asking her if Ijin has a girlfriend. They wait for the answer impatiently, Dayun saying that he doesn't, and they rush in embarrassment out of the door. While going out of the school gate, Dawin notes how popular Ijin is, even Yuna asking about him frequently. She wonders why he doesn't have a girlfriend yet. Perhaps no one of interest has come into his life yet. She spots Ijin, who is talking with his friend at the school gate. She greets them. Lee, flustered by this, greets her too. They all go ahead without Ijin, saying they will wait for him. Dayun asks if he made plans with them, him saying he is going to go after stopping by their house. Dayun knows it's because of her, saying she is fine, and it's even bright outside. He doesn't have to keep doing this. She even refused a bodyguard Yuna proposed, felling like she wouldn't be able to live a normal life if she went that far. He caves in, but he will still walk with her from time to time, not because he is worried, but because he enjoys her company. He spots Yuna's acquaintance, who was waiting for him just outside the school. They ask who she is. She is Yuna's cousin, who says she wanted to thank them properly, perhaps by taking them out to dinner. Ijin refuses, saying he was already thanked by Yuna, so there is no need for such things. She is surprised at this refusal, saying she also has some things to ask him. He walks by her, however, annoyed at her constant nudging. He is not interested. She is even more surprised now, her guard asking if he should get them. She says to leave him, thinking he blatantly looked annoyed in front of her. At the PC cafe, Yung Chan excuses himself to the bathroom, but while heading there, he bumps into a person who curses at him for not watching where he is going. Yung Chan apologizes profusely. The guy prepares a slap, clearly trying to bully Yung Chan. Lee steps in, however, confronting the bully directly, clearly scaring him. With one final glare from Lee, the bully backs off. Lee looks at Yung Chan, saying they should go. Ju is going to be mad if they are late. They arrive back at the PCs, Ju asking what took them so long. Lee explains the situation, saying a student from Gosuk Technical High was trying to bully Yung Chan. Ju asks Yung Chan if he is all right, and he says that because of Lee, he was saved. At the entrance of the PC cafe, it seems like the bully came back with reinforcements. They walk to the group's table, 
who are too focused on the game to notice them instantly. Ju sees them, the bully saying to follow them outside. Young Chan thinks about the situation, thinking that things escalated because of him. The bully taunts them, thinking that they had more guys if they were so cocky in the first place. Lee mockingly says that he is acting tough now that he has back up, causing the bully to snap, throwing a punch at Lee. It doesn't hit, however, as he dodges and slaps the bully across the face. Young Chan is even more worried now, thinking that if he was more careful, none of this would have happened. Lee reassures him, saying it's not his fault, it's these guys. Ju notes that he stole this line from Ijin, with Lee flaring up in embarrassment. The bullies, having had enough of their playing around, charge them directly. Lee and Ju fight the bullies, making short work of most of them. They tell Yung Chan to stay back, saying that they are the high ranks at this. He laments this, thinking that this was all because of him. They keep fighting, noting how these guys get back up constantly. One lands a swift blow on Lee, causing him to stumble, a perfect opportunity for a punch. He gets saved by Yung Chan, however, who summons all his might to knock the bully down, allowing Lee to knock him out with a kick. It seems that they have defeated them all, with Lee asking Yung Chan if he is okay. Yung Chan apologizes once again, saying it was his fault that this happened, with Lee reassuring that he had no fault in this. Ijin texts them, wondering where they are. They pop out from behind a corner, saying that he missed a wicked six versus three. They go back into the cafe, and are surprised by all the guys Ijin beat down. Ijin says that they attacked him due to the uniform that he was wearing. The group looks in awe at him. After a while, they go to a convenience store to eat something. Lee and Ju carry the food and buy Yung Chan's favorite ramen, much to his surprise. They begin laughing at the guys that wanted to beat them, noting that even with their numbers, they couldn't beat them. While they are doing that, Ijin is puzzled about how to open his onigiri. He observes Lee and how he does it, and is infatuated when he manages to open it. Ijin speaks, asking how the fight even began. Lee explains that it was they who started it when they picked a fight with Yung Chan. He also asks Yung Chan how he is feeling, but he is much better. Lee teaches Yung Chan how to act in those sorts of situations. The attitude he is carrying is important. People like them will cause you even more trouble if you get scared. Ju seconds this. Yung Chan is hesitating, wondering if he won't get hit more in that case. Lee says that might happen. It depends on what kind of person he is facing. But in any case, he still shouldn't be scared. He can still do it if he tries. This causes Ijin to think about his past, where the bullying was much more severe, with the stronger ones forcing food away from the weaker ones. One also tried to do this to Ijin, but because it was survival of the fittest, it didn't end well for the bully, because Ijin is a survivor. Yung Chan is hesitant to speak, but summons the willpower to do so, saying that he hated Li and Ju not long ago. They bullied their classmates, including him. They didn't know this was counted as bullying. They thought it was just joking around. Also, it's not like they hit anyone or forced people to do stuff they didn't want. Compared to that, they are saints. Yung Chan shouts that the mean things they said and the pranks they pulled were still bullying for him, and he hated them because they did it without a second thought. Lee and Ju are shocked at this discovery and apologize profusely. They were just playing pranks. They never thought about it like that. Yung Chan says that it crossed his mind that it was like this after hanging out with them. As they said, they never stole or hit anybody. They apologize once again, and Yung Chan seems thankful. Disaster appears in that moment, however, as Ijin has dropped his onigiri, and he is extremely distraught at the sight. The group stared at his defeated face. Inside a SW-owned building, Yuna's cousin sits at a table, but notices a commotion outside her door. It's Yuna herself, demanding to know why she's investigating Ijin. She has investigated him before, too, but she promised to stop, so she demands her cousin do the same. She retorts this, saying that this is how people like them survive. Did she already forget what happened to her? Even if he saved her life, it doesn't mean he can be trusted. He is lying about all of his past, after all. Her guard perks up, saying that they had no choice but to look into him, since his documents were all falsified. The cousin says that she is glad Yuna is here, as the call containing all the information they need to know about Ijin will come soon. Isn't she curious as to who he is? Yuna says that she isn't, glaring at her while doing so, and the cousin does the same. The phone rings, the cousin responds, and we finally get her name. 
Shin Jie. The person on the other side of the phone says that he called about the information on Yi Jin. Jie is happy to finally get this information, but her hopes get shattered, as the caller says that the order from the higher-ups is that the SW group refrain from looking into him any further. This surprises everyone, and she gets mad, asking how they could ignore him. The caller says that because of SW group's relations with the government, all they can tell them is this. He is someone they don't have to worry about. After getting separated from his family because of a plane crash, he is just someone who wants to be home with his family. The next day, Yuna and Sukju go to school. They note that Yi Jin is absent, and Yuna goes to ask Yung Chan about his whereabouts. Lee, who was also there, tells her that the teacher called him, so he will probably be back soon. They sit down, and Sukju looks at his phone, saying that the company owner came to school, much to Yuna's surprise. She wonders if he came here to meet Ejin. It seems so, as Ejin is in the lounge with him, and he is thanking Ejin for saving Yuna. Ejin says the thing he always says, he was just saving his sister. Yuna just happened to be there. The owner says that he heard about that, but that doesn't change the fact that he saved Yuna. He also apologizes for getting his sister involved in something like this. Ejin notes that Yuna also apologized for this, so there is no need to. He turns his back, trying to leave after excusing himself. The owner suddenly asks Ejin if he can be Yuna's bodyguard, but Ejin says that's not a normal job for a high schooler like him. The owner retorts this, noting that no high schooler can take down not only that many men, but also soldiers from foreign forces. Ejin asks about the protection group she has, but the owner notes that they can't come to school, and with them following her constantly, she couldn't live normally. And Sukju asked to be released from his bodyguard duty, saying that he isn't fit for the job after what happened. Ejin leaves, saying that it's something that he can't do. While Ejin has his hands on the door handle, the owner says one final thing. Yuna isn't the only reason he is here. He came to personally thank him for what happened three years ago. This causes Ejin's eyes to widen. He finally has the chance to thank him, as he was able to watch over his son's final moments thanks to him. Ejin says that it was simply a request, but the owner says that it was a request that no one else took, because they all said it was insane. Because Ejin accepted the request, he was able to reunite with his son. He notes that he always talked about him. He couldn't stop thinking about how such a young man became a mercenary, and he asked him to look into it. But still, he couldn't find him. Yuna is also his daughter. Ejin thinks about her father's words, once saying that he had a daughter about his age. Ejin stops to think for a second, and says that he can't bodyguard Yuna. But he won't sit idly by if something happens to her. The owner says that's plenty enough already, and also asks him about how he feels about the SW guards, as they are very proud for no real reason, also assuming that they are the ones who solved the Yuna situation. That's why he wants his opinion on them, but not for free, as this is a formal request. Ejin sighs. He goes back into the classroom, and Yuna greets him, but he ignores her, as class has already started. While sitting down, he thinks about Yuna's father. They met on the battlefield, where he was a volunteer. He approached Ejin because he was quite young, and offered him a more nutritious meal, saying he has to eat well for his age. A while later, Ejin hears the conversation of a few of his fellow mercenaries, who talk about the money the client is pumping into a nearby town, as they are making roads and building schools and hospitals. They all think that this is a waste of money. We see that Yuna's father helped him constantly in little ways, giving him a chocolate bar, water and some chips, and even covering him up when it was raining. One day though, Ejin has to leave for the next assignment, and Yuna's father says that's too bad, as he got attached to Ejin. He says that he should visit him when he has time, as he will be here for about a month. He also gives Ejin a bag of food and medical supplies, causing Ejin to finally speak to him, asking why he is doing this. The father is surprised that Ejin knows Korean, and he says that Ejin reminded him of his daughter, so he couldn't leave him alone. After a while, Ejin hears from another mercenary that the volunteer group he escorted got attacked, and from the looks of it, they were just waiting for them to leave. Most of the volunteers were killed. Ejin's reminiscing gets interrupted by Yuna, who asks him for a bit of his time. They go to a resting area, where Sukju apologizes for doubting Ejin, who says that it's fine, he did what he had to. Yuna also invites him somewhere at the request of her grandfather, the company owner. She thinks that he will refuse, but he accepts the invitation, much to her surprise. 
Somewhere else, Ji Ye is still mad at the refusal of the information regarding Yi Jin. But her thoughts are interrupted by her subordinate, who tells her that Yi Jin is here to see her. Inside the SW building, Yi Jin gets prepped up for training, and Suk Ju asks why he accepted all of a sudden. He thinks about what the company owner told him. He just has to live with the rest of the bodyguards for a few days. He already talked to them, so it should be fine. Yi Jin says to Suk Ju that he just wanted to see what bodyguarding is like. He also asks him why he isn't training, but Suk Ju is on Team 3, and only Team 2 trains today. Team 3 is in charge of protecting Yuna, and Team 2 is protecting Ji Ye and her parents. Yi Jin goes to the training room, where the team leader is presenting him to the rest of the team. One asks if he is the student who solved the recent incident with Suk Ju, and his suspicions are confirmed. Yi Jin also greets them all. They all begin training, with Yuna also being there to observe. She thinks that this kind of thing suits him. That's when she spots Ji Ye, wondering why she is here. The chief is surprised at Yi Jin for keeping up so well, and speeds up, ordering everyone to do the same. Afterwards, they are all exhausted, except Yi Jin, who still looks like he has enough stamina to spare. The training continues, and Yi Jin is performing better than all of the guys in Team 2, Yuna and Ji Ye also noticing this. After the training session is done, the team leader wonders why Yi Jin is so skilled, and also spots Ji Ye, thinking that they are going to get bashed for their poor performance. One of the people on the team asks him if he can test Yi Jin's abilities in combat. The chief denies this offer at first, but Yi Jin steps forward, much to everyone's surprise, and says that he doesn't mind. The chief reluctantly lets them spar, but they must wear protective gear first. All of the people there wonder if Yi Jin is going to be okay, as most of the SW bodyguards are from the special forces. Ji Ye wonders how far he will go, with her subordinate saying that he doesn't have a chance, as the bodyguards were specially trained before coming to SW. The team leader puts some rules on this fight, saying that they should hold back, as this is only a sparring match. The guy Yi Jin is fighting says not to worry, while also trying to intimidate Yi Jin, who is unmoved by his words. The sparring begins, and the guy immediately closes the gap between them and throws a left hook, but Yi Jin dodges constantly. Seeing a chance to hit him, Yi Jin hits him in the leg and throws a punch, but the guy blocks it and tries to counterattack. His hook gets blocked, however, and Yi Jin throws a mighty punch, with the people there noting that he hit him where the helmet doesn't cover. The guy is stunned by this attack, and with one swift knee attack, Yi Jin ends the fight. Everyone is left surprised, with Sukju noting that he doesn't know how to hold back. Jia wonders if he is really 19, but her subordinate is fuming, looking with malicious intent. They carry the injured guy out of the room, the leader noting Yi Jin's battle skills. He also sees Ji Ye's subordinate staring at them. Apparently, he is the real team leader, and this guy is only a placeholder for this training session. Someone else requests to spar with Yi Jin, Choi Byom Suk, one of the best on the team. The impromptu leader says that he can't, but Yi Jin says to let them spar, as he hasn't done nearly enough to feel tired, causing everyone to stare in shock. They get into position, with Byom Suk not wearing a helmet saying he doesn't need one. Yi Jin also throws his away, surprising the other people. Ji Ye asks the team leader how he thinks he will go, and he says that the last one was just caught off guard, but this time he won't underestimate him. They train every day without rest, and Bae Om Suk is their team ace. Yuna's bodyguard notes that in a head-on fight like this, physical abilities decide the winner, and Bae Om Suk is the opponent. In any case, this is going to be difficult for Yi Jin. The sparring begins, and it appears they are evenly matched, with both of them blocking blows from each other. Bae Suk brags, saying that Yi Jin can't break through his defenses. He certainly can, however, as Yi Jin attacks one of his knees, causing him to lose his guard. Yi Jin takes this opportunity to land a few blows on him. He gets mad at this, and angrily throws a punch at Yi Jin. This proves to be a mistake, however, as Yi Jin blocks his attack and hits him in the neck, ending the spar. Yuna's bodyguard notes how skilled Yi Jin is, taking advantage of everything in a fight. Yi Jin asks if anyone else wants a turn, but they all sit silently. The impromptu leader tries to say something about Yi Jin's fighting style, but stops, thinking that it would be like nagging after losing to a high schooler. Ji Ye asks the team leader what he thinks, and he says that from basic training through sparring, he is exceptional. She moves forward, saying that they should move on to the next course. She speaks directly to Yi Jin, saying now that he has finished basic training, it's time to experience the real thing, 
and since he is already following Team 2's schedule, he is coming with her. Inside his office, the owner discusses Ijin with someone else, most likely a guard. They were both surprised by his abilities, and it's hard to believe that codename Jin was such a young kid. That name was well known years ago, meaning that he was this exceptional when he was younger than he is now. Inside the changing room, Ijin gets dressed up in a suit, looking quite dapper in it. At his house, the grandfather asks Dayun where Ijin is. She says that he has something to do, so he will be late today. He hopes that he will be all right and not get into any fights. Inside the SW building, the impromptu leader gives the team a serious glare, hoping they are ready for some harsh training. Yuna notices Ijin walking out of the changing room in a suit, with the team liking him even less now because of his looks. His bodyguarding duties begin, and he is ordered by the team leader to sit next to Jiye. Ijin does so, and the moment he sits down, he assesses the number of bodyguards here. Jia interrupts this activity by asking if he's ever wanted to become a celebrity, as she is in charge of an entertainment company, which is their destination for tonight. Ijin says he is not interested, sticking with the story that he is interested in bodyguarding. She says that he has talent in that field, taking into account how easily he took down two people from the team. The team leader is angry at hearing this, but Ijin excuses this loss, saying that they were only caught off guard because he is a student so they had to be more careful around him. It was an advantageous situation for Ijin from the start. Jiye thought he would have been happy after taking two trained people down, but the team leader knows that he was being considerate of them, understanding the situation they are in. They get to the destination and guard Jiye with the team leader, who notes that Ijin hasn't moved at all in the last hour. He asks Ijin where he got his training. That kind of performance requires diligent training. Ijin says that he simply learned it from the neighborhood he grew up in, the team leader thinking he must be joking. But it seems that his words hold some truth, as he had to run and train to survive in the place he was in, and sometimes even fight to the death. After a while, they get back on the road, with Jia asking him if he is okay, as it is getting quite late. He says that he is fine, and she also says that it doesn't look like he is bodyguarding for the first time. He reassures her that it is. The team leader feels the same way, as Ijin hasn't asked a single question, and they purposefully didn't give him dinner, but his facial expression shows no change. Ijin notices something, a truck that is approaching them from the front, the driver being passed out. The driver tries to dodge, but the impact still occurs, making the car spiral out of control. The team leader quickly assesses Jiye's status, but is surprised to see Ijin has already protected her by holding her tightly. He wonders how he protected her on such short notice. Jia quickly removes herself from his grasp, and a guard quickly comes and makes sure she is okay. It seems that this incident was caused by drunk driving, with the driver losing consciousness. The team leader orders them to call an ambulance and investigate him, just in case this was planned. Jia looks at Ijin, who is sitting calmly. One of the bodyguards shows two for an ambulance, reminding her that Ijin may have some wounds too. She asks if he is okay but it seems that he is fine. Ijin changes the subject and tells her that she should wear her seatbelt from now on, even if she is sitting in the back seat. She confusingly says that she will. Next day, Dayun is making lunch for Grandpa, and Ijin asks why she is doing it now. Dayun says that she will go to his workplace to give it to him. This was more of a frequent occurrence before, but she didn't have time after he came home. Ijin says that he will come with her to his workplace. At work, Someone notices that Grandpa looks quite happy and also invites him to eat some rice cakes during break. He says to go ahead as he has to recycle some things. While cleaning up some trash, he thinks about all the happy memories he made with Ijin, his face lighting up with joy. He suddenly spots a commotion, with someone asking a person to move their car as other cars can't get past it. The owner of the car angrily looks at the guy, saying that he just has something to throw away. He goes to where the Grandpa is and throws the trash right next to him, not even aiming for the trash cans that were literally in front of him. The grandfather picks them up. The guy's girlfriend gives him another bag to throw, and he does the same as he did with the cups, not even trying to recycle. The grandfather does it in his place, and that's when he hears Dayun's voice and looks behind him, seeing her and Ijin walking towards him. He asks what they are doing here, and Dayun says that they brought him lunch. She also asks him if he is recycling, and the grandfather says that he is. It will pile up if he doesn't. 
Dayun rolls her sleeves up and says that she will help. Ijin watches this spectacle with a smile on his face. Nearby, Dusik and his subordinate get out of an apartment complex, with Dusik saying that he finally got a good night's rest after sleeping in his own home. He suddenly spots Ijin, his subordinate saying that the patrolman he is with is his grandpa. Dusik also sees the girl he is with, thinking it must be his sister. He looks at Ijin, who is smiling. Dusik laughs to himself, thinking that he didn't know Ijin could make such an expression. He really looks just like a normal high schooler right now. His subordinate asks if they should go greet them, but Dusik refuses, saying that they will ruin the mood if they go there. After a while they all have lunch, and the siblings leave. The grandfather is happy to have such caring people around him. At night, he gets off work, and spots the car of the troublemaker parked in a place where it shouldn't be. He goes to them and says that they can't park here, as they will make it harder for other cars to leave. The troublemaker tells him that he can park wherever he wants, and his girlfriend asks if he wants to get fired. The grandfather calmly tells them that there is an empty space in the parking lot, but the troublemaker is having none of it, asking if he will pay for the damage if his car gets scratched. Suddenly, someone grabs the troublemaker's neck. It's Dusik's subordinate, and he intimidatingly chews out the troublemaker. He throws him at the car, ordering him to move it. He also gives them one final warning. If he ever sees them disrespect this elderly man again, they will suffer the consequences. While the car leaves, he turns around to the grandfather, his expression changing into a kinder one. He asks if he is all right, and the grandfather thanks him for the help. The subordinate says that there is no need for such formalities, and asks if he doesn't recognize him, as he comes around here frequently, and recently went to see Ijin. The grandfather remembers. A while later he tells Dusik the story while pouring him a glass. Dusik commends him for doing that, but that's when the door suddenly slams open. It's Ijin, who looks mighty angry. Dusik asks what's wrong, and he shows the message his grandfather sent him. It's a picture of him and the subordinate, and he's kind of proud of the picture. Ijin asks them if this is a threat, but it seems that it wasn't intended that way, as they both try to stop Ijin from going on a rampage, saying it was just a misunderstanding. At the SW building, Jiye asks about Ijin, and the team leader says that they took him to the hospital but that he only had mild injuries, nothing serious. She remembers how he saved her, and says that they should still ask him how he is doing, as if they made a kid work and he got hurt, there would be a lot of fuss. While getting dressed, Sukju asks Ijin why he acted so calmly compared to the last practice. Ijin says that he didn't know the rules of this place back then, and there's nothing good about standing out. Ijin also asks him why he is here. He thought Sukju quit bodyguarding. Sukju explains himself, saying that he was never a bodyguard in the first place. Considering his family issues and the fact that he grew up with Yuna, he just happened to take this job, with people encouraging him to do it. But due to his mistake, Yuna got kidnapped. He says that right before coming to Korea, he stopped another attempt by chance, and thinks that he got complacent without even realizing it. Sukju also asks him where he got trained, and Ijin uses the same excuse. He learned it in the neighborhood he lived in. Apparently Yuna was waiting outside the changing room, and sheepishly asks if he won't do bodyguarding work today. She wants him to come with her as a bodyguard, saying it will be good experience. He doesn't have to change clothes either. Everyone there is surprised at her demands. They all go to the convenience store near his house, with Yuna saying that she always wanted to eat this kind of food when she was in America. Ijin looks at his onigiri and has flashbacks of what happened previously. She asks him if there's anything he wants to eat, but Ijin says that he shouldn't if he is bodyguarding. Sukju intervenes, saying that Team 3 is already watching over her, so they can act normal now. He also wonders if she chose this place on purpose, thinking that Ijin would have refused if she invited him to a high-class diner. Yuna asks Ijin if he okay, noting the car crash that occurred recently. She also hopes that Jiye didn't give him any trouble, as she can be quite picky. Ijin says that she was fine, with Yuna noting that it's not like her to not nitpick everything. Sukju looks at Yuna, noting that he's never seen her like this before. Ijin thinks about his past, about what happened to her father. He urges Ijin to leave him, as he will soon die, even if he saves him. But he would still like to thank Ijin, as he is the only one who came to his rescue. He just wishes he could see his daughter's face one more time before his death. Ijin speaks up, 
saying that if he regrets not doing that, he should stand up. Healthier people have died in this place. He isn't going to die right this second. Ijin urges him to stand up, survive, and go see his daughter. Ijin asks Yuna for a private conversation, and Sukju swiftly excuses himself from the table. Yuna asks what this is all about. Ijin utters her father's name, Shin Inguk, and he asks what kind of person he was. Yuna is hesitant at first, but she tells him. He was a busy person, and with him being mostly overseas, they weren't that close. And even when he fell terminally ill, he still went overseas to work. Yuna notes her frustrations with him, as she didn't get to see him in his last moments. He kept working and died without even seeing his daughter's face. And if she is honest, she resents him a little. Yuna says that she doesn't know why Ijin asked for this, but she wouldn't have told him if he hadn't come to her rescue. Ijin looks at her and thinks of her father's words, who said that the work he is doing here is not pointless, as when he sees the children like this, he must do what he can as a father to a child. He notes that he made a lot of mistakes when it came to his daughter. He should have spent more time with her. Family is more important than any job. Ijin says to Yuna that her father worked until the very end in order to meet her. Ijin gets serious and says that he will now deliver to her the contents of the request given to him. He wanted to see her face before he died, and he is sorry that he couldn't. That's what her father, Shin Inguk, told him to tell her. We see this happen when the father is being dragged away for medical help. He asks Ijin to personally tell her these words. Even if he survives, he must tell her. Yuna wonders when Ijin met her dad, but he gets up and leaves, saying that this is all he can tell her. She begins crying at her father's words. Ijin didn't understand back then, but he can now understand the meaning of his request. It wasn't just for himself, it was also because he wanted to help Ijin escape this deadly battlefield. He included Ijin in the things he wanted to set right. The next day, someone knocks on Ijin's door. It's the lieutenant. They all sit down, with the grandpa noting that this is the first time they have met face to face. The lieutenant says that it's true, he came to Korea with Ijin when he first arrived, but didn't meet them, feeling that he would get in the way of the reunion if he did. The grandfather thought he was someone from the embassy so he was really surprised when he found out that a lieutenant had made Ijin able to come home. He says that he was also helped by Ijin, thinking that he almost died. The grandfather bows his head down, giving his sincerest thanks to him. This takes him by surprise, and he says there's no need for this sort of thing. The grandpa asks how they met, and the lieutenant comes up with the excuse that when he got assigned overseas, Ijin guided him. They invite him to have lunch here, and he accepts. He notices Dayun and says that Ijin's sister is also his, so she can call him Appa. He did not take into account that she is 17 and he is 36. While having dinner, he eats fast, shedding a tear and saying that it's been a long time since he had a home-cooked meal. The grandpa thinks that this is because of some tragic event, but his mother just sucks at cooking and his father likes to eat out, his favorite part about enlisting being the food. After that, Ijin and the lieutenant go to the convenience store to talk. He says that he is glad he is doing well, with the other guys asking him to say hello to Ijin for them. Ijin thinks about the memories he made with them, and smiles. Ijin asks why the sudden visit, and the lieutenant says that he had some business here, so he had to visit Ijin too. He adds that his grandpa and sister seem like good people, with Ijin agreeing with this. The lieutenant gets up and says that he has to go meet his fiancée, much to Ijin's surprise. He notes his surprise and gets angry, saying that he is able to get a girlfriend too. He explains that a rich family decided it, and he is kind of glad, as he is always moving around, so there's no time for such things. Before leaving, he asks Ijin one more question, if he found out what a family is. Ijin smiles, and says that he can understand a bit now. Inside the SW building, Chiye is talking to someone, it seems that she is the lieutenant's fiancée, who is sitting there with a little blush to his face. She notes that he must be very busy, calling him by his name, Hamchan. He says that she must be busier, he's just pretending to be as such. Chia thinks that she never expected to meet a soldier. She asks him how many times they met, and Hamchan proudly says that they met a total of 14 times. She notes that they've been engaged for a year, but they barely met because they are both too busy. Jiye also says she has a favor to ask. She pulls out Ijin's file, saying that she wants him to investigate Ijin, 
as even the government has refused this investigation. Hamchen apologizes and puts on a serious face, saying that he cannot do this favor for her. She's taken aback by this. Chiya says that she gets it, so there's no need to get so worked up. He thinks that this is how much he cares about Ijin. A few days later, Ijin gets a call from someone who tells him that the lieutenant and his squadron have been stranded. We see that this is true, with Hamchan noting that the enemy's movement has changed. In an undisclosed location, someone tells what is presumed to be the boss of these attackers that they cornered the lieutenant and his men in the target area. The boss smiles, exclaiming that it's time to hunt. It seems that the unknown caller who gave Ijin this information is none other than the SW group owner. He tells Ijin that they are engaging in skirmishes, with the military preparing to rescue them. The owner is letting him know because the situation is dire, so he should brace himself for anything. He also says that Ijin shouldn't even think of moving on his own to help, as it's not the same as before. He has a family now. Ijin thinks of the times he spent with the lieutenant, covering his real past, helping him when he was down, and even when Ijin told him his real name. He also remembers the time he told him about his family, with everyone congratulating him, and the lieutenant smiling gently at him. He doesn't know what to do. Dayun tells him to come eat, and he comes into the room, staring unknowingly. He breaks out of it and sits down, where the grandpa and Dayun are talking about the meal they all shared at his workplace. Ijin asks him about helping someone who has helped you in the past, and the grandpa begins explaining. It's difficult to answer that question. It depends on what they did for you, and what you can do for them. But one thing's for sure. The kindness of the person who helped first is greater, because they helped without wanting anything in return. In life, there are times when you must repay kindness, and if that is not possible, at least do what you can within your limits. Ijin thanks his grandpa, saying that he is glad to have met him again, who says that he is glad Ijin said that. He says the same thing to his sister, who gets embarrassed. It seems Ijin has made up his mind, as he calls the owner and says that he is going, and to prepare the things he needs if possible. At the lieutenant's location, he orders everyone to do different things while they rest, with a soldier coming up to him and saying that they are exhausted, and one even lost a lot of blood. The lieutenant says that they must at least go to the next area if they want to get rescued. But the situation is dire, as their supplies are almost out too. At the attacker's camp, the boss says that they are surprised the lieutenant and his men lasted that long, noting that if he didn't have civilians with him, they would have taken great damage as well. While saying this, his eye aches, and this wound appears to have been caused by Ijin. While on a plane, Ijin thinks about the debriefing he got. The area he will be going to is Grion, with Ijin already having worked here before. The lieutenant went to rescue some Korean researchers who were there for some local minerals. They picked them up without any trouble, but on the way back, they were attacked by an unidentified group. The owner's guard says that the supplies and plane he needs are ready. The owner asks Ijin one last time if he is really going, but Ijin has already made up his mind. With one minute until reaching the landing zone, Ijin gets fired up, and a red line is forming in his eyes. He is ready. At school, Yuna wonders where Ijin is, thinking that she called him but there was no answer. In Grion, Ijin assesses the footprints and bullet casings, thinking that the lieutenant must be going to the third checkpoint. Somewhere else, the lieutenant and his men are holding off an attack. He notices that one of them has a rocket launcher and swiftly snipes him, causing the rocket to miss. Seeing this, the attackers retreat for now. He asks a fellow soldier for a status update, and there have been no more casualties, but there's barely any ammo left, and the checkpoint is three hours away. The lieutenants note that it will be difficult to arrive there, as they have injured men and civilians. The soldier adds that the attackers have repeated the same cycle of retreating after having a few casualties and chasing them again shortly after. The lieutenant thinks that this is how they've been slowly chipping away at them, without caring how many casualties their side takes. At first, he thought they were attacking without a plan, but there's a pattern. They were forced to retreat to the first checkpoint, and even to the second one. They are chasing like they already know where the lieutenant and his men are going. The best chance they have is to get to the third checkpoint and protect it until a rescue team arrives. He will get these people back, no matter what. In an undisclosed location, the boss gets the news that the plan is going as expected. A man suddenly barges in, screaming that his soldiers are dying for no reason, 
As the attacks do nothing to the group, the boss gets up and intimidatingly says that their opponents are special forces. If his soldiers had attacked all at once, they would have suffered much greater casualties. Then he would have lost all of his men and the area over which he has jurisdiction. The man tries to respond, but swiftly gets shot by the boss's subordinate. Outside the tent, his men round up the soldiers and order them to take them out, as they have served their purpose. It cuts back to the lieutenant, where the soldier tells him that they have only 500 meters to go. He orders his men to move slowly from now on, and thinks that since the enemy already knows this area, there is a good chance they are waiting at the checkpoint. The boss speaks to his subordinate and says that he loves this moment, the moment where they catch a beast that thinks there's a way to escape. Imagine the despair they will feel. The lieutenant slowly moves forward and finds that the attackers have already been taken out. Inside the tent, the boss is screaming at the news and says to his subordinate to tell the team that was following the lieutenant to move swiftly and catch them. He changes his mind and does it himself, picking up a walkie-talkie and demanding a report from them. One picks up and says that they are currently engaging with the enemy. They were attacked while chasing the target. The boss demands to know who they are battling, but the guy who answered gets taken out in that moment. He realizes that they were the ones who were being hunted this whole time, that hunter being none other than Ijin. He thinks that in 30 minutes, the lieutenant's group can escape, so he will hold them back until then. He moves swiftly and shoots with deadly precision, taking multiple enemies out in an instant. They notice where he is shooting from and return fire. But because of this terrain, he can move freely, and the enemy won't be able to figure out his real position. The lieutenant looks back and notices the gunfight that is happening behind him, wondering who is attacking who in that place. He orders his men to sit here until reinforcements arrive. Ejin continues to hold the attackers, thinking that they have figured out that Ejin doesn't have many people, and that he is attacking from multiple points to create confusion. Ejin notices that there are fewer enemies than before, and gets on his belly, crawling to a nearby bush. It seems like his hunch was right, as three people were preparing to ambush him. He takes aim and takes them out, saying that he doesn't have the advantage anymore, and that there are 14 more minutes left. The lieutenant and his men sit still, and one announces that the rescue team will arrive shortly. One of the walkies suddenly buzzes. It's Ejin, who says that he will be with them in three minutes. They are all surprised by this news. The lieutenant thinks that he must be the one who took all those men down. He notices someone coming out of the bushes with their hands up, and sure enough, it's Ejin. While the plane arrives, the lieutenant rushes to him and grabs his clothes, demanding to know why he is here. This isn't like before. Ejin says that's why he came. If he hadn't helped after hearing he was in danger, he would have regretted it for the rest of his life. These words cause the lieutenant to cry, wondering what he will do with Ejin. They all escape the battlefield. The boss arrives at the location where the skirmishes took place and assesses the situation. His subordinate says that Team Alpha has been wiped out, and 17 out of the 20 in the Delta team are dead. It looks like the Alpha team was put down without a fight, and the Delta team was ambushed while they were moving. The boss asks about the enemy, but they haven't identified him, other than the fact that they were small in number. The boss thinks about what went wrong. The only time he has seen something like this was when 001 was still with them, his wound aching at the thought. The boss speaks saying that only 001 used to be like this. The subordinate says that he was eliminated years ago, but the boss orders him to investigate again, as if he is still alive. Ejin continues his training with Team 2, with Yuna watching him from the sidelines. Sukju seems on edge, however, as he is always looking at Ejin and trying to beat his performances. But no luck, as this is child's play to Ejin compared to what he went through. Inside the changing room, Sukju notices that Ijin's arm is bleeding. He quickly hides it, leaving Sukju to think that the injury is pretty bad if it bled through the shirt. But even with an arm like that, he still got the best scores. He speaks to Ijin about his performance, noting that he feels like a small fish in a big pond. He must have been training for a long time to get such performances. Sukju has been called a genius since he was little, so that's why he is a little frustrated. But he doesn't plan on losing either. Ijin says that he noticed Sukju trying to beat him in every training session, but he understands how he feels, as they are the same age. He also heard that Sukju was also trained to be an aide to Yuna. He confirms this, saying that his grandfather and father work at SW, and ever since he was little, his workplace has been decided. 
and he was in the same age group as Yuna, so he naturally got trained to assist her when she gets a job in SW. Ijin suddenly says that he couldn't be anyone's aide. He doesn't know a lick about that stuff. Everyone has different specialties. Sukju comes next to him, saying that he still doesn't plan on losing against him during training. This causes Ijin to smile. Yuna, who was waiting outside of the changing room, congratulates them on a job well done. She also asks Ijin what happened, as he didn't come to school for a few days. Ijin says that some things happened, and that's when he gets a call from the lieutenant. He answers, and gets the news that the surgery of the injured soldier went well. The lieutenant adds that he is alive thanks to Ijin, as if they had stayed longer there would have been dire complications. He also thanks him, saying that he saved all of their lives. The soldiers all thank him over the phone. The lieutenant gets serious, saying that he doesn't want Ijin to go on the battlefield ever again. It isn't right for his family. Ijin stops him, saying that it was thanks to him that he met his family, so he felt that it was worth going back there. The lieutenant smiles, saying that he is grateful for his words. They say their farewells and close up the call. Yuna notices and comes up to him, asking if he is going home. Ijin says that he is going to his friends, as they are waiting for him at a PC cafe. Yuna's face lights up, and she says that she wants to go too. They get there, and see that the place is ransacked, with a worker trying to clean it up. Sukju asks what happened, and the worker explains that there were students in the same uniform as them chilling, but some other school's students came and started fighting them. Ijin looks at his phone, presumably to call someone. Outside, Yung Chan is running for his life, with a couple of students chasing him. He thinks about what happened, how Li and Ju were swarmed by students, and how he ran away. That's when his phone buzzes. It's Ijin. Li and Ju put up a good fight, but it's taking a toll as they are both injured and tired. One of the attackers, who looks burlier than the others, says that they are not half bad. Li mocks him, saying that he should come fight himself instead of sending his goons to fight his battles. This enrages the guy, and he charges Li. They begin trading blows, with Li landing a few hits, even a kick in the stomach, but they are too weak, as he is extremely tired by this point. The kick seems to have not landed, however, as the guy grabbed his leg before the attack connected. He wails on Lee, throwing him on the ground in the process. Ju is too worried about him to see the attack coming from behind him, and he gets stomped out of commission. The big guy, Inchin, keeps pummeling Lee with his foot. He gets interrupted by a student, who says that someone named Tai Su told them to drag Lee and Ju over at his place. We see that Lee has been left in a pile of blood. Ijin meets with Yongchan, who explains the situation. He thinks that this is payback for what they did a while ago. Lee and Ju were able to defend themselves for a while, until Guinshin appeared. He is the right-hand man of the strongest guy in Gosuk High, Kitesu. They are famous enough to be scouted by gangs. He thinks that it's all his fault. If he hadn't picked a fight with that guy back then, none of this would have happened. Ijin asks where he last saw them. Sukju says that they were in the alleyway near the subway. Ijin begins walking to that location much to Sukju's surprise. He thinks about all the happy memories he made with them, and musters all his strength to move forward, deciding to come as well. Sukju looks at them, and Yuna's guard says that he should go, as no matter how long he's been with the SW group, he is still a high schooler, just like them. He smiles, and excuses himself, saying that he will be back soon. Yuna wants to go too, but the guard stops her, saying that she doesn't need to be involved, as they will solve it. She pouts at this, and the guard sweats profusely at her reaction. Yung-chan wonders if Ijin will be able to handle all those people by himself, but that's when Sukju joins them, who says that they are in the same class. He had to help. The rescue group has formed. They get to their location, but there's no sight of them. Sukju picks up their phones, noting that they were smashed on purpose. They must have been dragged away. Ijin looks at the blood that was left behind. Suddenly a pack of goons come out behind them, who are relieved to see Yung-chan as they were looking for him. Sukju says that this is convenient, as they will ask these guys where they went. One of the goons tries to attack Ijin, but his lights swiftly get taken out. Another tries to attack from behind, but they are no match, as he and Sukju make short work of them. Yung-chan is surprised at their skills. Ijin crouches down to one of the goons' level, looking at him with predatory eyes. He asks where they dragged Li and Ju, but the guy gives him the middle finger, causing Ijin to bash his head into the ground, knocking him out instantly. 
They both look at him, and Sukshu says that he will do the talking from now on. At a bar, Lee and Ju are standing in front of Tai Su, who is beating two people to a pulp with a bat. He sits down, noting how he got humiliated in front of his seniors because of these two. He thinks about what happened, with his senior asking if it's true that ten Gosuk High guys were beaten by four guys from Shinan High. Taisu is shocked at this news, and the senior warns him that he should step up his game, because at this rate, they will have to reconsider their decision to scout them. He asks Inchin why there are only two, and he excuses this by saying that the one who ran will be found soon, and the other one they couldn't find at all. Taisu gets mad, asking if this is the best he can do. Inchin notes that he is more on edge than usual, so he shouldn't provoke him. Thus, he apologizes. Taisu asks Lee where the other guys are, but he refuses, causing a bunch of goons to swarm him. He orders them to stop, and says that they will do it like this. The first one to speak gets to walk away, and the one who doesn't is going to have to work for them. There's no running from them. Lee and Ju burst out laughing, saying that he had watched too many movies. Taisu has had enough and he swiftly grabs his bat and begins wailing on them, with no signs of stopping, even his men are terrified. A crash suddenly occurs, and he stops to ask what that was. At the bar entrance, the guards were knocked out, and inside, it seems that the boys have finally arrived. Taisu asks how they got here in the first place. Yungchan sees the poor state Li and Ju are in, with Ijin and Sukju staring with no emotion. The people in the bar laugh at them for coming here, and Yung-chan wonders just how many there are. Taisu drops his bat and sits down, ordering his men to attack. Inchen thinks that he is glad to have been able to solve this. These guys are surely doomed. But it seems to not be the case, as Ijin and Sukju take the attackers out in no time. Everyone in the bar is left surprised, and Inchen, being the most surprised, orders more men to jump them. They do so, and a swarm of goons flood them. Ijin moves swiftly and attacks first, jumping in the air and landing a deadly air kick against two of them. Sukju isn't far behind, dealing with his fair share of goons. Young Chan just stares in shock. The battle continues, with Ijin having no difficulties. Sukju suddenly gets grabbed from behind, with one coming from the front to land a blow, but he makes short work of him and the guy behind him. This display causes Taisu to drop his cigarette. The goons try their best, but after a while, only Ijin and Sukju are left standing. Thirty people taken down just by these two. Ijin stares at Taisu, causing him to panic. Inchin stares at him, wondering if he should do something, but he doesn't get to, as Sukju knocks him out. Taisu grabs his bat, thinking that Ijin must be tired by now. He tries to attack, but his bat gets parried, and Ijin counterattacks with a blow to the throat and a knee to the face. Taisu is desperate now, so he grabs his knife and goes directly for Ijin's throat but he dodges and puts him in a handlock. Ijin slams him into the ground, ending this fight. They have won. Li and Ju wake up, and Yung-chan rushing to see how they are doing. Li looks at Ijin and gives him a thumbs up, saying that in the real world, he is the challenger, even though he is bronze in game. A while later, Taesu and Inchan are getting beaten up by a senior for humiliating them in such a manner. Taesu apologizes, making the senior bash him even more saying that they are supposed to get leverage since the Gosian and Sungsu clans are gone. Another comes from behind, presumably the boss, and says that it's enough. He asks if they sent the guys after them, and one confirms this. He also says that when they get them, they should make sure to break at least one of their arms or legs. They have to pay the price for messing with them, even if they are kids. Taisu grins at this, thinking that Ijin and his friends are doomed now. At Dusisk's building, Yung Su, his subordinate, explains the situation, saying that Kim Chuman's men were making a fuss because some guys who recently joined their family messed with that high schooler. They obviously got destroyed, but they are sending men to retaliate, as it would be bad for them if news of them getting their snot kicked in by a high schooler got out. Dusisk sighs and orders Yung Su to call some men over. He smiles and said that he had taken care of that already. His men heard that he wiped his hands clean of the congressman's business, so they all came together to greet him. Dusik smiles and goes outside, where a ton of men are greeting him. Dusik welcomes them, saying that they will go for a drink after they take care of job. The Dusik family is back in business. While walking, 
Sukju and Yuna are swarmed by Chuma's men, who say they should come with them for a bit. They don't even get to touch a hair on either of them, however, as three cars full of guards swarm the place, with Yuna's guard noting that Sukju must have gone all out against these guys for this kind of retaliation. At the bar, Dusik and his men clear out Chuman's goons. He asks why Dusik is doing such a thing, with Taisu noting that the Dusik clan was the strongest in the region. He thought they stopped gang activities, however. Dusik explains that he should have left children's fights to children. Chuman asks what he's talking about, but finally gets it. It's about that high schooler. Dusik smiles, saying that adults should deal with adults. At the convenience store, Ijin is having dinner with Dayun. He smiles at her as she enjoys the meal, and that's when Dusik calls him. He asks what Ijin is doing, and he explains that he is having dinner with his sister. He invites Ijin to some barbecue sometimes, his treat. Ijin says that it's a bit much, and Dusik says that eating dinner with someone like him might be a bit much. But Ijin replies that he should just buy him noodles at a convenience store, as he doesn't want anything expensive. Dusik smiles and says they will have noodles together sometimes. He closes the call, and we see that he dominated Chuman's men, who are bowing down in defeat. The next day, after class ends, Ju and Li get up instantly and invite Ijin and Yung Chan to the PC cafe. Yung Chan is worried about Li's arm, but he says that his fingers are fine, so he shouldn't have a problem with the mouse. Ju asks him if he will use his arm as an excuse to troll, and it seems to be precisely so. Li also asks Sukju if he wants to come, saying he will pay for the food since he is indebted to him for saving them. Sukju agrees, and Yuna says she wants to come with. Sukju calls for Ijin, getting his attention. He asks if it's true that he is bronze, and Ijin confirms this. This causes Sukju to smile and walk away, annoying Ijin a little. At the PC cafe, Li and Ju are arguing over the game while playing, with Sukju and Ijin playing calmly, and Yuna watching them. They have snacks and drinks while playing, and Yuna gives Ijin a look every now and then. They finish playing and say their farewells. Ijin's phone rings, it's his sister. She asks if he has eaten already, and he says no, and that he was on his way home. Suddenly, she and the grandpa pop up in front of him, saying that they are going to buy some groceries. Ijin tags along too, and he spends some quality family time with them. They get out of the convenience store, with the grandpa asking if Ijin is okay with carrying so much, who says that it's fine. Suddenly, something caught his attention. A blonde man wearing a trench coat. He says that it's been a while, calling Ijin by his codename, 001. It seems that this guy was a mercenary with Ijin. The grandpa asks if he is a friend, with Dayun wondering if he is a foreigner. Ijin says that he was a friend from the place where he used to live. He approaches, and they exchange greetings. Ijin looks at him. The grandpa invites the guy to dinner, but he refuses, saying that he was just passing by. The grandpa and Dayun excuse themselves so Ijin and he can keep talking. Ijin asks 006 how he found him, and he says that the camp found out he is alive, and they are looking for them as they speak. There's no need to be cautious as they haven't found him yet, and he was nearby when he heard this news, so he decided to visit. But he warns Ijin that the camp will find him soon, and they are going to order him to eliminate Ijin, who looks at him with his eyes now turning black. 006 also asks him for some lunch. They go and eat, both noting the nutritional value of the noodles they ate. Ijin gets serious, asking how he found him. 006 says that it's because he knew he was alive. Besides, is there anyone who knows better than him? He also asks Ijin if his memory is back, and he confirms this. They also speak about 032, apparently depressed after Ijin's presumed death. Ijin wonders why 006 didn't tell him. But he says that the fewer people that know Ijin is alive, the better. 032 included. Ijin says that he figured 006 would find out he is still alive, but he didn't think he would keep this a secret from his superiors. 006 says that he didn't think he would either, and we see that when Ijin was presumed dead, 006 found out about the trail of blood Ijin left behind, but he ignored it, not reporting it to anybody. He notes that he did it because he considered Ijin a friend. He also says that the well-known mercenary codename Jin must have been him. Ijin gives him a knowing look, confirming this. 006 notes that his area of activity didn't overlap with the camps, but still, he should have stayed out of their sight. 
Ejin says that he didn't have a choice. 006 adds that Ejin has been acting differently than before, but he can't tell if it's a good or bad thing just yet. His phone suddenly rings, and he answers. 006 speaks for a bit and puts the phone in his pocket, but that's when he breaks a chopstick and aims for Ejin's vitals, who narrowly blocks his attacks. 006 says that the order to eliminate him came faster than expected, and the one to kill him. Ejin says it can't be helped. That's when a girl gets out of the convenience store they were at and sees them recycling, noting that they are both hot. 006 leaves, saying that he can't do it here, as it is too public. He also says that the way Ejin is now, he thinks it's better than before. At the SW building, Sukju is doing some exercises, but suddenly gets called by Ejin, who says that he needs a favor. Sukju asks what it is, and Ejin tells him to get a hold of the surveillance cameras at the location he tells him, and there's also someone he wants Sukju to keep track of at all times. Sukju wonders what happened, saying that he needs the permission of the higher-ups to do these kinds of things, and the process would take a long time. He asks Ejin when he needs all of this, who tells him that it's right now, much to Sukju's surprise. At Dusik's place, Yung Su tells him that Ejin came by and asked for a motorcycle, so they lent him one. Dusik notes that the only bike around here is his. Yung Su adds that he got scared just by seeing his uniform. Ejin moves swiftly between cars, wearing a leather jacket. He speaks with Sukju, who has done the things Ejin requested. He says that he's been following the target he wanted, and his movements were a bit strange. It felt like he was aware of the CCTV and his movements were highly irregular. He is clearly trying to hide his tracks. He also asks Ejin what's going on, but he replies with just personal issues. They hang up the call, and Sukju thinks about this. The fact that Ejin asked about the target's route means he is already on his tail, and the target is also a foreigner, so there's nothing he can find with his current abilities. Ejin arrives at 006's location, a warehouse. He notes that he can't drag this fight on, as he will be at a disadvantage since he has people to protect. He will have to end it here and now. Inside 006 is preparing for the job when he suddenly gets a call from an unknown number. He answers and the caller asks how he is already in Korea. They just found out that Ejin was in that country. He tells the caller that he knows Ejin on a personal level, and because he recently finished a mission nearby, he came here just in case. Since he is a traitor, he has to eliminate him no matter what. The caller, who is the boss, says that he can rest if 006 is on the case, but he should still be careful, as Ejin is someone who once held the number of 001. 006 notes that it's been a long time since then, with the boss agreeing, saying that he's been hiding this whole time, so he shouldn't have that much in field practice. He closes the call, saying that he will be waiting for the news. 006 looks at his phone and barely spots Ejin coming from behind him, donning a predatory stare. 006 tries to go for the gun but gets tackled, with the gun being thrown away. 006 thinks he must have found him because of the surveillance cameras, and also says to Ejin that he's going overboard, they barely just separated. Ejin sits in silence. They engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they seem to be evenly matched. Ejin tries to hit him with a leg kick, but 006 catches his leg and cuts it with a karambit he had hidden, also noting Ejin's skills. 006 charges him, and Ejin tries his best to dodge, but suddenly lets himself get hit, giving him the opportunity to disarm 006, and he does so. He kicks Ejin and goes for the gun, but he doesn't have time to shoot, as Ejin has thrown the karambit in his way, causing him to get hit and flinch. 006 shoots in Ejin's direction, but he dodges and ducks behind some cover. His bullets run out and he goes to grab a suitcase, taking it and trying to run away. Ejin notes that he can't let him get away and runs as fast as he can with his injured leg, but he is too late, as 006 has already gotten on the bike and is on his way out. Ejin is desperately looking at this, thinking about his family, but that's when a car suddenly crashes into 006, causing him to get knocked out. The driver gets out of the car. It's Sukju, who asks if he shouldn't have gotten involved. Ejin stares in shock. While driving away, Sukju thinks about what happened at the warehouse. He first asked Ejin if he was okay, who said that he was, even though he didn't look like it. He also looks at 006 and wonders if he hit him too hard, but Ejin says to check on him, giving him a knowing stare. Sukju says that he looked into that man, but he only found out he was a normal tourist. Was that not the case? 
He also wonders how he will explain the damage on the car. Inside the warehouse, Ijin has tied 006 up, demanding he wake up. He knows 006 is conscious. He laughs, saying that he didn't think Ijin would have backup. It was his mistake to think that Ijin would work alone. Ijin asks him who else got the order for his elimination, and 006 says that he is not sure, but it's unlikely there's anyone other than him right now. He was close to the location and the timing was right. Plus, the camp doesn't want the news about Ijin to surface. They wouldn't want the others to know that they made a mistake regarding his death. So they will try to end him as quietly as possible. 006 also notes that they will never give up, since the camp sustained a lot of damage because of him, especially the boss, who will be leading the charge to end Ijin. 006 says that he has no more information, so Ijin should kill him. While Ijin approaches with the knife, he thinks that dying at the hands of Ijin doesn't sound bad at all, much better than some random person. But Ijin instead cuts his bindings off, much to 006's surprise. He asks Ijin why he isn't ending his life, who says that there's a reason for him to be alive, the reason he can't escape camp. This causes 006's eyes to widen. Ijin also says that he experienced this himself, 006 thinking it must be his family. Ijin proclaims him as dead, and says that he should go somewhere where the camp can't find him. 006 thinks that this might put 032 in danger, but Ijin adds that 032 must feel the same way, and it's better than dying here. 006 gets up and walks away, but not before telling Ijin that his family is in danger, as they will use them to get to him. Ijin says that he knows, and this would have turned out differently if he went after his family first, but even so, Ijin wants to protect this lifestyle. 006 smirks and says that he will mess up the information about Ijin as much as possible before disappearing. He also asks Ijin for his name, referring to him as 001 all this time. He says his name, and 006 does the same, with his name being Liam. With this, he leaves. Ijin arrives home, thinking that nobody is asleep, but his grandpa suddenly comes out of his room to check on him. Ijin hides his wound, asking why he isn't asleep yet. The grandpa excuses this as some coffee he had today. He says Ijin should wash up and get some rest, closing the door behind him. Dayun also comes out of her room, whispering that he shouldn't feel bad for the grandpa staying up this late to wait for him, as he still worries about him a lot. Also, there's food on the table, so he can eat that if he wants. Ijin wonders why this might be, and Dayun says that he likes homemade food, so they left some for him. She also closed the door behind her after saying this. Ijin looks at the table and sees that her words are true. The sight causes him to smile. Sukju's phone suddenly buzzes. It's a message from Ijin, thanking him. This causes Sukju to blush. The next day at school, Ijin stops Sukju while he is walking with Yuna, saying that he has something to tell him. They go into the break room and Ijin says that he wants to tell him about the situation. Ijin says that the person Sukju ran over yesterday was someone he used to work with in the past and he came to meet him. They both looked at each other for a few silent moments with Sukju finally asking if that's all. Ijin confirmed this. He also notes that it's better if he doesn't know anymore, saying that he should stop investigating the person he was with. He only told him all of this because Sukju helped out. He smiles and says that he didn't plan on investigating further into this matter anyway. He already figured that it had connections to Ijin's past, so he stopped, since he wronged him before. They go back to the classroom, Yuna asks Sukju what they talked about, and he makes the excuse that Ijin was asking about how to rank up in the game they were playing. Yuna wonders why he didn't talk to Yongchan about this, them thinking it must be because Sukju is closer to his skill level, hurting his pride a bit. Outside, Dayun is taking some notes about what she should buy, but gets interrupted by a guy who asks her for her contact information. Dayun is surprised at this and refuses, saying it's a bit much, and they've only just met. The guy drops his face and his friend comes from behind him to laugh at this rejection. He gets angry, saying that it's just some contact information. It's not like he's asking her for a date. He suddenly gets smacked in the head from behind. It was Lee, who had had enough of him asking Dayun for her contact information. The guy raises his head in anger, but gets smacked again, with Yu keeping his friend in check. They leave, the guy already having revenge in mind. Lee asks Dayun if she is okay, and she says that she is but also thanks them for the help. Near the area, Taesu is being guided by the guy who bothered Dayun. 
He says that everyone is disrespecting Gosuk High now, with Inchin saying that the rumors must have spread and they should do some cleanup, starting with the guy they are going after now. The guy points at Dayun and Ijin, saying that those are the people, except Ijin wasn't there before. Taisu and his men suddenly get flashbacks at the sight of Ijin. Taisu suddenly smacks the guy, asking him if he is trying to mess with them. They all begin wailing on him. At home, Dayun notes Ijin's ability to cut fruit, saying that it's much better than hers. His phone rings, and he goes to pick it up. It's Liam, who says that he planted some evidence as far as he could, and his movements will revolve around that area too. He adds that when he leaves the country, he will leave traces of Ijin in other countries as well. Ijin says that he will do the same, and Liam laughs at the situation, saying that Ijin died and came back to life, and he also died while he was still alive. He notes that they won't be meeting anymore, and they exchange farewells, ending the call. Li and Ju tell Ijin what happened with his sister, but they also reassure him, saying that they smacked the guy around a few times and he left. They were also wearing Gosuk Hai uniforms. After hearing that name, Sukju and Ijin manifest a terrifying aura, saying that this mustn't be a coincidence, much to Li and Ju's surprise. Yuna says that there's no issue here, as Dayun has always been popular, because she is pretty. Young Chan confirms this, saying that she used to be popular, but people grew distant when the bullying occurred. Ijin thinks about this, and Sukju says that they should at least go and confirm this. Inside the locale, Taesu discusses their situation with Incheon, saying that people have started ignoring them after what happened. Taesu thinks about what happened a few days ago, with Chuman screaming at them for messing with Ijin. Incheon suggests that they do some cleaning up as soon as possible. He gets up and says that they will be doing it now. Suddenly, Sukju and Ijin walk through the door, much to everyone's surprise. Ijin asks if they messed with his sister. Taisu doesn't know anything about that, but remembers him walking home with a girl, the girl their guy messed with. They both grow a deadly stare, and Taisu urges them to calm down as they didn't approach her because she was related to Ijin. His brother just happened to talk with a random girl. They didn't mean anything by it, and they will tell everyone not to go near her ever again. They exchange a few glares, and Sukju and Ijin leave. Outside, the group was waiting for them, and Yuna asks what happened. Sukju explains the situation, saying it was just Taisu's brother, Lee shocked at the news. Ijin says that he plans on keeping watch a little longer, though. He can't trust their words, after all. Later, him and Dusik are having lunch at the convenience store with him noting that it's been a while since he's had a meal like this. He also heard that Ijin borrowed the motorcycle again, who says that he will return it soon. Dusik says that he should keep it, as it's gathering dust in the parking lot anyway. But Ijin insists. While eating, Dusik notes that right now, Ijin looks just like a normal high schooler. But with the congressman's situation and the help he provided, Dusik can't get a clear grasp on him. He asks Ijin what he does normally to which he replies that he's just living a normal high school life. Dusik just smiles. Inside the SW building, the owner's guard tells him that people think they're expanding too fast. He says that people will always complain and that they are moving pretty carefully, but they can't avoid making enemies. The guard agrees, but says that they are antagonizing dangerous people with this expansion. His words cause the owner to ponder. The next day, he invites Ijin for some tea and they talk about his bodyguarding activities. Silence falls shortly, however, and Ijin excuses himself, saying that it's training time right now. The guard looks at the owner while sweating. While doing his training, the team leader speaks to Jiye, saying that he's not standing out as much anymore. But it feels like he's holding himself back in order to go unnoticed. His athletic and awareness abilities are greater than any of the team members, and he's also very experienced. It is certain that he received constant professional training. While looking at him, Jiye thinks about the discussion she had with the lieutenant. They talked about the injury he received while on a mission, with Jiye saying that he should be more careful. The lieutenant's eyes suddenly narrow, and he asks if she is still investigating that student, Yu Ijin. Jiye is suspicious, especially so since the lieutenant is failing horribly at keeping his composure. She assures him that she isn't, and his face suddenly lights up, and she notices this as well. She thinks Eugene must be acquainted with her fiancé. While in the car, 
Jia asks Ijin again if he doesn't want to be a celebrity, but he promptly shuts the offer down, much to her annoyance. She also asks if she knows who Lieutenant Kong Ham Chan is, as he is her fiancé. His eyes suddenly widen. Jia's hunch was confirmed. Suddenly, Ijin maintains a better posture, leaving Jia wondering what happened for him to change it. They arrive at their location, and while in the staff room, Ijin sweats a little while thinking about this news. While in the restroom, Jia is applying some makeup, when suddenly, a woman appears. Jia turns away from her, and that's when she comes from behind and makes her pass out, with another doing the same with the guards that were outside. The team leader gets the news about the situation, and orders everyone to close off the exit and check every CCTV. Ijin suddenly rushes out of the room, thinking that they must be trying to escape by car. He bolts to the parking lot and spots a man getting into his car. He approaches swiftly, but finds out it's just a stranger. He suddenly spots another car leaving the parking lot, and he rushes to get in front of it. He does so, and the car doesn't stop. He goes after it, giving the other guards information about the van. He jumps from car to car and gets on top of the van. The guards are trying to seal the exit, but they are too late, as the van speeds up and gets through their blockade easily. Outside, the van swerves left and right to lose Ijin, and his grip slowly comes loose. But he thinks about what he discussed with the lieutenant. About family, with the lieutenant saying that family is the people that are precious to you. Ijin suddenly asks if people sacrifice their lives for family, and the lieutenant smiles, saying that if it came to that, he would do it. This gives Ijin the strength to persevere, and he holds the van firmly and tries to kick its windows in. This commotion causes the driver to not pay attention, and they get hit by a car, throwing Ijin away. He tries to get up, but the van is already on its way. He chases, with the woman inside giving him a cheeky wink, and thus, he loses the van. The team leader suddenly appears with Carr, asking where the kidnappers went. Ijin gets in the car, much to the leader's dismay. Ijin tells him where they went, and so, they begin chasing. The team leader says that he will drop Ijin home, as this is too much for a bodyguard like him. Ijin retorts this by saying that he's doing this of his own volition, so there's no need to worry. He also adds that there were two of Eastern ethnicity in the car, with no information about extra passengers. The team leader looks at him and sees that he's been bruised up pretty badly. He asks Ijin if he is okay, and he says that he's fine. The leader thinks about the situation. Ijin was the first one to move on the kidnappers, and considering that he rescued Yuna and his performance, there's no one more reliable than him right now. Somewhere else, Yuna gets the news that Chiya was kidnapped, and Team 2, where Ijin is, are in hot pursuit. They arrive at an abandoned place, and find the kidnappers dragging Jia away in a wheelchair. The team leader gets out of the car, but that's when plenty of men get out of the van, brandishing weapons. Ijin gets out of the car and urges the team captain to go ahead, as they don't have a choice. There's no time for reinforcements to arrive. The team leader says that this isn't training, it's the real deal. Ijin says that he prefers it that way. This causes the team leader to think about the discussion he had with the third team leader about Ijin and his abilities. Judging by their assessment, Ijin is a professional. The team leader starts running and entrusts these people to Ijin. One tries to get in front of the team leader, but Ijin comes from behind, knocking him away. Another tries to attack him, but he swiftly deals with this guy too and grabs his knife. He is now ready for a fight. A guy comes from behind the attacker who dropped the knife and mocks him for losing to a kid, also doing the same to Ijin, asking if he even knows how to use the knife. He turns his back and orders two people to stay behind to deal with Ijin. One urges them to hurry, as the other guy is probably inside right now. But suddenly, screaming is heard, and we see that Ijin has dealt with both of his attackers more quickly than the people there expected. They all charge him, but Ijin is too swift with the knife, and he incapacitates them all. With one last person remaining, Ijin closes the distance and slashes in his direction, forcing him to block with his knife. The attacker tries to slash him, but Ijin dodges and grabs his hand while slashing his upper body. With one last kick, he forces the attacker into a deadlock, and he puts the knife to his neck. But he doesn't kill him, instead choosing to knock him out. Inside, the woman says that the SW group's reaction was swift, so they need to move to the next area. But that's when the team leader comes from behind them, tired from all the running. 
Suddenly, an armed person comes from behind him, but he notices and dodges, giving him the opportunity to counterattack. Two people approach, brandishing knives. They charge him, but he isn't the team leader for nothing, as he deals with them in record time. Suddenly, the driver pulls out a gun, pointing it at Chia. He points the guy at the team leader, saying that if he moves, she dies. He shoots him in the shoulder and is surprised that he really didn't move an inch. The woman says to stop playing around as they don't have time for that. The team leader looks at Chiya one last time and apologizes. His life will end here. But that's when Ijin throws a knife in the driver's hand, who didn't get the chance to shoot. He bolts in and grabs Chiya, causing the driver to shoot after him, but only scratch his shoulder. The team leader rushes and tackles the driver, screaming for Ijin to run and not look back, and he does so. Somewhere else, Jia suddenly wakes up, and Ijin comes and puts his hand over her mouth, signaling that she should be silent. She wonders where she is, and Ijin says that her head will hurt from the sleeping drug. This causes her to remember what happened in the bathroom. She was kidnapped. Ijin confirms this, saying that reinforcements are on the way. Ijin thinks that this is a dead end, so they will be discovered soon. But the biggest problem is that the kidnappers have guns. Chiye wonders why she was kidnapped in the first place, as she doesn't have any connection to the recently acquired businesses. She suddenly spots Ijin's wounds, but he says he is fine. Chiye notes that he is not even a real bodyguard. He can't be just a normal high schooler. The woman urges them to come out, as she will have to kill Chiye if they drag this out. Chia gets up with the intention of revealing herself, thinking that she can't bring more harm to this child, he is still a student after all. But Ijin stops her, signaling to sit here silently. He gets out of cover with his hands up. The woman notes that he is just a kid, and asks him if he watches too many movies. This is not like those, he's not the main character here. She gets prepared to pull the trigger, but that's when Chia gets her attention, giving Ijin enough time to throw a knife in the woman's direction and he swiftly closes the gap, disarming her in the process. She gets out a knife, causing Ijin to retreat. She rushes at him and tries to slash him, but to no avail, as Ijin dodges until he gets the opportunity to disarm and kick her. She spots the gun and swiftly grabs it, pointing it at Ijin with a smile, but Ijin swiftly grabs it from her hands and redirects it, much to her surprise. She says that he is skilled, but wonders if he can pull the trigger, as shooting a person is different. But Ijin has no hesitation, and he shoots her in the foot. She notes his cold attitude, seeing that he is not phased at all by shooting a person. She suddenly sees that he resembles the legendary mercenary Jin, shouting his name at his discovery. This causes Ijin to hit her with the gun, knocking her out. Jia looks in awe at this spectacle. The team leader, who is still alive, tries his best to hold back the hordes of attackers that are here, but they just keep coming. The driver finally finds the gun that was thrown away and points it at the team leader, urging him to stop moving. The driver says that they underestimated him because he's only a bodyguard, but he is definitely skilled. If he was there when Hia was kidnapped, they would have had a hard time doing so. The team leader thinks that this is the end of his stalling, but still, one person managed to go after them, that woman. But he thinks about Ijin and smiles wondering why he suddenly feels so assured. The driver says that if he thinks it's okay only because the one who went after them was a woman, that would be a big mistake, as they all wouldn't be able to deal with her, even if they attacked at once. Plus, she's pretty mad now, so Ijin is probably in extreme pain by now. His words cause the team leader to clench his teeth. The driver prepares to shoot, but that's when someone shoots him, causing him to drop the gun. The shooter was Ijin, much to the driver's surprise who wonders what happened to Krasia, the woman. He doesn't get to finish thinking, however, as Ijin fires another bullet in him. He turns his attention to the team leader and aims in his direction, shooting with no hesitation and taking out all the attackers near him. The team leader notices his cold nature. Judging by this, he really must be a professional. The police swarm the place and put the kidnappers in handcuffs, ending the situation. Some approach Jiye with a medic and ask if she is fine. She hears Ijin talk to some policemen about the location of the woman, and Jiye says to treat him and the team leader first. He gets treated, and afterwards, Jiye comes up to him, asking if he is okay, and he confirms this. She wonders how he can be okay with such injuries, 
But Ijin says that there is nothing that is hindering him in any way, so it's fine. But he also has a favor to ask. He tells Chiya that she should tell his family that he's staying at a dorm, so they don't have to see him in this state. She agrees and walks away, but not without saying thanks first. The team leader comes up behind him, saying that he did well and that they will meet later. In an undisclosed location, someone gets the news that the kidnapping was a failure. The person says that it's fine. That wasn't important in the first place. It was about sending a message to SW. They will be weary of acquiring more business, and that's plenty. At a police station, Crisilla is getting interrogated, and she says that she didn't know that monster was working for them, the mercenary Eugene. If they had known he was here, they wouldn't have taken this job at all. The interrogator tries to play dumb, but she doesn't buy it, saying that she spotted him by his eyes, as they have been face to face before. He stopped taking requests six months ago, and was presumed dead or retired, but nobody would have expected him to work for SW. The interrogator says that he also heard rumors about that mercenary, but it wouldn't make sense for a top-class mercenary who worked in such dangerous places to do bodyguard work in a place like this. In an SW-owned hospital, Chia is resting, with the team leader guarding her diligently. She asks what he is doing here with that injury, and urges him to rest and get better. One person taking a break won't cause any problems. The team retorts this by saying that was exactly why she got kidnapped in the first place. He can't afford to do that anymore. He also says that the people they caught are all foreign, so they haven't gotten their backgrounds just yet. And they also can't figure out who the client was. They must have hit it well. Jia asks if it's a coincidence that Yuna and her got kidnapped so recently, and he says that it's unlikely it was. Jia adds that Yi Jin was even more impressive now, he really can't be just a normal high schooler. The team leader also says that when she saw him in action, he must have had several cracked ribs and broken fingernails, and he was also grazed by a bullet. Jia is surprised he was fighting in that condition, and the team leader also adds that he fought five armed people before she woke up too. She wonders if that's even possible, and she gets up and walks to Ijin's room. They arrive and see that he's getting ready to go home, as he hasn't been there in over two days. Jia urges him to stay longer, as he is seriously injured. He says that he will rest at home instead of being admitted to the hospital. Jia asks him who would allow such a ridiculous idea, and Ijin nonchalantly says that the doctor will, much to their shock. She asks what he's going to tell his family about the injuries, and Ijin makes up the excuse that he got hurt during training. She tells the team leader to step outside for a second, and she gets serious. Jia tells Ijin that he should come to her after graduation. Nothing good will come of working under Yuna. She is still a child. A child who just recently inherited her parents' wealth can't take hold of the future with her current abilities. But Jia says that she's different. She can take responsibility for his future. Ijin stares at her, finally saying that he has a question. She thinks it must be about how he will be treated, and she reassures him in that matter, saying that she will give him only the best. Ijin says that's not it, instead asking about what she said about him staying by Yuna's side. What did she mean? Jia sits there puzzled, asking if he isn't dating Yuna, and he confirms that he isn't. Jia thinks that Yuna has an unrequited crush, too bad for her. But she still urges him to do what she told him. Wouldn't his family be happy if he got a job after graduation after all? This causes Ijin's eyes to widen and he says he will think about it. He arrives home and his family is worried about his injuries. He says that it's nothing major, it just needs some light treatment. The grandpa asks him if he's interested in the bodyguarding work he is learning now, and Ijin says that he does have an interest. The grandpa says that even if he is interested now, he can always change when something else does. He is still young, and the grandpa will cheer him on, no matter what he decides to do. Ijin smiles and says, okay, at the camp. The boss gets the news that 032 ran away after he heard the news about 006 and 001. The boss bashes him, saying that he lost it over his brother's presumed death. That's why having family is useless. We see that 032 landed in Korea. A while later, Ijin sits in his bed and thinks about Crisilla's words, wondering where she knew him from. His phone suddenly rings, and the caller is Yuna. He goes to the convenience store and sees that she bought too many onigiri, her excuse being that she wanted some. She also urges Ijin to eat too, as he probably hasn't eaten yet either. She asks him about the injuries, and also says that she wanted to visit him. 
But when she got to the hospital, no one was allowed to visit, and they didn't even let her near his room. She bets Jia set that up. She was worried because he didn't come to school after being discharged. Ijin says that his grandpa told him to rest. Yuna also says that she heard he was a big part of rescuing Jia, but he retorts this, saying that the team leader did more. He immediately chased after them and informed the bodyguards and police right away, and even after catching up to them, he got shot and still kept the attention away from Jia and him so that they could safely leave. If he didn't do that, Ijin wouldn't have been able to do anything at all. Yuna is surprised at his explanation, and Sukju says that after listening to his words, that must be the case. But the team leader also wouldn't have been able to do much if Ijin wasn't there. The reports say so too. Ijin says that they are a team first and foremost. Protecting the VIP is what matters, not who had the biggest achievements. Sukju agrees, and Yuna wonders why they are so passionate all of a sudden. Ijin gets a text message from Ju, who invited him to the PC cafe. Yuna wonders how he is going to play games with his injured hands, but Ijin tells her that Ju said that his control was terrible before, so he should hurry and come play. Yuna doesn't know what to think about this. While walking home, Dayun thinks about what happened at school today, with a few classmates asking her what happened to Ijin since he didn't come to school for a few days. Dayun says that he hurt his hands while on vacation and that he's not seriously injured. The classmates are glad that he isn't that injured, especially not on the face. Her attention suddenly gets grabbed by some people who are cornering a man in an alleyway. She doesn't know what to do, and spots that one of the men is the guy who hit on her previously, Taisu's brother. She thinks that he didn't seem like that bad of a person, so maybe they can solve this amicably. She goes to them, and they all freeze when they spot her. They desperately explain the situation, saying it this guy who picked a fight first, as he asked them to buy him some food out of nowhere. Dayun asks if they can't just let it go, and they immediately fold and do so. She asks if he's okay, and he confirms he is, with his stomach suddenly growling. He apologizes and also asks if Dayun can't buy him some food. This person is none other than 032. They go to a nearby convenience store, and he devours some onigiri, leaving Dayun to think that he must have lost his wallet or something. He apologizes, saying that he was really hungry. He also says that he immediately lost his wallet after arriving in the country and starved for a few days. She says that he should have asked the embassy for help. He's surprised that he didn't think of this before. She looks at her phone and notes that it's getting pretty late. So she hands him some money and says that he should buy food with this if he gets hungry again. He is surprised at her kindness. While sleeping, Ijin thinks about his past, where he went into a room and saw somebody defend a girl. He gets the order to eliminate the target, but he is hesitant and puts the gun down. He suddenly wakes up in a panic, and he slowly calms himself down. He hears some rustling outside his door and goes to check. It was his family getting prepared for getting out with the grandpa asking him why he isn't sleeping yet, and Ijin says that he should be going to school too. But the grandpa urges him to rest a few more days, saying that he can always study, but he must take care of his body. Dayun signals to Ijin that he should agree, and he does so. They both get prepared to leave, with Dayun also going to school early. She also prepared him some breakfast, so he should eat it. After eating, he goes outside and gets a message from the group chat with Lee asking if he's coming to school today, as they need him to be a full team. Yuna says that they are a full team with her too, but Lee urges her to play with bots instead. This interaction causes him to smile. Suddenly, he spots 032 walking across the street and chases after him. He loses him in an alleyway, but tracks him to a construction site where he climbs up. He turns a corner, and 032 is waiting for him there, armed. Ijin notices and dodges out of the way, dashing to cover. 032 says that it's been a while, and that he was shocked that he was following him. He also says that he followed 006's trail, but didn't think he would find him so quickly. Ijin asks if the camp sent him, but it mustn't be so, as the camp wouldn't send him on a mission that 006 failed. 032 demands he shut up, as he is not the leader anymore. Ijin thinks that if the camp didn't, he must have come out of his own volition. 032 says that he doesn't want to resent him, since they both have circumstances. But 006 was family to him, taking care of him during those hellish days. Ijin suddenly throws something in his direction and tackles him. 
032 aims for Ejin's head, but he kicks the gun out of his hands. He pulls out a knife and tries to strike Ejin, who counterattacks. 032 notices that he is injured, so he hits him right where it hurts, in the ribs. He goes for the attack, and Ejin barely manages to block the attack. He asks 032 if he reported everything to the camp, who wonders why 001 is talking so much, but Ejin demands an answer. 032 gets mad, saying that he is not the leader anymore, he's just a target for elimination, slashing him while saying this. Ejin retreats and we see that he is bleeding. Will he get out of this alive? At school, Dayun is wondering if her brother is eating properly. The fight continues, with Ejin landing a swift blow, causing 032 to retreat. He asks him once again if the camp sent him. 032 is puzzled at his behavior and says that he is a traitor who betrayed them and killed 006, and he won't tell him a thing. He goes for a slash, but Ejin blocks it and punches him in the face. 032 tries to retaliate, but he misses, giving Ejin the opportunity to land a kick, making him retreat. But fortunately for him, he got thrown near the gun. Ejin notices and moves swiftly, and with seconds to react, he manages to grab the gun and pin 032 to the wall. Ejin asks if he chased them out of duty to the camp or out of revenge for 006. 032 sees an opportunity and hits him in the injury, causing Ejin to retreat while dodging bullets. 032 notes that he doesn't have many bullets left, and with a few shots, he retreats. Ejin tries to chase him, but his injuries fail him as he falls to the ground. At school, Sukju gets a call from him and immediately tells him that he needs the same favor as last time. Sukju gets out of the classroom and asks for the description and location of the person. Outside, 032 thinks that if 001 hadn't asked so many questions, he would have been dead many times over. Why would he keep asking things like that instead of eliminating an assassin who came to kill him? He clenches his fist. Suddenly, Taisu's brother and his goons spot him. 032 tries to ignore them, but gets stopped by two larger dudes blocking his escape. He leaves the mall on the ground. After walking for a while, he spots Dayun and gives her some money, saying that it's for last time and he will return the rest later, as this is all he has now. Dayun asks if he has any money except this, and he says that's fine. She bows and tries to leave, but his stomach suddenly growls. They go to the convenience store, and Dayun says that he should give her all his money if he doesn't have any. She wasn't expecting to be paid back anyway. 032 says that he has to pay her back. What kind of person doesn't repay a favor? She asks him about his age, and he says he's 17. Dayun notes they are the same age, so they should speak casually from now on. She asks him about his travels, and he says that he traveled here by himself. She's surprised, and also asks him how many countries he's been to. 032 says he's lost count, so probably around 20. Near them, Ejin arrives and sees that 032 is sitting with Dayun his expression turning dark at the sight. He watches them from cover and wonders if Dayun has already been compromised. They talk about various things, like his job and school, but suddenly, Ejin sprints and tackles him. He picks up a chopstick and breaks it, pointing it at 032, who barely managed to block the attack. Ejin tries to punch him, but 032 dodges, making him able to hit Ejin. 032 thinks that the girl will get involved, so he has to go to another location to finish their business. But suddenly, Dayun calls him Appa and asks him why he's doing this. Ejin tells her to get away. She tries to say something but stops when she sees his cold glare. She also spots his injury, which is bleeding profusely now. 032 asks how they know each other, and Dayun says that he is her older brother and also apologizes, saying that there must be some kind of misunderstanding as he isn't like this usually. 032 just smirks at the thought. Ejin asks her to leave for a moment and she looks at him and reluctantly agrees. 032 interrogates him, asking why that girl thinks that he is her brother. Ejin says that he will answer if 032 answers his question first. Has he given information to the camp up until now? And is the reason he's here because of duty or revenge? 032 wonders why he keeps asking the same questions. Is it that important? But Ejin just stares in silence. 032 reluctantly responds, saying that he came here discreetly once the news that he killed 006 got out, not because of duty for the camp. He wants revenge for 006, as he knows for sure that he is the only real family he has. Ejin remarks that they didn't even get along, 
but 032 says that he didn't think that he would act like this because of the news, as they didn't spend time outside of missions and training. He doesn't know if this can be called revenge, as he came here without thinking. Ijin looks at him and says that 006 isn't dead. He faked his death and hid so as not to be discovered by the camp. 032 is surprised, and Ijin confirms that he kept asking him the same questions because he needed to make sure he wasn't loyal to the camp, as if he knew 006 was alive, he would have told the camp in a heartbeat. 032 sits down and asks why he is in this country. Ijin says that he just came back home. 032 asks him if Dayun is his real sister, wondering how he would know, as he lost his memories of the family. Ijin says that they came back recently. 032 wonders if this is the reason he betrayed the camp, but he denies this, saying that it was because he couldn't follow the camp's orders anymore. Ijin suddenly changes the subject, asking how he knows Dayun. He demands an answer. It seems that 032 must answer quickly. 032 notes that Ijin has grown a murderous aura all of a sudden, and says that she helped him recently, that's all. Ijin sits silently for a second and begins to clean up the place, with 032 doing the same. He suddenly asks if 006 is okay, but with how badly he got injured, Ijin wonders if he can say that. 032 says it's enough as long he is alive. He tried to kill Ijin after all. Ijin asks how he believed him so easily, he betrayed the camp, after all. 032 says that he never lied to them before, and he betrayed the camp, not them. That's what 006 said, the 001 who went through hellish training and took care of them, betrayed only the camp. Ijin notes that it was strange, because on the day the camp moved to eliminate him, 006 and a few others deliberately didn't move on him. If they had, he wouldn't be alive right now. 032 asks if there's any way to contact 006, and Ijin says that there is none if he doesn't contact them first. He also adds that he will ask 006 to contact him when he calls, but 032 says that is fine, it's good enough to hear that he is still alive. They may be family, but they almost never talked outside of missions, that must be why 006 didn't even let him know he was alive. Ijin says that 006 did what he did for him. If he got too close to him because they are family, the camp would have taken advantage, so he kept his distance. If they ever find out that he is alive, he doesn't want it to seem like there was contact between them. He also adds that during the mission, he was willing to die over running away because he was afraid 032 might be in danger. He looks down, holding back tears. 032 tells him that the camp is keeping the fact that Ijin is alive a secret. No one knows except a few top-ranking officials, so that's why they aren't making any big moves. Ijin asks how he found out, and he says it's because of 006. With that, he says he will be returning to camp, but not before going around a few places to leave traces. They suddenly spot Dayun, who is looking at them from a distance. Ijin smiles, 032 surprised that he can make a face like that. He asks if he can say goodbye really quickly, which causes Ijin to change his expression. 032 says that he must, as it will be weird if he suddenly leaves, as he got help from her. They say their goodbyes, and Dayun asks why he suddenly tackled him. Ijin tries to come up with an excuse, and thinks about the conversation he had with his group, about Dayun being popular and pretty. So he says that he thought some weird guy was hitting on her because she's pretty. Dayun doesn't know what to say. At home, after bandaging his wounds, Ijin wonders why the camp is keeping the fact that he is alive a secret. What are they planning? 032 arrives at his place, but suddenly pulls out a gun, aiming it at a corner. Aiden, one of the camp members, comes out of hiding, urging 032 to put the gun down. He asks what he is doing in a place like this. Did he find the traitor? 032 says that it isn't that easy, and also asks what he is doing here. That's when Aiden pulls out a knife and stabs 032, saying that he is here to kill him since he ignored the camp's orders. 032 asks if the camp ordered this and Aiden says that he had to eliminate him if he refused the order to return. But his reasoning is different. He pulls the knife out of 032 and slashes his leg, causing him to be thrown into a corner. Aiden notes his good reaction, and 032 asks why he doing this. He explains that he always wanted to eliminate him, but 006 was a pain to deal with, so this is the perfect opportunity. 032 mocks him, saying that he was just scared of 006 also too scared for a direct confrontation. Thus, he ambushed him. Aiden gets mad and lunges at him, 
giving 032 the opportunity to get his knife out and slash him. Aiden, having had enough odd his, hits him and punts him into a corner, causing his cap to fall off. He picks up the gun and says that he and all the numbered people are all the same. They get special treatment just because the camp took care in raising them, even though none of them deserve it, as they don't know their place and act out like he did. 032 mocks him by saying he should improve his skills if he wants special treatment. Aiden shoots him in the leg, saying that there's no point in trying to annoy him, as he will die here. That's when 032 throws the knife in his direction, giving him the opportunity to get out of the room, leaving a trail of blood behind. Aiden urges him to come out, as he can't run with a body like that anyway. He turns the corner, and that's when someone grabs his arm and throws him against the wall. He takes the clip out of the gun and punches him, causing Aiden to retaliate, but he misses. He looks at the attacker, who is none other than Ejin. Aiden comes to the conclusion that this must be 001, but he doesn't get to finish thinking, as Ejin rushes him, landing a blow. They go back and forth, but with Ejin's skills, it only takes a few moments for him to knock Aiden out cold. 032 asks what he is doing here, and Ejin goes to grab a bag full of food, saying that his sister told him he doesn't have any money. 032 laughs, and wonders when he changed so much. Did he injure his head or something? Or perhaps, if his memories came back, this is how he originally was. The next day at the SW building, Ejin sits with the owner, who says that the man he turned over to them was an internationally wanted man so he won't be difficult to take care of since a lot of countries want him, and he will be locked up somewhere separate from the world. The owner asks him if he's related to his past, and Ejin answers that he is, but not directly. They exchange farewells, and Ijin leaves. The owner's guard says that he was surprised when Ijin contacted them for help. He didn't expect him to turn a criminal in all of a sudden. There were also traces of gunfire at the scene. While leaving, Ijin thinks about what happened, with him wanting to call someone so he can get treatment. 032 says that it's fine. He will do the patching up himself. Ijin urges him to get treatment, but he refuses, saying that it will take time, and the camp will get suspicious. Ejin is surprised that he is going back to camp, asking if they aren't going after him as well. 032 says that Aiden came after him mostly for a personal grudge, so he plans on playing dumb and asking the camp why he was a target of elimination. Ejin says that it's too dangerous, but 032 says that the camp thinks 006 is dead, so it doesn't make sense for them to eliminate him just because he came out on his own to find 001. And considering Aiden's words, it's a safe gamble. But he also doesn't have a choice, as if he hides, they will come for him. 006 could be exposed if that happens. He adds that if his plans succeed, he will make it harder for them to find Ejin to repay the debt for saving his life. He suddenly looks at Ejin and says that he would like for him to protect this life, his real life. His thinking gets interrupted by Jiye, who asks what he's doing here. He says that he had some business to attend to here. She asks him about his injuries, and thinking about all that happened, he can't say that they got worse, so he lies, saying that they are much better. Chia asks if he wants to eat dinner with her. Ejin refuses, saying that he has to go straight home, as he has dinner plans with his family. She is shocked that he turned her down again, and says that it's important to spend time with family, and now that she thinks about it, she doesn't have the time to eat either. Tia also asks if he is interested in a part-time job, he will be compensated properly for it. But Ejin refuses, causing her to wonder if this is just some kind of act he is pulling. But she thinks it can't be so and offers him a car ride home. But to no surprise, he refuses. The team leader says that he should recover fast, as the guys from the team keep asking when he is coming back. While Ejin is leaving, the team leader asks if she wasn't going to request that Ejin be Chaseoha's bodyguard. Jiye says that she wanted to, as there was an incident with a stalker recently, and he would just have to stand next to her. While near his house, Ejin spots his grandpa, who says that he was taking in some fresh air. He also says that it's going to be Dayun's birthday in a few days, but he doesn't know what to get her, and asks Ejin if he knows what she likes. They both stare at each other, lost for words. While in her office, Jie gets a call from Ejin, and asks what it's about. He asks if what she offered is still available. She thinks it must be about having dinner, and says that she's pretty busy. But she gets embarrassed when Ijin tells her it's about the part-time job, not that. 
She says that if he wants it, he should come to a studio by 4 p.m. tomorrow. At the PC cafe, Ju asks Lee why he isn't preparing for the game. He apologizes, saying he was reading an article about Cha Seoha, who is apparently going to be the lead actress for a webtoon drama coming out soon. Ju adds that he saw her in person the other day and that she was super pretty. His cousin works at an advertising company, and they let him work there once, and that's where she was filming a commercial. Lee is amazed at this, saying that he has been a fan of Seoha since her debut eight years ago. Yung Chan asks how she was in real life, and Ju looks up and says that she looks even better. He has never seen somebody that beautiful before. The boys stare in jealousy, and that's when Lee asks if his cousin doesn't need more workers. In her waiting room, Seoha gets the news that another bodyguard is coming. She wonders why, as they already have another from the company, so why another? Her assistant says that he was sent by SW. He tried to refuse, but they insisted, saying that it was for her own safety after what happened recently. The other guard speaks, saying that the SW bodyguard is still in training. In the studio, everyone looks at someone. Back to the waiting room. The bodyguard says that they most likely sent him there for experience, so he will be sure to keep this trainee in line. The assistant apologizes for this, saying that they are putting more work on him. The bodyguard says that there is no need for an apology. The fault falls on SW for sending a trainee here. He tries to say something else, but that's when a knock comes from the door. He opens it, and we see that Ejin has arrived, saying that he is the guard from SW. The assistant is surprised, thinking at first that he is a celebrity or model. The bodyguard looks at him in rage, thinking that this kid is just playing around. This isn't a game. Ejin enters and goes straight for Seoha, who notices how handsome he is. Ejin introduces himself, saying that he will be her bodyguard from now on. They exchange greetings, and Ejin takes no time in assessing the room. Seoha wonders if this is someone SW was planning to debut, and if they sent him here to get some attention. Ejin asks if filming started four hours ago, and if this room is being used as a waiting room. The assistant confirms this. Ejin also asks about the stalking. Seoha says that it's been happening for a long time. She doesn't know that the stalker found her address, but even since then, he's been leaving weird letters in her mailbox. She also adds that this is a common occurrence in this occupation, so there's no need for SW to get involved. She also asks Ejin about his age, but he remembers what the team leader said to him, not to reveal this, as they will look down on him. He says that it's a secret, and that's when the bodyguard says he wants a word with him outside. They do so, and he asks if Ejin is still in training. He confirms this, and the bodyguard scoffs, saying that he should stand there and watch, as he will take care of everything. He doesn't know why they sent a kid like him, but this is no game, and there's a big difference between training and the real deal. Ejin asks if he is Kim Chil Young from the affiliate bodyguarding group, but that's when he grabs Ejin by his clothes and warns him. If he doesn't want to get beaten up, he better listen to what he has to say. He lets go while throwing him at the wall, with Ejin holding his wound, which has probably not healed fully yet. Seoha suddenly approaches, asking if he is okay, as she came outside just in case something happened. She apologizes for Chil Young's behavior, saying he is on the rougher side. She also denied having a bodyguard before, but the agency insisted. She approaches and asks if he is a student, but Ejin says that it's a secret. Her assistant comes from behind and says that filming will start soon. She turns to Ejin and says that nothing will happen here, so he should just relax. In the SW building, Chia wonders how Ejin is doing, and the team leader says that he received word that Ejin immediately reported for work at the studio during filming. Chia thinks that nothing will happen, with the team leader saying that stalking is a common occurrence, especially with Seoha. Also, there's another bodyguard from the agency, so Ejin shouldn't have that much work. Jia confirms this, saying that she introduced him to an easy job since he's injured. But perhaps he will complain, because it's boring. The team leader says that he's not the type to complain about work. It's going to be a cakewalk for someone like him. While the shoot is in session, Ejin comes next to the bodyguard. Who asks why he wasn't here this whole time? Ejin says that he was surveying the area, which gets the bodyguard mad. But he doesn't get to say anything, as the shoot has finished. Suddenly, Ejin says that nobody's going outside. The police will be here soon, and everyone needs to be investigated. Seoha asks why, and Ejin shows her a camera. He found it in the waiting room. Ejin explains that he checked the CCTV already, 
but the waiting room doesn't have any at the entrance, so he couldn't check who installed it. The bodyguard asks why he didn't tell them sooner, but Ijin explains that Seoha didn't have to use that room again, and he thought this would interfere with her work, so he waited. Plus, no one left the building. The bodyguard is furious, thinking that Ijin is trying to mess with him. He tries to take the camera from him, but Ijin smacks his hand away, and they exchange glares. Ijin says that the assistant should have this, with the guard persuading him to hand it to him. The assistant agrees, and the bodyguard snatches the camera and asks to see Ijin outside again. They do so, and he asks Ijin why he didn't tell him first. He asks why he should have, also saying that he already asked him if the room was clear, and he confirmed this. Chil Yong gets mad, asking if he hasn't learned to report to his superiors first. Ijin says that he is not his superior, and this causes the guard to snap, and he tries to slap Ijin, but he blocks it, and says that this won't benefit either of them. Chil Young reluctantly pulls his hand away, saying that if it weren't for SW, he would have already beaten Ijin to a pulp. With those words, he leaves. While going home, Sioha asks about the situation, and the assistant says that the police will investigate it, so they will figure it out. Seoha adds that it looked like they were overreacting in front of a camera. The guard assures her that they will investigate separately, so she shouldn't worry. They arrive at her house, and the assistant offers Ijin a drive to the nearest station, but he refuses. They go, and Ijin begins investigating the area. Suddenly, Seoha gets out, wearing a disguise. Someone gets behind her, and she notices. But it's just Ijin. She asks why he hasn't left, and he says that he was just investigating the area. She tells him that he can go home now, as she will go to the convenience store. Ijin says that she can do whatever she wishes, that's why he's here. She looks at him for a second and seems happy at his words. They arrive there and she begins eating, urging him to do so as well. Seoha also says that she usually takes this home, but now she can relax because he is here. She doesn't usually do this, but when she gets really stressed, she likes to walk around the house without worrying about anything else. Seoha had been in this industry since she was little, so she couldn't walk around anywhere. There was also a lot of work, so she doesn't have any friends. She asks Ijin what he does for fun, and he says that he usually goes to the PC cafe with his friends after school. Seoha notes that it feels like she is speaking to a high schooler. It seems that Ijin shouldn't have said that. The boys are all shocked at the sight of her arriving, with Ijin in tow. After playing, they all chilled with Lee saying that he didn't expect to play games with her. She didn't either, as she usually plays games at home, not at a PC cafe. Ju and Lee compliment her personality and looks, and she says thanks, but they also berate her for her poor performance at the game. Young Chan says that it is true. She is bad at the game. Lee and Ju agree, saying that she and Ijin were both bad, so it was tiring. Lee says that she shouldn't let other people know that she plays games unless she wants to get yelled at. Seoha bursts out laughing. They exchange farewells, and Ijin escorts her back home, leaving the boys to admire what just happened. They all leave happily, with Seoha's autographs on their shirts. While driving, Seoha notes that she was a bit shocked to find out the bodyguard SW sent was a high schooler. But she had fun thanks to him. This was the first time she could play in a PC cafe comfortably as she only plays at home. Ijin asks if she can't play with her friends online, but she says that she has been training since middle school, and after debuting, work got her too busy. So she doesn't have any friends. Seoha asks Ijin why he is bodyguarding in the first place, and he says that he is doing this so that he can buy a birthday present for his sister. Seoha is surprised at his dedication, saying he must be a good brother. She also offers to take him home, but he refuses, saying that he must return Miss Chaseoha home. Seoha looks at him and says that he should call her Nuna from now on, as what he just said is too formal. Ijin just stares. They arrive, and a person dressed in a suit looks at them from across the street. He approaches, and Seoha says that she is someone she knows, so it's fine. The person says that the director is looking for her. She approaches the car where the director is, and Ijin tries to follow, but the guy stops him, saying that he should stay out of this. Seoha turns around and says that he should go home, as she will take care of something and go inside the house shortly after. Ijin says that he will just wait here, and she insists, thinking that he shouldn't get involved in this. Seoha gets inside, and the director asks why she didn't pick up the phone, as he had previously called her. 
She asks why she should even pick up, causing him to say that she shouldn't get ahead of herself, as it is annoying him. How long is she going to act so distant just because he hung out with some celebrities at work? She must have known he was like this. She tells him that he can do whatever, as they broke up a long time ago so she doesn't care. She demands he never call again and not visit her anymore. She wants to leave, but the director stops her, saying that she doesn't know her place. He warns her, saying that she will bury her career and destroy her parents' jobs. Suddenly, the window on his side breaks, and he gets dragged and thrown out by Ijin. He gently opens the door and says that she can come out now. She gets out, and the director gets up and demands to know who he is. Ijin tells him that he's just a bodyguard. The director also spots the person he was with, manager Kim, sitting on the ground, probably knocked out by Ijin. He gets in the car and says he will see Seoha later. With that, he leaves. Seoha is shocked and asks why he did that. Does he have any idea who that man is? Ijin says that he just did his job and that they should get moving. She stares at him one last time and sighs, thanking him for the help. The next day, Ijin gets chewed out by the guard, who says that he messed with the wrong person, as that is part of the KP group, the director of the marketing department. Plus, KP recently invested in Seoha's agency. And because of his actions, they are now in a tight spot. With one final warning, he walks away, leaving Ijin to glare at him. Inside a room, the representative asks Seoha to apologize for what happened yesterday. She says that the director should be the one to apologize, not her. The representative gets a bit furious and asks what's with her attire, also apologizing to the director, who was next to him. He suddenly slams a contract on the table, saying that Seoha hasn't put her stamp on it yet, so that's why he was calling. The representative urges her to do so, as the conditions are much better than the first contract. Seoha wonders if it is going to happen again and if she is going to be forced to sign without regard to her own feelings. The director also demands that she cut off the bodyguard she was with yesterday, as he is too violent. The representative agrees, saying that he heard a lot of bad stuff about him from Chiel Young. Seoha defends Ijin, saying he did nothing wrong. The director notes that she used his name and gets extremely jealous, asking if she was treating him coldly yesterday because of that guy. Seoha says that he is just a bodyguard, and she was cold because he visited after they broke up. The director says that she wouldn't mind if Ijin wasn't able to bodyguard ever again, right? He says that he is too violent for this kind of job. Seoha thinks about Ijin and says he doesn't have to go that far, as he is unrelated to the business at hand. The director says that he is still a dangerous person, so he won't stop after what Ijin did to him. He demands Seoha sign the contract and also tells someone to bring Ijin here. Seoha just watches. She can't breathe and wants to get out here now. Ijin arrives and the representative says that he can stop bodyguarding, as he will inform the SW group, so he can go. The director also warns him, saying that his life will become more troublesome from now on. Ijin looks at Seoha and sees that she is clenching her fists powerlessly, so he says that they should go, as she will miss her appointment if they don't. Seoha stares at him. The director begins laughing, saying that he can take her if he can. That's when Cheol Young and a few others swarm the place saying that they will take care of Ijin. Seoha sees this and tries to save him, saying that he is no longer her bodyguard, as she is firing him, so he should go home already. Ijin just stares. One of the guys grabs Ijin's shoulder, and that's when he punches him in the face, causing him to bleed profusely. They all look at him in shock. Ijin says that there's been a mistake. Seoha is not his employer. The director glares at him and says that he doesn't understand the situation. But Ijin says that he does. The director created a stalker, just as Seoha was about to recontract, and then used a bodyguard to keep an eye on her. He explains that due to improper management, Barium Entertainment had low funds until it received help from KP. If Seoha, who's the main celebrity here, does not sign, both companies will have to suffer. He also knows that Seoha doesn't want to sign the contract again, so she's been receiving threats. She wonders how he knows that. And we see that when she was playing at the PC cafe with his friends, Ijin was always busy on the phone, probably getting this information. The director gets furious and asks what a kid will do. What the hell can a child like him even do in this situation? Ijin asks Seoha what she would like to do. She clenches her fists and says that she wants to get out of here, with a single tear rolling down her cheek. The director tries to approach her, but Ijin kicks him to the ground, 
Much to the shock of everyone else there, Chil Young tries to attack, but gets smacked, causing him to lose his glasses. Another comes from the front, but Lee Jin makes short work of him. It seems that Chil Young hasn't had enough, however, as he rises from the ground, madder than ever before. But he doesn't get to do anything, as Lee Jin swiftly turns around and, with two powerful strikes, knocks him out. Seoha screams for him to watch out, and Lee Jin barely manages to dodge Manager Kim, who is now wielding a baton. Ejin continues to dodge until he finds the opportunity to disarm him. And with that out of the way, he ends the fight. The director laughs maniacally and says that he will ruin both of their lives. He tries to say something else, but that's when Chi Ye walks in, saying that she sent him on an easy job purposefully, but look what happened. Seoha notices Chi Ye's presence, thinking about her many achievements to be in charge of both the entertainment and any new business for SW truly amazing. She tells Ejin that he should go, as she will take care of business here. He does so, with Seoha following him. Chia sits down, and says that they seem to be having some business with her younger sister, most likely referring to Seoha. She tells them they should continue the conversation. It seems that these guys are doomed. While walking away, Seoha looks at Ejin, and wonders who he really is. He asks her where she was next scheduled, causing her to laugh. It seems that this situation has been solved. The next day, Seoha sleeps for 10 hours, a rarity for her, as she can only sleep for around 3 hours max. She wonders if it's because all of her issues have been resolved, and we see that she talked with Jia, who says that the legal problems with her agency have been resolved, and she can take her own path now. Seoha says that she has another problem, but Jia reassures her, saying that Director Kidongun is no longer a threat as they found out that he was threatening her parents and was an improper businessman all around. Even on the KP side, they put all the blame on him. Seoha wonders why she is helping so much, and Chiya says that their subsidiary has an interest in her, but it's mostly because he told her that this must be solved in order for him to complete his bodyguarding mission. Seoha smiles and gets up with a pep in her step. She gets out expecting Ijin, but instead finds another bodyguard from the SW group as Ijin quit the job, and she is pretty sad at this news. She arrives at the interview, but she can only think about Ijin. Why did he quit? Shouldn't he have at least told her something about it? Somewhere else, Chie tells him that they formed a contract for Seoha with a SW subsidiary, and also that they did all the necessary actions to keep her safe from the previous agency and the director. She adds that they both did some illegal stuff, and they have evidence of this so they are basically at their mercy now. Ijin thanks them for the help. Jia says that there's no need for that, as he was the one who said they needed to take responsibility until the end. She also heard that he called the team leader and asked him to do various things early in the morning, and he complained about it. The team leader coughs, saying it wasn't that much. With a final farewell, Ijin gets out, leaving them to ponder about the situation. While leaving, Ijin gets a text from Dayun, asking if he was a bodyguard for Seoha. He confirms this, and she says that she's a big fan. She would have asked him to get an autograph from her if she knew. Suddenly, he meets with Seoha, who remarks this as a coincidence. But the guard thinks that she's been here this whole time since she heard he was here. Seoha wants to talk to him, and they both go outside, and she thanks him for everything. But she also asks why he quit, and he says that he overextended himself, and that his injuries, which he got from another job, started hurting again. So he felt like he wasn't capable of protecting her. She asks if he is seriously injured, and he says that he broke just one rib, so it's fine. She demands to have his phone, and he gives it. Sioha types in her number, saying that only her parents have her personal number, so he should be honored. She also asks if there's anything he wanted, as she wants to do something for him, for all the help. Ijin looks at her, thinking about what he should ask for. At school, Dayun wonders what she will make for dinner, but suddenly... A bouquet of flowers appears in front of her, with Seoha carrying it. She wonders what such a celebrity is doing here, and that's when she wishes happy birthday to Dayun, much to her surprise. Dayun wonders how she even knows about her birthday. Seoha pulls her close for a selfie, also saying that they should eat together later. Everyone in the class is left shocked. Seoha's arrival gets to the group's ears, and they happily rush to her location. Ijin notes that he only asked for an autograph. But it seems that she had something else in mind. Ijin rushes to get home with the gift in hand, and it seems that he made it, 
as his grandpa is waiting outside with the cake. They go in and Dayun blows out the candles, with them wishing her a happy birthday. The grandpa gives her his present first, a brand new phone, saying that he promised to buy her a new one. Ijin also pulls out his gift, a brand new laptop. They both wonder where he had the money for this, and he says that he worked part-time. Dayun notes that this is the most recent model, and Ijin says that she shouldn't worry about it, as it's been troublesome for her because she didn't have a computer in her room, right? Dayun thanks him, saying she will use it well. While she is enjoying her gifts, Ijin gets a call from Seoha, and he goes into the other room to answer. She asks how the party is going, and he says it's going well, also thanking her for what she did. She asks if he is busy tomorrow, and this says that he is going to do some bodyguard training. She wonders if he will be okay with those injuries, and he says that it's fine, as he will only train lightly. Seoha asks if he is free the next day, but Ijin tells her that he plans on participating in training then as well. Seoha gets a bit mad at his ignorance, as she probably wanted to invite him out. She gets a knock on the door and says she has to go, and with that, the call ends. But suddenly, someone else calls, an unknown caller. This must be 006. Ijin answers, and 006 asks if they can meet. Ijin arrives at the meeting point and they begin talking, with 006 asking if 032 came to eliminate him. Ijin says that he did, but after failing, he returned to camp. 006 puts his hand on his head and says that 032 did not show up at the camp. Ijin says that he must have so the camp doesn't get suspicious. 006 says that, from what he gathered, 032 hasn't returned to camp after running away. Ijin adds that he was attacked by a camp mercenary after they parted ways. 006 knows, but the guy that attacked was ordered to just bring him back, but instead decided to attack. He adds that there have always been other mercenaries at the camp, other than the numbered ones, and they always saw the numbered people as a thorn in their side, with this getting much worse since Ijin left. Plus, they started recruiting even more new mercenaries, causing a lot of friction. Ijin asks if he thinks they took 032, and 006 thinks that they did. In an undisclosed location, we see that this is indeed the case, with a man saying that he should stop resisting, demanding to know why he ran away from camp, and where Aiden is. 032 mocks him, saying that they are not a couple. So why should he answer? This enrages the guy, and he smacks 032. He says that he should stop talking without thinking, if he doesn't want to die, that is. 032 says that this conversation can't happen. Does he look like he is scared of dying? While at home, Ijin thinks about what happened, with 006 saying that he will go and find 032, even at the cost of them finding out about him. He has to keep 032 alive. He is the only family he has. Ijin looks at his own and slowly closes the door. He calls 006 and says that he will come too. The next day, Yuna arrives at school, with Lee asking is he enjoyed her vacation. She says that it wasn't a vacation, it was for work. She also asks where Ijin is, with Young Chan saying that he is busy, as he hasn't been here since yesterday. In an undisclosed location, Ijin and 006 sprint around, with 006 saying that one of the bases that they are using is within 10 kilometers of here. If those people took 032, judging from where he was taken, this is most likely the place where they are keeping him. He also asks Ijin why he wanted to come with him, and he says that he thought of 032 as a comrade, that's all. 006 stares for a second and says that he changed a lot. He would have never expected the fabled 001 to say something like this. At the location, the goons there talk to each other, saying that they still can't get in contact with Aiden. Something must have happened to him for sure. They look at 032 and wonder how they trained a kid like this to keep his mouth shut. One says to take care of him, and another points a gun at his head, ready to pull the trigger. But he doesn't get to, as he suddenly gets shot. The shooter is a man with a tattoo and a bun. They appear to know who he is, but they don't get to say as he opens fire, taking most of them out. The last one tries to get him with an assault rifle, but the guy is swift and ends his life with a knife. Ijin and 006 arrive at the location and see the bloodbath that guy left behind, wondering who did such a thing. Ijin notes that their vital points were stabbed with pinpoint accuracy, and it hasn't been long since this happened. They put their masks up and begin advancing. Ijin makes his way deeper and finds 032, barely breathing. 
Ijin notes the strangeness of the captor's wounds, with the enemies up front dead from shooting and the furthest ones from stabbing. Ijin remembers this method. We see into Ijin's past, where he asks 004 why he doesn't kill them more efficiently, as he is just wasting time with the knife. 004 turns around and says that there's just no thrill if he plays it safe. Suddenly, a rain of bullets falls on Ijin, and his suspicion gets confirmed. It's 004. They exchange fire, going from cover to cover. Ijin suddenly takes him by surprise and grazes one of his fingers with a bullet, causing him to drop the gun. 004 dodges the rest of the bullets swiftly, throwing a knife when he gets the opportunity. Ijin is forced to dodge, giving 004 the chance to close the distance. Ijin barely manages to block with his pistol. 004 throws it from his hands, giving Ijin the opportunity to kick him. 004 notes that he is pretty good at fighting. Will Ijin win this battle? 004 says that he should have run away when he got the chance. Ijin notes that he probably thinks he is one of the mercenaries from here. 004 closes the gap instantly and tries to slash Ijin. One attack, two, but Ijin keeps dodging until he finds the opportunity to strike back, enraging 004 a bit. They continue their scuffle, with Ijin outmaneuvering 004 wherever he can. He throws him across the room, where 004 spots an assault rifle and skillfully shoots after Ijin with just one hand. He dodges and swiftly grabs a pistol, and they reach a stalemate. 004 says that he must not be a part of the mercenaries, as he is too skilled to be with these weaklings. 004 seems to have figured out who he is, but that's when he gets shot in the arm by a mysterious attacker from outside, probably 006. Ijin and him both try to shoot 004, but he is swift and jumps out of a window, finding a car and using that to get away. 006 wonders what 004 might be doing here. He killed the mercenaries, so he is not with them, at least. Ijin notes that 032's condition isn't great, and they move him out of there with a car. 006 sees this and wonders what to do. Ijin says that he can come back with him, as he can ensure a place where he can get help. 006 notes that 032 might not survive the boat ride. He won't be able to move him until he is treated. Ijin tries to say something, but 006 refuses outright, saying he has done enough already. Ijin has his own life, and 006 is thankful enough that he even came to help. He offers a handshake, saying they should split up here. Ijin looks at him, and with an understanding between them, they shake hands. In an undisclosed location, 004 is treating his wounds. He thinks about the enemy he fought, those movements, and his skill and presence. It was definitely 001. Ijin arrives home the same night, with Dayun coming to greet him as she had things to study, so she's not asleep yet. She adds that the grandpa also stayed up, but went to sleep a little while ago. She asks if he took care of the business he had, and he confirms this. Dayun also points out that he has a sandwich on the table if he is hungry. Afterwards, he sits in bed, trying to fall asleep but his phone suddenly rings. It's a message from Seoha asking if he is asleep, and he says that he's not. She calls him, saying that it's easier to speak this way, as she would make too many typos. She asks if he is free tomorrow, as she needs to talk with him. She will even come to his training if he has any. Ijin agrees. The next day, Ijin gets out of his house, with Seoha waiting for him in the car. He gets in the car, and she asks why he isn't at training today. Was he lying? Ijin says that he decided to rest a few more days. She gives him a drink, saying that she would have taken him somewhere nice, but people would recognize her. Seoha says that she called because she needed his consultation and perhaps a favor. It's about her little brother, who is still in high school. According to her parents, he's been getting more and more injured, and if they ask, he makes excuses. And if they insist, he locks himself in his room or leaves the house. At first, She thought it was just a phase, but now she doesn't know. Ijin asks if she tried to ask directly, but she says that he doesn't come out of his room and doesn't answer her calls when she has time to visit. They used to be really close before her work started, and they slowly grew apart, but he started avoiding her completely a year ago. She asks Ijin if he can go check things out, as he is the only one she can ask for this. Ijin looks at her. The same day, Ijin goes to the school her brother is attending, dressed appropriately. He has a picture of her brother, Cha Jin Wu, a second year. He suddenly spots him. 
but that's when two girls stop him, asking if he can take his mask off just for a bit. They wait patiently for his answer, but Ijin says that he has a cold and leaves. Jinwoo gets inside the classroom, where it appears that he's being bullied, as a guy asks why he is late. A butler should always be on time. Jinwoo looks at them with defeated eyes and says that he was late because he wasn't feeling well. The bully glares back, asking if he is trying to be cheeky. The other bully finishes watching a video, finding it very informative. He gets up and demands that Jinwoo hold his bag in front of him. He does so, and the guy kicks him with full strength, causing him to be thrown to the side. The bully notes that it doesn't feel that good and demands he pick himself up again, as he will try a punch next. Jinwoo stares at the floor, his eyes empty. The other people in the bully group say that they are hungry, so they order him to buy them something. Jinwoo gets up and does so, and it seems that Ijin saw this whole spectacle. He wonders what to do. Should he get involved? That's when his phone rings. It's his sister, who thanks him once again for the computer he gifted her. Ijin looks at Jinwoo one more time and, with one glance, follows him. He must help. While picking up food from the bullies, he thinks about his hatred for school. He gets a message from Seoha, saying that she will be free this Saturday, and they should go somewhere. He looks at the message, and thinks of what happened in the past. We see that in middle school, he heard a few of his classmates talking about his sister's acting, saying that it was terrible, and that she ruined the show. After hearing this, he went straight for her neck, bashing her for her poor performance and saying it was embarrassing for him too. It seems that he regrets this deeply, thinking he deserves much worse than this. Eugene looks at him from outside of the store, and his sister messages him again asking why he isn't in school. He says that he had some business elsewhere, apologizing for not telling her. Jinwoo gets out of the store and spots Ijin, noting how much he stands out. While looking at him, he trips and gets embarrassed. Ijin helps him by giving him an onigiri, but his stomach suddenly growls, and Jinwoo asks if he wants one. They sit down and enjoy some food, with Jinwoo noting how handsome Ijin is. He asks what grade he is in, and Ijin says that he is in the third grade, but he doesn't go to the same school as him. He is only briefly visiting the school. Jinwoo's phone suddenly rings, and he gets up and runs, excusing himself for being late. He arrives with the food, and the bullies bash him for being late, causing Jinwoo to think about quitting school. The girl asks if he was glaring at her legs, but Jinwoo says that he wasn't. Why would he even do that? She takes this as an insult. The other bully gets up and immediately goes for his leg, causing Jinwoo to fall. But it doesn't end there, as the bully grabs his neck and strangles him, knocking him out cold. We see that Jinwoo tried to stand up for his sister, with a few people talking trash about her, saying that she must have dated a lot of guys. But Jinwoo was powerless. He wakes up in the infirmary, with Ijin right next to him. Ijin asks him directly, Why didn't he tell Seoha about this bullying? Jinwoo notes that he must already know he is her brother and clenches his fists. We see that when Seoha started her career, it wasn't easy, as she frequented hospitals due to poor health management and got hurt by the comments of others to the point of crying. Jinwoo says that if everyone found out her brother was a bread shuttle, it would just cause her trouble. Celebrities and their families have to take care of their image, so if they find out that her brother is in this state, she will get into trouble. Ijin asks why he hasn't told a teacher about this yet, but Jinwoo retorts by saying it's not that easy and the bullying will most likely get worse. And if this becomes big enough of an issue, they will find out Seoha is in his family so he will cause her more trouble. Ijin asks what he wants to do then. Jinwoo's phone suddenly buzzes, and with the bullies messaging and bashing him constantly, they are not giving him a moment's rest. He must endure this until graduation. Ijin gets out of the infirmary and speaks with Seoha, who was apparently on speaker and heard everything. She says that she wouldn't have imagined her little brother living like this because of her. But Ijin reassures her, saying it's not her fault or even Jinwoo's. With this, he closes the call and thinks about what he talked about with his sister, who said that Seoha is really nice. He puts on his mask, ready to strike. In the class, everyone is annoyed at Jinwoo for being late, and they also talk about how Yung-sik caused him to faint again. Suddenly, Ijin arrives, and it doesn't take long before he begins the slaughter. One, two, they fall, life flies. The others try to attack him, but they can't hold a candle to Ijin. Yung-sik gets out saying that he wanted to try some moves anyway, and it seems that the perfect target just arrived. He tries to attack Ijin going for a classic one-two punch, but Ijin parries. 
He tries to attack again, but with how open he is, this is just a cakewalk for Ijin. Jung Sik gets furious and tries to go for a kick, but this gives Ijin the perfect opportunity to trip him in front of the whole class. From behind, reinforcements arrive, much to Jung Sik's gladness. They must think that he is trapped in here with them, but it's the exact opposite. The people who just came in wonder who this maniac is, and two of them charge Ijin, who makes short work of them. Jung Sik shouts that they all should rush him, and they do so. Outside of the classroom, Jin Wu walks slowly to it, hoping that he won't get knocked out again. But he spots the commotion that is happening inside, with a lot of people watching from the outside. A guy gets thrown out, and Jin Wu gets the opportunity to look inside. He stares in amazement as Yi Jin stands triumphantly among the defeated enemies. Jung Sik asks why he is doing this. Yi Jin answers back with a question. Why does he bully others? He gets close and warns Jung Sik that he will come back if he hears that he is bullying anyone else ever again. And the next time this happens, it won't end well at all for him. Jung Sik just laughs, saying that this guy must have watched too many movies. Did he think that he would just accept all of this? Yi Jin suddenly grabs his head and bashes it into the wall, and he does it again and again and again with Jung Sik's blood splattering everywhere. He asks Yi Jin to stop saying that he will listen to his words and won't mess with anyone ever again. Yi Jin leaves the classroom, with Jin Wu wondering how one guy can defeat so many people. Jung Sik spots him and gets furious, asking why he is staring and also demanding he get over there now. Suddenly, Yi Jin comes back and throws Jung Sik around with just one hand. He crouches down to his level and picks up his pointed finger. He viciously breaks it. Yi Jin asks if this is all a joke for him, demanding an answer. Jung Sik promises that he will keep his word now, but Yi Jin says that there's no need for that, as he can just come back again. Yi Jin walks away, saying to Jin Wu that he paid back the food he gave him. Yi Jin also talks with someone over the phone, saying that the situation has been resolved. A while later, everyone is talking about the incident that happened, with Jin Wu wondering who that guy was. Someone suddenly calls for him, and we see that it's his sister. Everyone is surprised at her appearance, and she spares no time in chewing out Jin Wu, asking why he kept ignoring her calls. She also demands that he come with her. Seoha spots the girls that were in the bully group, and says that she saw footage of them. She wasn't exactly bullying her brother, but she told the male students how to do it. Seoha will sue all of them. The law might be forgiving to kids, but everyone will know what she did. The siblings leave the classroom, and Jin Wu asks what she is going to do now. Won't bad things appear on the internet because of this, or maybe she will get more bad comments because of him? Seoha stops and asks if he did something wrong. They were the ones doing the bad stuff, not him. She doesn't care if she has to suffer because of this, so he should stop thinking about such things. Jin Wu tearfully agrees. She also spots Yi Jin, who loses himself in the crowd. Yi Jin arrives at school with his group, wondering when they will meet Seoha. Sukju tells Yuna that he was guarding Seoha while she was away on business, but she knows. We see that she had a conversation with Jiye, where she says that someone who Yuna knows is coming back to Korea, and they want her to look after the formalities. The thought causes Yuna to tear a page from the notebook. She suddenly gets up and asks if she can speak with Yi Jin alone. Lee and Ju don't want to give them space at first, but with a few glares from her, they all leave. She asks if he has some spare time today, but Yi Jin says that he doesn't as he has to go grocery shopping with Dayun today. Yuna says that she wants to come with her. She will even get permission from Dayun. They do so, and Sukju and Ijin talk about bodyguarding, a common occurrence for them. Yuna and Dayun talk about Ijin, with Yuna being jealous that her relationship with him is so good. Dayun gets embarrassed by her words. She also asks Yuna if she wants to come for dinner. Her face lights up at the offer, and she accepts. They both enjoy a good laugh, with the boys staring at them. They go home and have a meal prepared by none other than Yi Jin. Yuna notes how good his cooking is and asks where he learned to do so. He says that he learned from watching videos and following them step by step, much to Yuna's surprise. While eating, the girls have a great time with the boys staring at their unexpected bonding. After the meal, Yi Jin gets up to wash the dishes. Yuna says she would like to help, but Dayun says she will help so she should sit down. But Yuna gets fired up tying up her hair and demanding to do them. Ijin and her go to the kitchen, where she picks up an apron. She tries to tie it, but seems to be having difficulties. That's when Ijin steps up and helps her, much to her embarrassment. He says that he will stay to help with the dishes, and she smiles, 
her face radiating a gentle glow. Sukju notices this and smiles. The next day, inside the SW building, all of the bodyguards get informed about a VIP who is visiting today. He is named Louis Bailey. He is the third son of the Bailey group, and they are visiting due to a mutual exchange between the Bailey group and SW. Since Yuna is taking care of the formalities, Team 3 will be in charge of security. Sukju and Ijin need to be especially prepared, as they will be by Yuna's side. A while later, they greet Louis, who hugs Yuna the instant he spots her. She backs away, hoping that Ijin didn't misunderstand this gesture. Louis wonders why she is embarrassed, saying that if it's because of the security team, she shouldn't be, as they are just servants and they need to keep their mouths shut. Yuna says they should talk somewhere else and they do so over a meal. He asks if she thought about his offer, causing Yuna to stop cutting her steak. Louis notes that being engaged to him is not a bad offer for her either. Yuna says that they should talk about this later, thinking that she doesn't want Ijin to hear about it. Louis tells her that he came all this way to get the answer, but she is avoiding the topic. She adds that she already gave him the answer last time, but he retorts, saying that she knew that she would have to think about it again. Louis adds that she doesn't have a solid position or power in SW. Thanks to her father, she inherited a lot of the shares, but compared to her relatives, she is nothing. Wouldn't it be better for her, and SW as a whole, to be connected to him? Eunice trembles slowly, her expression growing dim. Suddenly, Ijin speaks, saying it's time to move to the next location, as they won't make it on time if they don't leave right now. Yuna is surprised at first, but smiles gently, agreeing with him. Louis grows irritated and asks if this is how SW trains their staff, or perhaps Ijin acted on his own accord. They both stare at each other, and Yuna says that she told him to remind her about the schedule since this is an important formality. Louis calms down, saying that they should talk privately, minding the bodyguard's presence as a nuisance. Yuna tells them to give them some space, as she will be fine. All of the guards get out of the room, and Louis gets straight to the point. Is the reason for marriage rejection because of Ijin? Yuna is surprised, asking what this is about. He reassures her, saying he isn't that petty as to get upset over things like that. He doesn't care if she goes out with him, and she can even do that while they are engaged. They are not people who marry out of love, so she can do what she wishes. He gets up, saying that he is tired from the flight and expects answers before he leaves the country. While leaving, he taps Ijin on the shoulder, saying that he should know his place. Later, Chia asks Yuna why the schedule wasn't finished. Louis is the person in charge of the project they are doing together, so the formalities were very important. Yuna says that he was the one who cancelled everything out of the blue. Jia asks if Yuna knows that she hates her. Out of everyone in the family, she hates her the most. Jia says that it was very hard for her to become who she is, as she had to compete with her own father, who wanted a part of SW, and her older brother. This all started when she was younger than Yuna. She asks her what she is doing now. Yuna inherited everything without doing anything and the grandfather gave her special treatment because she was lonely at a young age. He also protected her from relatives, which he did for none of his grandkids other than her. If things continue like this, she will gain the business as well. It would be fine if it was just her. But what about the employees who have done nothing wrong? Jia demands Yuna get more responsible. In an undisclosed location, a guard is giving information about Ijin to Louis. He is surprised to hear that he is just a high school student who is going through bodyguard training. Did he perhaps get in using connections? He also notes Yuna's lack of tact in bringing an untrained bodyguard to this type of meeting, which is truly pathetic. The next day, he stares at Ijin while the formalities are in session, noting that he leaves a bad taste every time he sees him. After they finish, Louis says that he wants to go somewhere, and Yuna asks where. Outside of the training building, Chia wonders why he wanted to meet here of all places. The team leader says that Louis suddenly requested to see the SW train's bodyguards. She arrives and sees that Yuna is demanding he apologize for what he said. Louis notes that he said nothing wrong. Her escort bodyguards are still just students, and one is even an apprentice. The leader of Team 2 tries to clear things up, saying that the SW bodyguard team is made up of people who have enough skill and personality, those two included. Lewis notes that anyone can say that, and asks that his bodyguards and the SW bodyguards have a friendly match. He says that they shouldn't be surprised at his offer. 
Aren't the SW bodyguards competent people? Yuna clenches her fist, saying she doesn't want to decide something like this on her own. Bodyguards are here to protect them, not show off. This surprises Chia a bit, and the whole bodyguard crew smiles. Louis moves on to Eugene, demanding to know what he thinks, as this whole conversation is happening because of him in the first place. Is he just going to hide behind the person he was supposed to be protecting? Ejin just stares. Louis also mocks the rest of the bodyguard group with the same remark, and it gets to some of them. But the Team 3 leader says that they need to be in top shape to protect their client, so they cannot do a sparring match. GS suddenly speaks, saying that she will allow Team 2, which is just training now, to accept the offer. He graciously accepts it, much to the team's gladness. Louis notes that it's a shame Ejin won't be finding him, throwing one more cheeky remark at him. This causes Ejin to step out, saying that he is a part of Team 2 as well. He gets into the ring with another bodyguard, and someone tells Louis that he told the bodyguard to break at least a few arms and legs of Ejin. Louis smiles, thinking that he will finally learn his place. Jia notes that she is kind of worried for Ejin, perhaps because he is so young. The team leader assures her, however, saying that out of all the sparring matches they've had, nobody could beat him. In that second, Ejin closes the gap and knocks the guy out, instantly ending the fight. Everyone stares, surprised by this spectacle. The other people from Team 2 try to jump into the ring to fight next, but Ejin demands his next opponent. He gestures this at Lewis, surprising everyone in the room. The Team 2 guys are ecstatic at this spectacle, and Lewis gets furious. The second match is in preparation, and a bodyguard assures Lewis that this won't end the same, as they were just caught off guard. The match starts, and Ejin easily puts his opponent on his last legs. The bodyguard tries to desperately charge him, but Ejin finishes the fight with one swift knee blow. Ejin says one word, next. In this field, Ejin is the predator, and Lewis is just mere prey. Lewis wonders why his bodyguard team is getting beaten up by a child. Were they perhaps careless? But one of his bodyguards denies this. Ejin's skills are just that good. Lewis tries to wrap his head around the idea of a high schooler being skilled enough to defeat elite bodyguards by himself. The next opponent enters the ring, with Sukju noting that this one is being much more careful, knowing that he knows what Ejin can do. He jumps in for a punch, but Ejin dodges all of his attacks until he finds the opportunity to counterattack. This causes the guy to lose his stability, allowing Ejin to grab him by the head and throw him. He gets on top of his opponent, choking him until he gives up. Ejin rises and looks straight at Lewis, demanding the next opponent. Lewis's bodyguard says that it's best to withdraw, as their guys aren't enough to beat Ejin. Lewis notes that his best hasn't entered the ring yet, and in another corner, the team leader explains that the spar will most likely end here. Ji Ye thinks that they will keep going because of their pride, but the team leader retorts, saying that it will be hard to beat Ejin. And even if they did, it would be meaningless, as Ejin had already taken down three people. On top of that, the reason Lewis wanted this was because he wanted to publicly shame Ejin, but since they can't, they will most likely give up. The spar ends, and the bodyguards all swarm Ejin, congratulating him on a job well done. Ji Ye notes how popular he is with the bodyguards, and the team leader notes that he is always proving himself with his skills, and to them, that is more important than words. Eugene takes his gloves off and looks at Yuna, asking how she feels. She smiles, saying her mood suddenly got better. The guys grab him away, happy at his win. Louis watches from behind, probably extremely mad at Eugene. A while later, Yuna goes to talk with the owner, and they talk about what happened. The guard says that they provoked them into it, and the SW bodyguards were hesitant at first, but they were left with no choice, so Team 2 stepped up. The owner asks about the result of the spar, and Yuna smiles saying that Ejin won against all of them by himself. In his room, Lewis speaks with Ejin, saying he should come work for him instead, as he will give him a permanent position right away, and he promises he will be treated much better than at SW. Ejin declines, causing Lewis to insist, saying he will give him three times the salary they are giving him now. Ejin still refuses, causing Lewis to say that he doesn't know anything about this world, and that this offer doesn't come often. He also demands that Ejin stay away from Yuna. She isn't suitable to hang around with a high schooler like him. Ejin notes that he is just doing his job as a bodyguard. Louis wonders if it's because of the money she is giving him, but Ejin says that if he has nothing else to say, he would like to take his leave. Louis looks at him while he does so, 
wondering if Ejin won't listen to his words until the very end. He begins drowning his sorrow in some whiskey, blaming his bodyguard team for Ejin's arrogance. The leader of said team says that he is a tough opponent, even though he might not have been able to win against him. The guys that he brought were the best that the group had to offer, so although he looks young, Ejin is strong. The leader also notes that hand-to-hand -hand combat isn't the end, all be all for bodyguarding. There are a myriad of things that a bodyguard needs to fulfill his duties without issue. Lewis agrees and asks if the plan has undergone any changes. The leader says that there have been none, and someone will visit after tomorrow's schedule. Lewis smiles, thinking that his older brother's weakness will be in his hands. The next day, he has lunch with Yuna, asking her about the answer he expected. Yuna says that he didn't leave quite yet, so she has more time to think. Lewis notes that Ejin is appealing even from a dude's perspective, so it makes sense that Yuna finds him attractive. She flares up in embarrassment, asking what he is talking about. He also notes that she can date him even when they get married. She asks what the point of the marriage is, but he scoffs, saying that people like them don't marry out of love. This is purely a business transaction, so they are both free to see other people. He gets up from the table, saying she has until tomorrow to answer. While getting in the car, Yuna wonders what she should do. They drive away, and Ijin notes her longing expression. She spots him and says that he worked hard today and that today's schedule is finished. While talking to her, he spots a man with a spider tattoo on his cheek, causing him to get on alert. He asks Sukju if he can get out of the car, as he has something to do. Sukju says that he can, as the schedule is finished anyway. He begins following the guy, wondering why he is here. He stops in front of Lewis's hotel. Inside, the person Lewis was waiting for finally arrives, showing that he has the files he demanded. He also asks for payment, and Lewis says that he will have it immediately after they finish confirming the files. Suddenly, the door opens, and the guy with the tattoo jumps out with a gun in hand. They all duck behind cover, but Lewis's bodyguard gets shot. He tries to tase the attacker, but he is too swift and continues to suppress them with the pistol. The leader wonders what must be done, but that's when he hears a commotion at the location of the attacker. It's Ejin who pins the attacker and grabs his gun. The attacker tries to fight back with a knife, but Ejin takes no time in shooting him in the leg, incapacitating him. They stare in shock at his skill. Inside the owner's office, his guard explains what happened with Ejin and the assassin. He also notes that it seemed strange for Lewis to have so many bodyguards, and it seems like he was gathering information on his second brother, Billy. Lewis was planning to meet with and get information from an employee they had won over to their side. The owner wonders if the person behind this attempted hit was Billy. The guard says that, judging by the circumstances and timing, it seems to be a given. The owner says that he heard that the Bailey family had issues choosing an heir, but to think that something like this happened, but still, he is glad it ended like this, with the guard noting that the Bailey family and even Lewis thanked them. Inside an airport, Lewis gets ready to leave, but not before requesting Yuna's answer to what he asked. Yuna rejected the marriage offer, saying that she might not know anything now, but she just can't marry someone without having feelings of love. Lewis is surprised at her answer and smiles, saying that she can do whatever she wants. But in the future, even if it's not him, this type of situation where she will have to choose will arise. But at the same time, he has become indebted to her boyfriend, Ejin, so he won't pressure her about it. Yuna flares up, saying that Ejin is not her boyfriend. She looks down, embarrassed, and Lewis finally gets it. Yuna from SW has a crush, he sighs, saying that he has proposed something out of character for now. He moves past her, saying they should meet again next time. He turns his direction to Ejin, offering him once again to come work for him. Everyone is surprised that Lewis scouted him. Lewis also notes that he won't thank him for what he did since he was a bodyguard, and it was his job. With a final farewell and a thank you from the guards, they leave. A while later, Dayun spots Sukju while walking home. She tries to greet him, but he signals for her to be silent, much to her confusion. At the convenience store, Yuna thanks Ejin for what he did. He notes that it was something he had to do, and it wasn't just him who worked hard, the other bodyguards did so as well. She looks down and thinks about Lewis's words. Yuna finally builds up the courage to ask Ejin what his goal is. He says that he hasn't thought about it before, much to Yuna's surprise, who instead asks what kind of lifestyle he wants to live. 
Ejin looks down, thinking of all the hardships he went through, all the suffering and near-death experiences. His thinking gets cut short by Yuna, who sees him so puzzled. He says that he just wants to be with his family, since they are important to me right now. Yuna is taken aback by his words. What did he mean by them right now? After a while, Yuna goes to the SW building to meet with Jiye, who is currently working. She asks what she's doing here, and Yuna sits down, saying that she has something to say. Yuna says that she wants Jiye to take over the company. She has no intention of taking over, and as Jiye said, she is not prepared and probably won't be in the future either. She has no interest in business management as well. So if there is a company she needs to take over because of inheritance, then she wants Chia to have it. But she won't give her shares, as her dad gave her those. Chia wonders if she knows what she is saying right now. It's not as simple as she says, and it's not something she has full control over. Yuna notes that it's true that she doesn't know how things work, and she doesn't know what she meant by saying this, but that's currently where she stands. So in order for that to happen, she wants Jiye to help her. Jiye wonders why she would, and Yuna adds that she has nothing to lose in this, and that it will help in the fight against her brother. She leaves and pulls out her phone, calling Ijin and asking if he's busy. At Dusik's business, he gets the news that Kilsu is here, who enters the building shortly after. Dusik is more than surprised, and Kilsu smiles, saying that it's been a while since they met. Somewhere else, the clan leaders discuss Kilsu, who was apparently staying in Russia before. So, what would he come here for? One of them says that, whatever it is, his presence means trouble. One wonders if he is here to join forces with Dusik, but it's unlikely, as he is not greedy and is living a mostly quiet life. But Kilsu is the definition of greed and will do anything to achieve his objective. Inside Dusik's business, he and Kilsu have a chat over a few drinks, with Kilsu saying that he's been for two days in Korea as he had something to do. He also asks why Dusik is lying so low. Why live like this when he has power? Dusik says that he is just lazy, and since he's getting older, even more so. Kilsu gets serious and says that they should join forces. If they do, they will be able to engulf the country. Dusik smiles, saying that he should do that himself, as he is not capable enough. And stuff like that takes business and entrepreneurial skills, so it's not something he can handle. With that, they continue to have a friendly chat over some drinks. They see him off, and Dusik's subordinate asks him not to get involved with him further. Inside the car, Kilsu is talking with someone, saying that they should leave it to him. But the stakes need to be raised. At home, Dayun is bringing Ijin some apple slices and sees him working out diligently. She asks if guys are as good at pull-ups as him. Ijin thinks about the training he went through with the soldiers and confirms this. His phone suddenly buzzes. It's a message from Dusik, who wants to have some food at the convenience store. Ijin goes outside and spots him, clearly drunk. They go and have some food and discuss Ijin's bodyguarding duty, with Dusik wondering how such a skilled person is still in a probatory period instead of a permanent position. He asks a few other questions. Like if it's not tiring and if his sister is doing well. Ijin only responds with yes, causing Dusik to smile and hand him another onigiri. The next day, Dusik and Yongsu help Ijin's grandpa clean up, who is thankful. His co-worker notes that they look like gangsters but don't act like them at all. They go around looking for some food when a subordinate's phone suddenly rings, and he gets the news that their business got attacked. They arrive and see the bloodbath that occurred there with Young Su also noting that the SD card from the CCTV also disappeared. This was clearly a planned attack. Dusik asks about the injuries, and Young Su says that all six are in critical condition. Five of them are in a coma, and the last one is conscious. He said that he remembers two of them being ambushed, but not much after that. Young Su wonders who could have done such a thing, and that's when Dusik's phone suddenly rings. It's Kil Su, who heard about the hit on his business. Dusik says that they will start investigating now, but it's not the first time something like this has happened, so he shouldn't worry so much. Kilsu says that he must have the situation under control, but still, if he needs help, he shouldn't hesitate to ask. With that, he closes the call and looks at his subordinates, saying that he wanted to be done with things quickly but to think that he wouldn't be there. One of the notes says that Dusik will move with more caution from now on, so they should be careful on their next move. It seems that this plan was coordinated by none other than Kilsu. Dusik and his men go around asking everyone about the situation, even Chuman, 
but they all deny any involvement. Later that day, they still found nothing, with Young Su saying that it wasn't someone in their area who did it. Dusik gets in a car, saying that he will go to the hospital to see his injured men and then head home. While in the car, Dusik notes that this is different, as if it were just a fight among gangs. They would have found out by investigating the area, but nothing came up. At home, Ijin speaks with his friend group after having a shower. That's when Dayun asks if he is going to meet with Dusik, as she has prepared some food for him. She did this because he is always helping their grandpa, and he also buys him drinks occasionally. She would like to give him this as soon as possible. Ijin smiles, saying that he will go give them to him now. He does so and gives him the food, saying it is from his sister. Dusik is surprised at the amount. Ijin tries to leave, but Dusik invites him inside for a drink or something. While in a car, Young Su asks if they can put some eyes on Kilsu. Someone notes that they did, but they have yet to figure out his location, and it's going to take a long time if they don't want Dusik to find out. Young Su finds it strange that the attack occurred at the same time that Kilsu came. That's when another car rams them from the side, causing their car to swerve and crash. Young Su barely wakes up from the daze, wondering what happened. That's when he gets dragged out, a pool of blood gathering near his head. Dusik notes the amount of food, saying that it's been a while since he received something like this. His mother must like cooking. Ijin notes that his sister made it. Dusik is surprised and asks why she did it. Ijin notes that their parents weren't around, so after making her own food, Dayun came to like cooking. Silence falls, and Dusik quickly tries to change the subject by giving him a drink, but he only has alcohol. Ijin says that it's fine, and he will head out now. Dusik stops him, saying that he will go buy something from the convenience store. He can't send him off like this. His phone suddenly rings, however, and he gets the news that Yung Su is missing. He closes the call and smiles at Ijin, saying that he has something to do now, so they will have that drink later. Dusik arrives at his business, and his subordinates inform him that two more businesses were hit, and around that time, Yung Su was in a car accident. Everyone there was taken to the hospital except Yung Su, who was nowhere to be found. Dusik orders his men to find him. His phone suddenly rings, it's Kil Su, saying that he heard about the attacks and wondered who would do such a thing. Dusik gets serious, saying that he would also like to know why he is attacking him. Kilsu asks how he knows, but Dusik notes that it wasn't that hard to figure out, seeming like he did it so sloppily in order for him to find out. Kilsu confirms this, saying that he was caught up in something not long ago, and that Dusik revealed the weakness of a politician, the congressman. He notes that due to this mistake, those who are in a position of power will not leave him alone. As if they don't make an example out of him, the others will bite their owners too, right? Dusik suddenly hears Yung Su getting tortured with electricity. He asks why he got Yung Su involved, as he has nothing to do with this. Kil Su says that Yung Su was suspicious from the start and assigned a few people to follow him, and the people who hired him will pay him more if he takes out Yung Su too. He also asks if Dusik wants to say a few last words to his subordinate. It's the least he can do, after all. He puts the phone over Yung Su's ear, who apologizes, saying that he is worried that Dusik will starve without him. Kilsu wonders what that was about, and Dusik is on his last nerves, saying that if he kills Yung Su, he will suffer the same fate. Kilsu mocks him, noting that it's useless to say something like that now. Dusik screams his name, madder than ever before. That's when he hears a large boom over the phone, and we see that Ijin has come to the rescue. Yung Su wonders if he came to rescue him. Kilsu thinks that Dusik was playing tricks until he arrived with reinforcements, also ordering men to take care of this guy and then drag Dusik here. Ijin begins fighting them, and they attack from different angles and use a myriad of weapons. But even if they are so many in number, Ijin takes care of them in no time. A big guy gets in front of him, and they begin fighting. The guy tries to tackle Ijin, who stops him, but also notes something dangerous and swiftly backs away. It seems that the guy pulled a knife out at the last second. Ijin closes the gap in a second and knocks the guy out, despite the weapon advantage. Another comes from behind, armed, but now that he has a knife in hand, Ijin cuts him all over the place, causing the attacker to wail in pain. Kilsu is scared to his wits, asking why Dusik has such a guy under him. Ijin ignores him and goes straight to Yung Su, who asks why he came to his rescue. Ijin thinks that this situation is related to him, but even if it wasn't, he would have enough reason to help, thinking about how they help his grandpa every chance they get. 
Kilsu asks Ejin to come work for him as his talents are being wasted here, and if he works under him, he can go on a rampage whenever he wishes. Ejin just stares, causing Kilsu to pull out a gun. He notes that it's kind of useless to fight with fists when one bullet is all it takes. He tries to say something else, but Ejin moves swiftly, allowing him to throw a knife in Kilsu's chest and rush him, pushing the knife further into his chest. Ejin notes that he probably never pulled the trigger before, as he was aiming at a moving target with just one hand. Kilsu wonders who this mystery attacker is and when where he got this deadly glare from. He pushes Ejin back and removes the knife, saying that this is the day he dies. Kilsu tries to attack, but in his weakened state, it takes Ejin no time in calming him down with a swift knee attack. Young Su looks at the spectacle before him, with Ejin standing alone between defeated enemies. Suddenly, Dusik comes in with a whole squad of people. They escort Young Su out, and Dusik looks at Ejin. We see that when he closed the call with Kilsu, Ejin called him. He offers Ejin his thanks, and with that, he walks away. Kilsu gets up, and Dusik demands to know why he did all of this. He says that they are gangsters, this is what must be done. If he were to get rid of Dusik, he would take his place in this country again. So why shouldn't he? Should he keep himself hidden and spout nonsense about peace and loyalty like him? We see that Kilsu heard about Dusik leaving from a few men. Even though he was the next heir of the clan, he still decided to leave, letting Kilsu take over. The men also note that most of them will leave with Dusik. All of this making Kilsu bite down his cigarette in anger. He notes that Dusik probably has nothing saved up, as he gave everything to the younger members because of loyalty, and he also avoids friction between family members because he wants to live peacefully. Kilsu says that with an attitude like that, why be a gangster? He should have gotten a normal job, instead of making things more difficult here. Dusik says that no matter what happens, it's wrong to stab your younger brother in the back. Dusik leaves it at that, saying that they will never understand each other. He orders his men to teach him a lesson, and Kilsu revolts at this, as he is already in a weakened state. Isn't this unfair? Dusik lights up a cigarette, saying that he will take care of it so he needn't concern himself with that. With that, the punishment begins. Ijin arrives home, and Dayun scolds him for coming home late, thinking that he was gaming with the boys. She also asks if he gave Dusik the food, and he confirms this. Dayun says that he should treat those people well. Ijin smiles and agrees. In the past, Dusik gave Young Su a large sum of cash to pay for his grandmother's surgery. He tries to decline, but Dusik insists, saying that his grandmother raised him since he was little, so he should do as much as he can for her before she passes away. A tear forms in Young Su's eye, and he thanks him. Later, while having the funeral for his grandmother, Young Su talks with Dusik, saying that because of him, his grandmother was able to pass away peacefully. Dusik is glad she was able to be peaceful in her last moments. Later, while going to their business, Young Su hears from some men that Dusik is living at the sauna recently. Apparently, he borrowed money from different place and eventually used his rent money. Young Su knows that this money was used to pay for his grandmother's surgery, so he rushes to the sauna, where he sees Dusik and he bawls his eyes out. Back to the present, he wakes up in a hospital bed, with Dusik asking if he should call the nurse. Young Su smiles and says that it's okay. Silence falls for a moment, and Dusik apologizes, saying that all of this happened because of him. Young Su says that he already has done so much for him. So if he dies, then so be it. He also says that it's not like him to say things like that, he's acting like a stranger. Young Su changes the subject, and they begin talking about Ijin, with Young Gu saying that he doesn't plan to fall in his line of sight anytime soon, as he is incredibly skilled with the knife. Suddenly, the SW owner's guard comes inside. At school, Ijin is talking with the owner, who says that he needn't worry about them from now on, as he will give them legal jobs under SW. Ijin thanks him, but the owner says that it was nothing. He saved Yuna after all, so this much is nothing. Ijin closes the call, and Lee invites him to the PC cafe. He declines, saying that he has work today. He gets up and heads straight for Sukju, asking if he has some time today. Much to his surprise, Ijin just wanted to buy him food as thanks for the help. While eating, two girls come up to them, asking for their numbers. Sukju tries to reject them gently, but Ijin grows a cold stare and demands to know why they want his number. This leaves everyone surprised, and Sukju explains to the girls that Ijin has lived overseas for a long time, so he is not used to this kind of thing. 
The girls leave, and Sukju sits down, saying that he didn't have to react like that. Ijin says that he had to, as someone he didn't know asked for his number. Yuna hears this, who was right next to them with the boys' group. Sukju explains the situation, and Lee says that if the girls they rejected were the same ones who passed the corner, one of them is Che Yasul, apparently famous for being a trainee at an entertainment company. They ask Sukju if he gave his number, and he confirms that he indeed didn't. Yuna sheepishly asks Ijin if he did, and he says that of course he didn't. Lee gets furious, but she's glad at his answer. The boys leave to buy some noodles, and Yuna sits down, asking Ijin if he is doing anything after school tomorrow. He says that he was going to tell the teacher that he is going to be absent since he has to train with Team 2. Sukju notes that he doesn't have training in the afternoon, letting Yuna ask if he is free then. Ijin says he has nothing planned, and she says that if that's the case, she will visit him after training. Sukju notices her smiling, and that's when he hears the boys coming back with Dayun in tow, and they explain what happened with the girls. Sukju stares seriously at Dayun, saying that they rejected them with one-word answers. Dayun is a bit puzzled at his reaction. At a locale, Yisul sits with her friends, who all discuss the boys who rejected them so harshly. She gets a bit furious. Nobody has rejected her before. So what gives them the right? The next day, the boys walk out of the school, and that's when Yisul approaches, much to their surprise. She notes their reaction, thinking that this is how it's supposed to be. She invites them to karaoke with her friends. The boys look for a bit dumbfounded, and Yisul will use them to make Ijin come after her. But the boys reject this offer, saying that they have their promo games today. With that, they leave. Actual Giga Chads. The next day, Ijin talks with the owner, saying that thanks to him saving Louis, they were able to sign favorable contracts with a few businesses of his. Ijin notes that it was just his duty as a bodyguard, but the owner doesn't buy it this time. The company has gotten a lot of benefits from his actions, so he must repay him somehow. Ijin says that he's just on probation now, and the ones who did their jobs was the security team. He was there to clean up afterwards, so if he wants to repay someone, it should be them. The owner says that he already did, but he wanted to give him something different since he was so involved. He also saved Yuna and Chi Ye, and since he keeps declining repayment every time, he can't overlook this further. Ijin says that he's good. Silence falls, and the owner breaks it by saying that this would be of help to his family as well. It's not like he's doing something illegal by repaying him, and he doesn't need to decide right now what he wants. But he should give it some thought. With that, Ijin leaves, and the guard notes Ijin's attitude. They talk about how he sent a large sum of money to the village he used to live in when he was a mercenary. The guard notes that sent several hundred million won to support the reconstruction. That amount can only mean one thing. He gave almost all of his money from working as a mercenary, making the guard wonder why he risked his life for the cash in the first place. The owner says that this can only mean one thing. He at least didn't do those jobs for the money. Ijin gets stopped by Ji Ye, who asks if he met with the owner just now. She thinks that it was about the repayment, so he can look forward to it. Ijin says that he declined. This makes Chia furious, saying that he doesn't know anything. He should have accepted, as the owner would have rewarded him handsomely. Ijin smiles and says that he doesn't need it. She walks away, noting that apart from his combat skills, he is still just a kid. Ijin continues his bodyguarding training, but it gets cut short, as they will go have a work dinner. While having said dinner, the team members flocks to Ijin, thanking him for the bonus they're received because of his actions. They treat him well, and Chia looks at this from the outside, wondering how such a silent person is so popular. Afterwards, Ijin arrives home, with Dayun greeting him. He notes that the grandpa isn't home yet, and Dayun says that he is going going to come later than usual, as he had something to do. The door beeps, and they welcome him inside. But they spot that he is holding his back, Dayun asking what happened. He says that he was just lifting some stuff for a resident, and he twisted his back slightly, but put him to bed, with a hot pack to help the pain. He urges them to go to sleep, as he's going to be fine. Ijin urges Dayun to go rest, as he will watch over Grandpa. Ijin thinks about the owner's offer, and asks if work is tiring. The Grandpa says that it is, but he wouldn't like to stop working. What job isn't tiring? And it's a miracle he can still work at this age. He asks Ijin why he is asking this, 
Is it perhaps concerned about money? The grandpa rises slowly from his bed, saying that there's no need to worry about that. Because he worked so much, he already set aside money for Dayun's university and marriage expenses. He can also send him to university too, so until he moves out, he has to look after him. He also notes that his parents had life insurance, so he will give them that money when they move out. But until then, he wants to raise them with the money that he personally earned, so he shouldn't worry about a thing. Ejin smiles softly. The next day, Ejin confirms to the owner that his answer remains unchanged. The owner says that the compensation would be a great help for his family, and he also heard that his grandfather is also quite old too. Ejin notes that his grandpa wants to take responsibility and raise him and his sister with his own strength, and he would like to follow his will. The owner notes that he has a great grandfather. Ejin smiles, agreeing with him. They are both surprised at his smile. While he leaves, he crosses paths with Yong Ho, who requests an investigation on Ejin. Jia gets the news that he is here and is currently having a meeting with the president. This leaves Jia to think about Yuna's proposal. Yong Ho discusses the business with the owner and about the new acquired assets. The discussion shifts around to the kidnappings that occurred recently, and Yong Ho bashes the guard, who is also the chief secretary, for the weakness of the SW security team. He apologizes and the owner covers him, saying that this matter is already solved. Yong Ho lets this matter go for now. This encounter makes the owner think about Ejin and how respectful he is with his grandpa. Yong Ho leaves the office, and his bodyguard informs him about Ejin. He has been participating in field training and is also in the same class as Yuna and Sukju. He wonders why they put a high schooler in the security team, but his bodyguard notes that he is quite skilled as he had a major role in saving Yuna and Ji Ye, and he also helped catch the killer that was after Louis. The guard also tells Yong Ho one other detail. Miss Yuna has apparently taken a liking to Ejin. Having finished training, Yuna comes up to him saying that they should go to the PC cafe together. Suddenly Yong Ho calls out for her, souring her facial expression instantly. They exchange greetings, and he looks intently at Ejin, who just stares back. Sukju also greets Yong Ho, who bashes him for allowing Yuna to be kidnapped. Is this how he repays SW for taking him under their wings at such a tender age? Yuna urges him to stop acting like this, and the team leader, having heard this, comes up and apologizes, saying it's his fault as team leader. Yuna drags him away, saying that they should have dinner together. Young Ho calms down, and they both leave. Sukju explains that Young Ho is Yuna's cousin, and Chi is biological older brother. Since he is in charge of the SW subsidiary, he also lives here. Sukju notes one final thing. He is also the person Yuna fears the most. While having dinner, Yong Ho notices that Yuna hasn't touched her food and asks what's wrong. She excuses this by saying she has some stomach problems, and he says she should take better care of herself. He changes the subject, talking about the engagement with Louis. Yuna asks how he knows all of this, but of course he would as it was on his suggestion. She is shocked to hear this. How could he do this, without discussing it with her first? Yong Ho notes that he thought it would have gone well, but he didn't think Louis would have messed it up because of his girl problems. Yuna thinks about this. She was the one who rejected him, but it seems that he told Yong Ho otherwise. He tells her that she should study abroad, since things turned out like this. And while she does so, he will make sure to find a suitable suitor. Since everything is already prepared, all she needs to do is come one month later. Yuna's face sours, and she builds enough courage to say that she doesn't want to. She wants to stay here, in Korea. Yong Ho notes her attitude. This is the first time she defied him, so if she changed so drastically, it must be because of that trainee, Yi Jin. She is surprised at first, but he says that she shouldn't be. It's only normal to be interested in things like that at her age. But it will only be just that, as nothing good will come out of it in her future, and for Yi Jin as well. This is clearly a threat, and Yuna freezes. Suddenly, Jia comes from behind, asking her to give them some space, and she wants to spend some time with her dear brother. She does so, and Jia sits down, causing Yong Ho to ask what she wants. She says that she wanted to spend some time with her brother, but he notes that there's no time for that, as the new business is too slow on progress. He changes the subject, asking why she married into a family that doesn't suit his standards. Shouldn't they have received some support from them? Jia notes that her fiancé's family is involved in the military business, 
so they are taking their time. She also notes that her fiancé's household is pretty good, and he seems like a good person, the more they talk. Young Ho smirks, thinking that she did all of this to gain the owner's favor. While leaving, Yuna spots Sukju and Ijin waiting for her, and she asks why they didn't go home. They say they are still working, and with that they drive away, both noting her defeated look. This causes Ijin to think about the conversation he had with Sukju, who said that Young Go had looked after Yuna a lot since she was younger, but it was because he wanted to manipulate her as he pleased. It wasn't that bad until her father passed away, and after that, he manipulated her to no end. Ijin asks for the reason Yong Ho is doing all this, and Sukju says that he is most likely trying to secure her shares that she inherited. He's been trying to win the inheritance battle with Ji Ye and the others by manipulating Yuna. His thoughts get interrupted by her, who apologizes for making plans of her own, as they originally intended to hang out at the PC Cafe. She also says that they should have some food at the convenience store, since they probably haven't eaten yet. Sukju notes that she already had dinner with Yong Ho, but she says that she didn't eat there, as she had stomach problems. They both just stare at her. They do so, but not without Yong Ho's guard stalking them and reporting what she finds directly to him over the phone. He orders her to find out more about Yuna's surroundings and closes the call. He smirks. The little bird wants to leave the cage? Well, he can't just sit still as the bird's owner, right? The next day, he confronts the Team 3 leader and says that Yuna will have new bodyguards, as he has failed his job before, referring to the kidnapping. The team leader is hesitant to make the change, as they need to go through the processes to do so. But Young Ho stops him, saying that he already talked with the chief secretary, so he should leave this job to the pros, as the people that will replace them are highly skilled. The team three leader notes that they are also pros, but Young Ho gets mad, as what kind of pros let their VIP get kidnapped? Yuna says they should stop, and tell the team leader that she will be fine. He looks at her for a second before bowing down in agreement. At school, Yung Chan notes that Sukju and Yuna aren't in their seats, but Ijin knows why, as a few moments before, Sukju called and told him what happened with Yuna. In the training room, Team 3 discusses the situation. Do they just have to stand by and watch this happen? Wasn't their purpose to watch Yuna? The team leader urges them to stop arguing, as if they don't have orders from above, they can't do anything. Ji Ye, who was also there, thinks about all this. How can Yong Ho change Yuna's bodyguards on his own accord? Moreover, he is doing what he wants with her life, as he plans to control her future as well. The Team 2 leader notes that this is a problem that concerns the whole of SW security. Jia asks what the security chief said, and the team leader says that he didn't comment on anything specifically. While leaving, he also notes that he found it strange that Yong Ho had this many guards with him so he must have planned for this since the beginning. Jia wonders if the guards he brought are that great compared to Subliu ones. The team leader notes that they are all from Iron, a global private military company. Their skills are considerable, and the range of them is noteworthy at least. Yango signed a contract with them early, and has been hiring guards from there. Jia asks how they compare to SW, and the team leader says that they are PMCs, so they are active in multiple fields, so they can't directly compare but when it comes to security, they can. If it's about domestic security, SW wins, but the same can't be said about international security. Since regionalities are important in security work, they would have a gigantic amount of data and guards who are fit for anything. He also notes that he understands why Xiang Ho uses them, as he works primarily overseas. Ji Ye notes that this is not the only reason. She thinks that Yang Ho doesn't trust anyone, instead favoring relationships that are entirely made through contracts. So there's a possibility that he is concerned about a spy among the SW guards. She suddenly spots Ijin, who is going towards the training room. She says that he probably heard what happened and asks what he is going to do. Ijin says that there's only one thing he needs to do, and leaves. We see that Yuna has cooped herself up in her room, and Yong Ho gets informed about this. But he doesn't really care instead asking his guard if they changed her schedule to match when she goes abroad. The guard confirms that she did, and Yong Ho excuses her. He picks up a phone and calls someone, a familiar figure, in a familiar place. He picks up, and Yong Ho says that SW and Iron will soon join forces. The person says that this is great news, and if he needs anything, he should let them know, as they are his most prized customer. 
Yongho smirks, thinking that even if Jiye used marriage to expand in the military industry, he will be the one to climb up in position using that. Later, while he is training, Ijin gets a call from Yuna, who invites him outside. While sitting at the convenience store, Yuna thinks about what Xiangho said. She will be leaving in two days to study abroad, so she should get prepared and tidy up things here, as she will be busy from now on. He spots her grim expression, and says that since she enjoys this lifestyle, she is obligated to act for the betterment of the company, so she shouldn't dare make a mistake like last time. Yuna freezes and obliges. She comes back to the present when Ijin puts a juice container in front of her, and he sits down. She asks if she called too late, but he says no, as he was training when she called. She's surprised that he has the energy to train even after training with the security team every day. She wonders if that's why he's so good at training, as even the other members said that he is the best when it comes to that. She smiles, saying that she was going to, to go to the PC cafe today with the others, but she was too busy. Ijin says that they didn't comment on that but wondered where she was. She pouts, saying that she wanted to show her skills at the game, that she improved. She gets closer to Ijin and says that ever since Lee told her she's bad at games, she's been practicing at home, and they should keep this a secret. Ijin says that he will. And with that she backs away, saying that sometimes she is better than him, and will do anything in her power to stop him from calling her bad. They sit and enjoy this time for a while, until Yongho's bodyguard comes from behind, saying that it's quite late. She also gives Ijin a glare, and he does so as well. Yuna tells him that she is going to study abroad, and that's why she came to visit him. So because of this, she won't be able to come to school anymore. She smiles, clearly trying to hide her sadness. She gets up and leaves, and Ijin watches. She arrives home, where Sukju greets her. He also heard that she is going to study abroad, but this time he can't go with her, as Yongho made it so he couldn't. He asks if she really needs to go, but she says that Yongho will destroy the people around her if she doesn't. But Sukju wasn't asking that, instead wanting her own thoughts. He adds that this is the best he's seen her until now. She laughs a lot and talks even more. It looked like she was having a lot of fun. Yuna begins crying, saying that this is exactly why she has to go. It's true, she was having a really fun time, but she doesn't want harm done to the people she had fun with. In the owner's office, Yongho talks with him, saying that he decided to make Yuna settle abroad, as she is all grown up now. While leaving, he spots Ijin walking towards the office and mocks him by saying that the owner finds people who are not of the standard to talk to. Inside, the owner apologizes for calling so late, and asks how Yuna was as he met with her. Ijin notes that she looked like she needed family the most. This causes the owner's face to grow dim, and he says that SW is responsible for many people, so it has a huge impact on the industries and economy of this country. If something goes wrong at SW, people will be hurt, and he is responsible for this, so he has no time to think about family. He can't just favor someone, as powerless people will be hurt in the process. Ijin says that even with that, isn't Yuna his granddaughter? When he came to the country after losing his memory and living on the battlefield all of his life, his grandpa hugged him tightly while crying. So even he, who had no memory of them, could understand a little what family really meant. A few days later, Yongho's guard delivers the news that Yuna hasn't come out of her room since she met with Ijin. He thinks that she came to her senses and probably just reading. Yuna, however, is just sitting in her bed and looking at all the messages from the group chat. The boys note that their win rate got higher since Yuna and Ijin stopped coming to play, and she gets a bit mad and wants to type something, but stops. Later, a whole line of cars pull up to her house. In one of them is Yong Ho and his guard, who says that a group suddenly wants to meet Yuna. He says that they will meet with them as soon as they arrive. He thinks that Yuna is the perfect chess piece. They can use her to expand, and since it's forming a blood relationship with SW, he needs to choose the person with the best offer. After that happens, he will get rid of everyone else and finally win this game of succession. While getting ready to go in a car, Ijin arrives, but gets stopped by a guard. Yuna demands to know why they are stopping him, but a guard gets in front of her. Yongho's guard urges her to get inside the car, as they will be late if they waste time any longer. She also spots Yongho, who is glaring at her intently. Ijin suddenly calls for her and asks what she wants. All she needs to do is tell him. Yuna is left puzzled. What does she want? Yongho gets out of the car 
saying that he is interrupting busy people. On whose order is he acting like this? Ijin sits in silence. Yuna tries to get the attention of Yongho, but Ijin stops her, saying that she should stop being aware of other people and say what she wants. She thinks of all the memories she has made here, and with Ijin, she doesn't want to go. She wants to stay here. Ijin looks at her and says, This is plenty enough for him. Yongho gets furious and demands they take care of him. A bodyguard tries to grab him, but Ijin dodges and incapacitates him in two swift moves. Two more attack, but to no avail, as he moves too swiftly for them to do anything. All of the people there are shocked at this display. Ijin approaches Yuna, who asks what he is going to do. He says that he is just doing his job, protecting her. She adds that if he does this, things are going to be tougher for him, as Young Ho doesn't let things go. She thinks that he will definitely go after Ijin's family, which he cherishes so dearly. Ijin just smiles and says that this is his job. Young Ho notes that he should do things in moderation so that they can be overlooked. Ijin says that he is her bodyguard and he is doing what he needs to do. Yongho has had enough of him and orders all of his bodyguards to charge Ijin. They do so, but that's when Team 3 gets in front of Ijin, stopping Yongho's bodyguards, who will stand victorious in this battle of wits. Yongho demands an explanation as to what they are doing. The team leader says that they are simply carrying out their duties of Team 3 to protect Yuna, and in this case, to stop him from forcing her. Young Ho asks if everyone in the team is ready to take responsibility for those words. The team leader looks at him intently, and everyone in the team says that they are prepared. Young Ho tries to say something, but Yuna steps up and says that he needs to stop threatening her bodyguards. She thinks that everyone is protecting her now, so she can't just hide behind them. She notes that all of these people stepped forward to protect her. So what gives him the right to threaten them? She says that he shouldn't even think of causing harm to them, since she will be there to protect them. Young Ho looks at her and sighs, saying that he understands, but they should stop arguing and get moving, as they will miss the flight. Yuna says that she is not going abroad, causing him to look at her with a deadly glare, saying that she should obey while he's being nice. This makes Yuna shake a little, and Ijin steps in front of her. Yuna looks at him and looks down. This spectacle makes her find enough courage to step forward and put her foot down. She says that he should stop trying to control everything in her life. Yong Ho asks if she can take responsibility for her words, and she says that she can so he needn't concern himself further. She turns around as to leave, causing him to scream at her. Suddenly, Jia arrives, with Team 2 in tow. She says that he has no reason to scream at her. He demands she stay out of this, but she continues speaking. Is Yuna perhaps a child who can't make decisions for herself? Why does he want to tell her to go abroad? Young Ho wonders why she's getting involved now. In the past, she had nothing to do with Yuna. Jia says that he looks pathetic trying to use a mere child in their fight. He should come straight at her instead of trying to take control. Yuna's phone suddenly rings and she picks it up. The call is from the owner. This takes the attention of both Young Ho and Jia. The owner asks Yuna what she wants. This surprises her and she says that she wants to live here and find something else to do rather than business management. She notes that it would be irresponsible for her to manage the business when she has no skills, so she wants to find something else. He smiles gently and says that she can do that from now on. Tears roll down her face after hearing this, making Yong Ho wonder what happened. Suddenly his phone rings. It's the owner who gets straight to the point. From now on, he won't be making the decisions regarding Yuna's life. He will take on that role as her grandpa, so he just look after himself. Yong Ho puts down the phone and he gets in the car. Yuna smiles at Ijin and Sukju and says that they should go to school. Team 3 smiles and Chia leaves, noting that things will become troublesome from now on. After that, the owner sits back in his chair, with the chief secretary saying that he looks tired. The owner notes that the role of grandpa is more exhausting than he originally thought. While driving away, Young Ho calls the mystery person and says that things will progress slower from now on because of an unexpected event. The person notes that it's fine, and if he needs anything, he should let them know, as they are partners after all. That night, Young Ho ponders on the situation. How dare Yuna stab him in the back after everything he's done for her sake? And why did Jia get involved, as he knew that she hated Yuna? His guard comes in with the information he requested. 
She says that it's known that the relationship between Ji Ye and Yuna is not bad, and Yuna has been looking for Ji Ye a lot more recently. Yong Ho smashes the table. How dare she take away what is rightfully his? He calls the person and asks if that offer to assist is still standing. The person says yes, and Yong Ho tells him that he wants his sister out of the picture. With that, they close the call, and the person orders someone to contact the camp. His subordinate notes that the camp hasn't resolved its issues yet, but the person says that it's fine. They will still follow orders. The next day at school, Yuna is fired up, saying that they are all going to the PC cafe later. They are surprised that she is so into gaming now, and Lee notes that it wouldn't be that weird if she was good at games. Yuna fakes a reaction, causing Lee to reluctantly apologize. She also asks where Ijin is, and Sukju says that he has bodyguard work with Team 2 today. That night, while on the job, his phone buzzes continuously. Jia asks why he isn't checking the messages, and Ijin says that he's working, so he will check later. She says that it's fine, they are in the car anyway, so he can check. Ijin does so, and it's a message from his sister. He smiles, causing Ji Ye to think that it's probably from his family. He puts the phone back in his pocket, and she asks if he is free tomorrow evening after work, as she wants them to eat together. Ijin is hesitant at first, but Ji Ye adds that the lieutenant will also be here, causing him to instantly accept, much to her annoyance. Ijin arrives home and puts back the phone he uses to speak with 006. The phone rings, and they begin talking. 006 notes that he has some information for him. The place that is giving the camp its orders is suddenly investigating it, him noting that this is probably why 032 got caught, because he thought the orders were from Mad Dog. His best guess is that the higher-ups are keeping his existence a secret, as the camp was almost finished after eliminating him. They reported that they eliminated Ijin after huge losses, but he is still alive. He adds that from Mad Dog's perspective, the person in charge of the camp would want to keep this a secret. So this is the reason they are looking after Ijin, because they can easily get caught by the higher-ups if they make appropriate moves. Ijin asks how 032 is, and 006 says that he's fully recovered, but still trying to get used to live outside of camp. With that, they close the call, leaving Ijin to ponder. The next day he continues his bodyguarding duties. They go outside and a woman is spying on them through binoculars. She suddenly spots Ijin and calls him by his camp number. 001. He suddenly senses something and looks up, but nothing is there, so he gets in the car and leaves. The woman says that she is sure that person is 001. In the camp, Mad Dog picks up a call from the woman, 005, who wanted to ask him something. She notes that it's about 001. How did he die? Mad Dog is hesitant to answer at first but he says that the entire area 001 was hiding up was blown to pieces. 005 asks if they confirm the corpse, and he confirms this. He asks why she is so curious all of a sudden, and she says that she regrets not taking him out herself. She heard about the situation with 006 and 032, and thinks that 001 was the cause for all this bloodshed. Mad Dog says that she shouldn't waste her energy on something like this, and focus on completing the mission. With that, they close the call, and Mad Dog notes that Iron is already suspicious of them, but now they have to be careful around others as well. 001 must be eliminated as soon as possible. 005 thinks about what Mad Dog said, and how he was flustered when she asked that. He was clearly trying to hide something. Was that really 001? If he is, he looks a lot different than what he used to. That same night, he has dinner with the lieutenant, who says that he was surprised to hear that he will be coming here. Eugene apologizes for not being able to get in contact with him, but the lieutenant says that it's fine, as he was on a mission, and he doesn't have to tell him everything. He asks Ji Ye as Eugene is used to the job, and she notes that he is excelling and all the team members like him. The lieutenant smiles and says that Eugene is popular with everyone, even the guys. Ji Ye smiles, thinking that the lieutenant was so shy when it was just them, but he's a whole different person when Eugene is around. We see that when they had a meeting in the past, he asked her to take care of Ijin, much to her surprise. She asks how they met, and the lieutenant begins telling her that they met overseas, and Ijin helped him around, and because he was so reliable, he got to meet his squadron, and they played games and such together. Jia notes that it seems like he's reciting of a textbook with that explanation. He changes the subject, 
asking when the food is coming out. GS smiles and thinks that his reaction is pretty suspicious. Her phone suddenly rings, and she excuses herself from the table to pick it up. With that, Ejin and the lieutenant begin talking, with him asking how his family is doing. Ejin says that they are fine, and the lieutenant says that he was surprised to see him as a bodyguard, but it does suit him, now that he thinks about it. He asks if he is going to do this after graduating, but Ejin says that he didn't think that far. The lieutenant adds that Jia is also complimenting him on his work, which seems to be a rarity for her. He also asks if it's not too much to juggle work in school, but Ejin says that it's fine, as both sides are very hospitable. The lieutenant asks about his friends, and Ejin says that they are doing fine. While coming back from her call, Jia spots them and smiles, thinking that they must be really close to each other. After that meal, Ejin walks home, when he suddenly spots a woman standing in front of him. They approach each other, and she suddenly pulls out a knife and aims for his neck. Ejin stops her, and the woman now knows for sure that he is 001. Ejin also knows who she is, 005. At the Iron Headquarters, the person gets informed that the camp has sent 005 for the job. The person is surprised that they sent a numbered for something like that, and the subordinate says that they are probably trying to clear their suspicion, so they need to make sure that this mission is a success. We see the explanation for numbered people. They are a special unit raised by Iron, an affiliated secret organization. They gathered a thousand people, and after surviving year after year of hellish training and real battles, only 40 people were left. After this, they were fully active, and although it was short, Iron was able to grow and amass wealth like never before. However, due to the betrayal of the numbers, those who led them lost a considerable amount. So their military strength fell into pieces, and the camp was almost annihilated. From then on, the camp followed their orders and sent numbered on individual missions. The person looks at a painting and laments not being able to control it. 005 and Ejin go to a construction site, and she notes that it seems like he's been living well instead of being dead. Ejin says that if she didn't know he was here, then Mad Dog wasn't the one who sent her. This gets her mad at Mad Dog. Why was he hiding this from her? Ejin notes that since he is not the target, it must be someone from SW, as she probably spotted him while he was bodyguarding. 005 says that they have spoken enough, and pulls out a gun. She tries to shoot Ejin, but he dodges and closes the gap. He strikes her, removing her disguise in the process. 005 gets ready to shoot again, but Ejin slaps the gun away, and they engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They seem to be equally matched, as they both hit and block every attack. She suddenly throws him off and hit him in the stomach with her knee. He barely dodges her next attack, but this gives him the opportunity to grab and push her into a wall. He tries to put her in a handlock, which she gets out of. 005 tries to get up, but that's when he hits her in the face with his knee. This doesn't stop her, however, as she kicks his leg, causing him to fall down. 005 goes in for the kill, but Ejin grabs her arm and turns the situation around. He grabs the knife and goes for the kill, but stops at the last second. 005 pushes him off and demands to know what he is doing. Why is he hesitating to kill his colleagues now? 26 died by his hand, so why is he hesitating? Ejin just stares. 005 adds that although they did whatever they pleased, they were still her prized colleagues and went through hell with her, and his greed killed them. Ejin says that he never did that. He simply incapacitated the ones following him. She tries to retort this at first, but she looks at his face, and it seems that he isn't lying. He adds that his chasers weren't in a state to fight after they fought him, but nothing was fatal. This makes 005 think, who killed the other numbered people? She says that even though he didn't do it, he still betrayed them. Ejin says that then, a bit of his memory came back, and he couldn't kill innocent people under the camp's orders. She believes him, saying that his eyes look totally different than back then. Through her words, Ejin finds out Mad Dog didn't send her for him. 005 notes that he is still annoying, and that's when she throws two blades at him and goes for the gun. She reaches it and begins shooting. Ejin goes behind cover, giving her the opportunity to retreat. He looks around and calls someone. With that, Chiye and Yuna get escorted by their respective security teams. In the owner's office, the chief secretary notes that because of Li Jingun's warning, the important SW people have been sent back along with their security guards. The owner notes that it's happening again. He expected it after starting the munitions industry, sure. But to think it would happen so soon. 
Inside her apartment, 005 wonders why Mad Dog hasn't told her about Ijin. She thinks about his words and reflects on them. If he wasn't the one who killed the numbered, who was? She smirks, noting how messed up this situation truly is. Suddenly, 005 gets on full alert after someone has rings the doorbell. It's a delivery man, but not really, as he is accompanied by two armed people. One of them unlocks the door with a drill, and he gets a gun out of the box, and they begin sweeping the apartment. They find nothing at first, but when one turns a corner and goes through a doorway, he instantly gets shot in the head. This gets the attention of the others, but it's too late, as 005 has already aimed for their vitals. She takes one out and leaves the last alive. She asks who sent them, but spots the active radio on the attacker, and ends him instantly. 005 thinks that it must not be SW, as they wouldn't use weapons like that. Perhaps they are from an organization 001 is part of. That night she tries to leave but gets stopped by a blockade of cars. She shoots one, but this leaves her cornered with no way of escape. Suddenly, Ijin sweeps in and takes out two of them, giving her the opportunity to take care of the last one. Ijin just stares at her. At their mansion, that person gets the news that the hitmen they hired to take care of 005 failed. He says it's a shame they couldn't take her out after finally figuring out her movement, and his subordinate adds that they left no trace of hiring the hitmen, so there's nothing to worry about. Ejin and 005 relax in an undisclosed location, and he asks who were the people that attacked her. She notes that a lot of people want the number dead, and also asks why he helped. He doesn't answer, giving her the opportunity to ask if he gained back all his memories. Ejin says that they are almost all back. 005 tells him that 032 died recently, and 006 too. In the end, those brothers died around the same time. The camp people says that they both died on a mission, but it might be these same people who were trying to kill her. Ejin stares at her. 005 is angry at his reaction, since 032 and 006 followed him a lot in the past. Ejin notes that it's not about that. She gets up thinking that he killed them. Ejin is a bit puzzled at her reaction and says that he didn't. She finally gets it, 032 and 006 didn't really die. She gets annoyed, wondering what they are going to do if they get caught pretending to play dead. Ijin notes that they hid well. 005 adds that he himself knows that the camp doesn't tolerate deserters, with investigations and punishments being more extreme than when he was there. Ijin says that the camp isn't in a position to investigate their deaths because Mad Dog sent 006 to kill him, and he made it seem like he killed 006. She sighs, noting that he's probably right, as Mad Dog won't be able to do a proper investigation because he hasn't announced that he's alive. She also asks about 032, and Ejin notes that he's in hiding with 006 as well. 005 puts her hand on her face, noting how the guys who wanted to escape so bad finally managed to. This makes him think about the past, about how he helped 032, even in the smallest ways. His thoughts gets interrupted by 005, who announces her target Jia. She turns to leave, and he asks what she plans to do from now on. She says with her location disclosed, she can't continue the mission, so she will go back. Later, she calls Mad Dogs, and explains what happened with the hitmen. She adds that he was the only one who knew her route, implying that he did it. He gets mad, but tries to calm her down. But she's having none of it, and says that she gives up on the mission, so they shouldn't look for her for a while. With that, she breaks the phone. At the owner's office, Ejin notes that the worst-case scenario has been averted for now. The owner asks how he came with that conclusion, and Ejin says that the assassin was after Jia. He doesn't know the reason, but he knows for a fact that Jia was the target. The chief secretary notes that he probably captured said assassin if he has this must information, so is that why he is saying the problem is solved? Ejin looks at the for a second, and says that the assassin was his past colleague. Said colleague is in an organization that specializes in assassinations, and when acting alone, they only move to kill their target. The owner asks what happened with the colleague, and Ejin says that they gave up on the mission, and there's no chance they will go after Jia again. The chief secretary notes that just because that colleague gave up, it doesn't mean that the situation is solved. Won't others go after Jia? Ijin just says that even if they do, they will be much easier opponents. And since they failed once, 
it's unlikely they will attempt the same mission. The owner says that he knew he was a skilled mercenary, but it also seems to be a part of his past. Ijin says that being a mercenary was his identity for five years before returning home. We see that when Ijin first arrived in the camp, he was in a pretty poor condition. He also doesn't understand the language, and when somebody told him to get up, he just stood and watched. This makes the guy pick and throw him out. Ijin looks around, confused at what he is seeing. Mad Dog comes up in front of him, and the guy who dragged Ijin out notes that he's unable to function mentally. Mad Dog notes that it must be from the plane crash, but it doesn't matter. He will participate in training from today onwards. He would have died without their help anyway, so he has nothing to lose. Ijin stares, not knowing what they just said. Suddenly, a guy pushes him in the ground with his foot, saying that he needs to go through the hazing, as sort of an initiation. They continue mocking him, until someone comes and throws them around like puppets. That person is none other than 005. They ask why she did that, and she says that they just pissed her off, so why does she need a reason? They run away and speaks with Ijin, but he can't understand her. She tells him to get up, but he just sits on the ground. She picks him up. Ijin comes to in the present, where the lieutenant calls him. He says that he knows what happened with his colleague who tried to assassinate Jiye. Ijin says that he wasn't able to catch the assassin, but they won't send another one for the same target. The lieutenant worrisomely asks him if he's okay. Ijin says that he is okay, but the lieutenant wonders how he can be after an old colleague of his came to assassinate his employer. He also tells him that he shouldn't hesitate to ask for help. Ijin smiles and thanks him. And with that, they close the call. Suddenly, Dayun come up to him, asking why he is just staring blankly at his phone. She adds that something's weird about him. There's definitely something going on. She asks if it's about Yuna, but Ijin denies this. They begin walking home, and 005 looks at them from a distance. She sees Ijin smiling, and is surprised that he can make faces like that. While sleeping, Mad Dog thinks about the time he got his scar. This is the same time he gave Ijin the title of leader of the squadron. 001. They drag a weakened guy out, saying that since this was the last training, anyone who fails will be executed. He points the gun at the injured person, but Ijin steps in front, saying that since this is his squadron, he will be managing them. Mad Dog gets a little furious, but thinks that he can make a perfect example out of him, since he is the strongest out of the numbered. He throws a knife at his legs, saying that if he can win against him, he will let the injured guy live. Ijin just stares, and when he leans to pick up the knife, Mad Dog suddenly strikes him. He continues his onslaught of attacks, but Ijin finds the opportunity to throw some mud in his eyes. With that, he dashes to the knife and picks it up. They continue the fight, and Mad Dog thinks that he is still just a trainee, so he can't lose against this guy. Against this child, who couldn't even go through basic training in the beginning. Ijin suddenly slashes his arm and then some. He gets on top of Mad Dog and with a deadly fire in his eyes, slashes his face. Mad Dog wakes up in the present, and he gets mad at remembering such an embarrassing thing. He damns Ijin once again. Ijin is doing some cardio in his tracksuit, and that's when 005 grabs his attention. They begin speaking in a nearby park, and she tells him that she cut off contact with the camp for now, and she is sure that they won't target the same person, so he shouldn't worry. 005 adds that even though she told him this, she still hates him. He betrayed the squadron and left, separating all of them. Some failed or died, leaving few left. She says that he forgot about them and went off to have a good time with his girlfriend. Ijin is a bit puzzled at her words, and says that the girl she saw him with is his sister. This surprises her even more. In the distance, the grandpa and Dayun spot Ijin talking with her. 005 finds herself in his home, as the grandpa has invited her to a meal. They all sit down at the table, and she doesn't know how to react. She wonders if it's okay to be here, when she was just going to kill Ijin. The grandpa asks why she isn't eating. Is the food perhaps not to her liking? She begins eating, and thinks about the food they used to eat in the battlefield, some type of bar. But sometimes, they wouldn't even be able to finish, as interruptions were common. She gets jolted back to reality by the grandpa saying that the food must be to her liking, as she finished her plates. The grandpa says that he heard she is Ijin's acquaintance. She wonders who that is but Ijin says that is his name. He explains to his grandpa that she didn't know his name, 
and she is someone he knew from when he lost his memories. The grandpa notes that they must have known each other for a long time. Ijin adds that when he woke up with no memories, she helped him and they spent a lot of time together. So back then, she was like family to him. This surprises the family, but 005 even more so. After the meal, they see her out, and the grandpa holds her arm. He thanks her for being with Ijin in his time of need, and because he thinks she is family, they think so too. He notes that she can come visit whenever she wants. 005 is again taken aback by this hospitality. Ijin escorts her out, and when they got close to the exit, she pushes him out with her foot. She asks why he brought her to his home. Does he not have a brain? Ijin notes that his grandpa invited her, not him. 005 gets serious and says that they are enemies, and she just escorted his enemy to the place where his family lives. Have his senses dulled, or has he forgotten the basics after gaining back his memories? Eugene says that he never thought of her as an enemy, so that's why he introduced her to his family. 005 stares at him and asks if he is going to repeat the nonsense he said to his family in order to hide her identity. Eugene looks back and says that he meant those things. She notes that her being family doesn't make sense. He notes that she's not the same as his real family, but to him, all the numbered are family. In situations where death is just around the corner, he can at least entrust his back to them. 005 stares in response, and Ejin tells her his real full name. You, Ejin. She tells him hers in exchange. Maya. Ejin gives her the phone he contacts 006 and tells her the instructions for it, as him and 032 will be wanting to talk with her. She stares at him one more time and smacks him in the face. 005 adds that she can't forgive him for betraying them. With that, she walks away. Dusik and his subordinate saw this spectacle and think that they shouldn't go to him right now, as he might be embarrassed. At his mansion, that person receives the news that 005 failed her mission, and Yongho is demanding to know why there haven't been any results yet. He notes that since Yongho overstepped his boundaries and that showed no results, he's getting desperate. He orders his subordinate to contact Yongho, as he will make moves by himself if they don't hurry. The subordinate asks what will happen if the plan to use Yongho to merge SW fails. That person notes that it would be a loss for SW. So if it fails, they will tear down SW from inside, so it will be better for them. In his office, Yongho gets the news that they found someone who can make the request he wished for. He sits silently for a second, causing his guard to ask if he's okay. Yongho says that Jiye has been going after his things and crossing the line wherever she can. She must be punished. He thinks that Iron must think he's in trouble if they are this slow with this request. But he will make sure they are mistaken, and it might be better for him, since Iron won't push him around. His face sours while he thinks of Jiye. He will take care of her, and then take over SW as a whole. That morning, Ijin sits down in a park with the lieutenant, who says that he came to see him before he heads back. He asks what happened with his comrade, and Ijin says that she went back. He also notes that he needn't worry about her, as she won't go after Chiya again. And she also mentioned that she doesn't know who made the requests, and she's probably not lying. The lieutenant says that he didn't come for that. They already talked on the phone about that, right? He just came to visit him. The lieutenant gets up, saying that now that he did that, he should leave. But before he does, he tells Ijin one last thing. He remembers why he returned, right? If he does, then he should live like someone his age would. With that, he leaves. Later, while working for Jiye, she says that the lieutenant went back this morning. Ijin notes that he met him briefly earlier. She notes that that must be why he left so early in the morning. Jiye adds that she told him she was fine numerous times, but he chose to stay by her side the entire time, even though he had nothing to worry about. The team leader's face grows dim for a second and she says that the lieutenant doesn't get time off very often, so he should have probably taken care of stuff he had to do. This makes Ijin think about the conversation he had with the team leader earlier, where it seems that Ijin suggested they keep the assassination attempt a secret. The team leader smiles and congratulates him on this. He says that the SW family has been harassed by potential kidnappings and threats, with Yuna and Jiye being kidnapped recently. He notes that it hasn't been that long since then, so news about her potential assassination would come as a big shock for Jiye. 
The team leader says that an assassination attempt is different from kidnapping and such. If she knew, she wouldn't be fine mentally. They were lucky that Team 1 managed to figure out that there was an assassin after her. They are also trying to figure out who it is, so they should be cautious for now. Eugene's thoughts get interrupted by Ji Ye, who asks why he didn't go to school today. Eugene sweats a bit and says that he just didn't want to go. This surprises her, and she smiles, saying that he sounds like a boy his age now. In an undisclosed location, 006 looks at a picture of Ji Ye and smiles. He tells 032 to contact Ijin, and he does so, instantly saying that he has a present for him. But 005 responds, asking what kind of crappy present they have for him. 032 jumps to the worst conclusion and thinks that she's done something to Ijin, but she swiftly tells him to shut up and hand the phone over to 006. 032 sheepishly does so. He picks up the phone and asks her if she's met Ijin. She confirms this and notes that he looks great for someone who's supposed to be dead. 006 laughs and says that he needs her to go meet Ijin. He says that she has the phone they contacted him with, so she has to. 005 smiles, saying that he's surely 006, otherwise he wouldn't be so annoying. He smiles. Later, while the group walk out of school, Yuna talks with Dayun about Ijin going overseas. She says that he went to meet some people from his past for at least a few days. Yuna sighs, saying that they won't be able to see him and he also doesn't answer calls. Ijin gets out of an airport, where 032 and 006 are waiting for him with a car. They arrive at the apartment, where 006 says that 032 has been looking into SW and dug around a bit. That's when they heard someone from SW is looking for an assassin, and when he faked his identity to take the offer, this is what came up. He was told to kill the woman in this picture, noting that she's one of the people Ijin guards. Ijin stares and asks who the client is. 006 pulls out three pictures of Yenko's guard, saying that at first they thought it was her. But after looking into it further, the real client is him. He shows two pictures of Yongho, and Ijin's face grows cold. 006 notes that there still is an undeniable proof it's him, and 005 is out right now to confirm this. He notes that the woman who requested this, the guard, is staying right next door. 032 notes that he got the files, and the target will arrive soon, so they should hurry up. 005 pulls out data from a laptop and closes it. Yongho's guard is sitting in an elevator, and when the doors open, she meets face to face with 005. They stare at each other for a few seconds, and then walk away. Ijin looks at all the pictures, and thinks of the SW owner. 032 notes that he find it. The next day, Yongho gets the news that Ijin wants meet with him. He says that they should let him in, as he wants to hear what he has to say. The guard does so, and when Ijin sits down, Yongho asks what brought him all the way here. That's when his phone suddenly rings, and it's a call from the owner. He gets right to the point, he says that he crossed the line. The owner says that he knows he ordered someone to kill Jie. Yongho tries to refute this at first, but the owner says that he has evidence. He orders Yongho to halt everything he is doing and come here this very instant. Yongho says that he doesn't want to. His face is the pure definition of desperate, and he says that he made all this, so it's his. If they try to take it by force, he will do anything in his power to resist. He will make sure SW breaks apart, and its worth will amount to nothing. He says that the evidence the owner has won't hold up in court, and if it gets out into the world it would do more damage to the company than him. So is that perhaps why he told him to come quietly? The owner frowns in silence and Yongho shouts that he will not go back, no matter what. Suddenly, the owner closes the call, leaving him to wonder how he got this information. Ijin speaks to the owner, who says that he should proceed with the plan. Bring in Yongho. Ijin gets up, and Yongho figures out why he is here. He laughs maniacally, wondering what the owner is thinking. What can a kid like him do? Did the owner perhaps send him because he thought he would follow with no issue? Ijin denies this, making Yongho think that he told Ijin to drag him away if necessary. He orders his guard to take Ijin away, and she tries to signal the bodyguards, but none of them respond, as they have been knocked out by 005, and 032 is taking care of surveillance. Yongho asks what happened. That's when Ijin says that there's no one left to answer. He has them cornered. The guard finally understands what's going on, and suddenly pulls out a gun on Ijin. 
Yong Ho asks why she's doing this, and she explains that it's not just a communication issue that they can't contact any of the bodyguards. That means that Ijin surely has allies. The door suddenly opens, and 005 comes in. The guard tries to shoot, but Ijin covers for her, and together, they confuse the guard enough, allowing 005 to close the gap and disarm her. They trade blows, until the guard spots that she has the same eyes as the lady she met in that place. 005 smacks her, and she tries to retaliate. But with a few more attacks, she knocks her clean out. Yong Ho orders them not to move, as he has the gun now. He says that he's not going back to Korea, no matter what, and they should tell the owner this. He's going to go all the way if this happens again, so they shouldn't even think of coming back. He grits his teeth, thinking that the owner won't just forget about this. He will surely lock him away somewhere, cut off from the world. His hand shakes, and thinks that all of this, SW could have been his. Ijin starts to approach slowly, and Yong Ho warns him again. He continues to walk, and Yong Ho points the gun straight at him. That's when Ijin closes the gap and punches him straight in the face. He also punts his face in a table. The maniac is finally taken out. 005 finds it ridiculous that they went in unarmed against armed people. Ijin says that it's because of who Yong Ho is, so they couldn't help it. 006 and 032 come in and say that they've erased all traces of the being in the building. 006 says it's strange that they are all working together again, and everyone stares. Ijin notes that he's heading back. That day, Yong Ho's father is on his knees, asking the owner for forgiveness. The owner says that he can't just overlook this, as he crossed a line he shouldn't have. The father says that isn't what he wants. He notes that Yong Ho is his child, but so is Jie. To think that he would try to kill family, if the owner won't punish him, he would. He notes that the reason he came here was to beg for forgiveness, for being unable to control his own children. The owner sighs and says that he couldn't have anyway, and Yong Ho left home a long time ago. The father apologizes again and again, but his real feelings are anger toward Yong Ho. Ijin arrives back home, where his family greets him warmly. Dayun says that they should go eat, as the grandpa has made a lot of food since he was coming back today. He gets embarrassed, and Ijin stares at them. He thinks of all the things that happened, and with this sight before him, he can't help but smile. Later that day, the father tells Chie to break off the engagement with the lieutenant. She asks what this is about, and he says that they don't need the power of a militarist family anymore. SW overcame the most difficult phase regarding the military industry. Chie asks what will happen if they just break off the engagement like that. The father says that he already thought of something, and he also prepared a better family for her. Jia asks if it's because of Yongho, and the father sits silently. She heard that Yongho was retiring, and she also can't pinpoint his location. So what's going on? The father says that he crossed a line he shouldn't have, and she shouldn't concern herself with it. Jia says that they can't just break off the engagement one-sidedly like this. The father gets serious, saying that Yongho left a space that is too big. So, in order to protect the company, they need to use extreme measures. He gets up to leave and says that he will go ahead with this plan. Ijin, who was guarding the door, bows down as he leaves, but not without staring with a cold expression. The father thinks that he's glad the owner's anger is directed at Yong Ho. He was also getting on his nerves since he was trying to come after his position. He thinks that he can settle everything if he can just control Ji Ye. It seems that this man is rotten to the core. Ji Ye thinks about all the memories she made with the lieutenant and looks down, wondering what to do. The team leader comes in and says that they need to go. Ji Ye also orders him to find out where Yong Ho is, without anyone knowing. While in the car, she thinks more about this. To break off the engagement, it's true that all of this is a business deal in a sense. But why does she feel uncomfortable with this? She asks Ijin what kind of person the lieutenant is. Ijin says that he is a really good person and the person he trusts the most. This surprises her and she says that he must be really good person for a cold person like Ijin to say that. She notes that they are ditching their plans for today, much to Ijin's and the team leader's surprise. They go to the army camp where the lieutenant is, and the boys there chat with Ijin. They all note that the lieutenant's fiancé is really pretty, but also grow a bit jealous as they don't have lovers yet. Inside, the lieutenant asks what brought her here. Chiya says that he also visited her workplace before, so she thought to return the favor. 
She asks if he's uncomfortable with her being here, but he denies this fully. She notes that it took longer to get here than she anticipated, and she just wanted to see him for a little while. The lieutenant asks if she's worried about something, as she's different than usual. He says that he doesn't know what's going on, but he wouldn't be able to help her. He says that he's not really well off, and he can't touch any of the land his family owns. He notes that he doesn't know society well because he's a soldier, so he won't be able to help her. However, no matter what happens, he will be by her side. Even if her family turns their backs on her, he will always be there. This takes Chiya by surprise, and she stares silently. She thanks him for this, and also says that she would like for him to do something. She asks him to break off the engagement, leaving the lieutenant dumbfounded at her request. While driving away, the mood inside the car seems sour. Jia thinks about the lieutenant's reaction. He was shocked at first and looked down, but in the end, he smiled and agreed. She asked him if he's not going to ask why. He says that if she personally requested it, there must be a reason. He also notes that he will announce the annulment first, as if she were the one to do it, it would put her in a tight spot. She looks out the car window, and while grabbing her phone, thinks that the lieutenant isn't someone who fits in this world. But she brought it up to him in order for her father not to do anything strange. She calls him and tells him what happened with the lieutenant. Ijin is surprised when he hears this. Her father says that they were supposed to get them to break off the engagement. What is she going to do now? She says that's exactly why she did it because she knew he would put the blame on the lieutenant. Her father's face frowns, but he asks her what she told him. She says that she just told him herself. He congratulates her, and with that, they close the call. But she notes that something is suspicious. Why did he congratulate her? She orders the team leader to send the file on Secretary Choi to Ijin. She looks at him, and they stare at each other. In his office, her father orders Secretary Choi to proceed with the plan. At the military base, the lieutenant looks into the sky and thinks of Jie, clearly depressed. Some guys wonder what happened for him to be like this. Perhaps he got dumped. Later that day, he goes to drown his sorrow in some whiskey. He thinks of the first time they met, when he thought that the photo of her might have been edited. But when he saw her, he was stunned by her beauty. He chugs another glass. And when he's pouring himself another one, a woman sits next to him, asking if he would like to drink with her. He notes that he would like to be by himself. That's when she looks behind her, and in that second, a commotion occurs. This gives her the opportunity to drug his drink. With that, she leaves. Just when he's about to drink again, Ijin stops him, saying that he drank a lot. The lieutenant thinks for a second and agrees. He can't look like this in front of everyone just because he got dumped. They get up, and Ijin escorts him to a car where he passes out. Ijin thinks of what Jie said about Secretary Choi. He is her father's, Shin Seongho's closest confidant. And knowing her father, he will most likely do something in the following days. So she asks Ijin to keep an eye on Choi. It seems that her hunch was right, as a pack of goons, accompanied by the girl from before, come up to the car. Later, he calls Jie and tells her that they were about to drug the lieutenant and make him a criminal. She asks to stay next to the lieutenant, just in case. Ijin says that he will, while standing between defeated enemies. At the SW building, Jie continues to tap her finger on the table, clearly restless at the situation. She knew that her father would make a move, but isn't this too much? The team leader assures her that everything is fine. The lieutenant is with Ijin, after all. Suddenly, the lieutenant calls. She wonders what this is about. Wasn't he already asleep? She answers, and the lieutenant screams that he loved her before passing out again. Jia is extremely confused, and the team leader just clears his throat. Choi calls Syungo and says that the mission was a failure, because someone who knew the lieutenant stepped in. He apologizes, saying that the job was rushed, and it won't happen again. Syungo warns him, this is the last chance he has, so he better not mess up, or else. With that, Choi closes the call and immediately turns his attention to the criminals he hired. The leader apologizes, saying that he left the job to his men, but that's when Choi suddenly slaps him. He asks them, does he look like a pushover now? Just because he gave some low-rate criminals a few jobs? He screams, 
If he gives them a task, they must complete it, no matter what. Siungko puts the phone down and thinks that he can't rely on anyone these days. Suddenly, Chiye appears, as she has something to say. She asks when he's going to go back, and he says that he needs to do some things here. But why ask? She says that she would like for him to leave as soon as possible. He must stop what he is doing and just leave. Xiongo puts on a fake expression, asking why she's doing this. Wasn't what Yongho did enough? She notes that he doesn't need to look after them anymore. They are not children after all. He asks what kind of father doesn't worry because of his children, but she retorts, saying that he's more worried about the management team not listening to his orders than his children's affairs. His children must be following him blindly, right? He says that it must be so, as one must become cold in order to run such a large business. There are too many responsibilities, no matter what. He says that's exactly why she shouldn't become attached. She says that she isn't doing this out of attachment, but instead because it seems like he's doing harm to the company. She notes that he's underestimating this family a lot. Perhaps he was overseas for too long? He laughs, saying that she's still too young. He understands what she is saying but has no intention of even listening. This is why she needs experience. He already knows that she excels when handling the business side of things. But that's not all a successful person needs. He notes that she has exceptional skill compared to others her age. And because she is a part of SW, she also has more power. But until now, she hasn't faced anyone with more power and influence than her. Why would he, the vice president of SW, listen to a word she said? He smiles, saying that talking won't do anything. Actions must be taken in order to get what you want. Suddenly her phone rings and she answers. It's Ijin, who says that the job's done, and he also obtained photo evidence. Jiye congratulates him, and they close the call. It seems that Ijin has taken out every criminal Choi hired, including him. Jiye tells her father that he should visit Choi at the hospital, as it seems he got hurt. Isn't he his treasured person? Seungho's smile turns upside down and notes that she's grown. She gets up, saying that she's not young anymore, so he can't decide things for her. He wishes him a safe flight back, as she is too busy to see him off. The next day, the lieutenant wakes up, pretty hungover. Suddenly the doorbell rings, and when he opens the door, he finds Ji Ye, who asks if he's been sleeping this whole time. She notes that she couldn't sleep a wink because of work, but that doesn't matter now. They should go out and eat something, as she hasn't eaten at all. The lieutenant looks at her and accepts the offer. While sleeping, Ijin remembers the time he was sick and someone tried to take advantage of that. But even through his sickness, he managed to defend himself and his possessions. Mad Dog, who saw all of it, congratulates him, saying that if he doesn't want to end up in a grave, he can't show his weakness to anyone, not even allies. He wakes up, panting and with a discoloration in his eyes. At school, Dayun asks if he's okay, as he looks quite tired. Eugene says that he's fine, and they should hurry to class. When class is finished, Lee invites him to a street food spot. But Eugene isn't even hearing them, and it seems that his condition has worsened. Yuna comes up and puts her hand on his forehead. This surprises him, and he tightly clenches her arm. She notes that he's hurting her, and he lets go, apologizing. She notes that he has a fever, and this surprised the whole group. A while later, they bring all sorts of food, saying that he has to eat well. Ijin just stares at the food. While training, the team members note that Ijin isn't in the best condition. One gives him a bottle of water and tells the team leader that Ijin isn't feeling well. He takes a look at him, and it's obvious that something is wrong with him. He tells Ijin to go home early, but he insists that he's fine. Later, while bodyguarding for Jiye, she urges him to go home early, as he obviously doesn't look well. Ijin once again insists that he's fine. Jiye orders the team leader to call Dr. Kong and tell her that they are going there. While there, the doctor notes that he has a 40-degree fever, or 104 Fahrenheit. She notes that he doesn't have any other problems, and just needs rest and some medicine. They drive him home, and Jiye says that he should get some rest, now, and he shouldn't even think of working until he's better. With that, they drive away. Ijin stares at the medicine, and sighs. He goes inside, where his family has already gotten the call that he's not feeling well. Eugene is taken back by this and says that he just visited the hospital, and they said that if he gets some rest, everything will be fine. He walks further inside, where he sees lots of fruit on the table. 
Dayun says that the grandpa bought all of those when he heard that he was sick. Ijin goes inside to change his clothes, but even after a while, he doesn't come out. Dayun knocks at the door, but there's no response. She goes inside and sees that he's sleeping soundly. The grandpa says that they should let him get some well-deserved rest, and they do so. The next day, Ijin has some noodles with Dusik, who asks if he's better, as he heard of the fever he got. Ijin says that it was just a small fever, but at how high it was, it can't be called small, Dusik notes. He says that he shouldn't push himself, as he's still a kid. Ijin says that he isn't, but the fever wasn't to the point where he was conscious but couldn't move. Dusik doesn't know what to make of this, and just continues eating. While leaving, his subordinate says that the politician from before is still waiting to make a move. He notes that the politician is still the same as ever. His children can be considered criminals, and he got kicked out of most political circles, but still wants revenge. Dusik notes that they still have their wealth, and even though the evidence against them was crystal clear, it was covered up. He also notes that since they are working with SW, he wouldn't dare do anything rash. At their house, the politician's family begins talking. The father says that they should go to America and not worry about anything. They should relax and adjust to that lifestyle. Kim says that they will, but Heejin is having none of it. She thinks that it's all because of Dayun and her brother. The father says that they just need to stay there for a few years, and with that, he excuses them. They leave, and his wife asks if he's just going to leave the situation like this. He says that he already tried, but since it's come to this, the higher-ups are also being careful. The wife screams at him, is he really just going to give up? The lives of their children were ruined. The father speaks, giving up, up until now, he has never given up on something he wanted. Later that day, Ijin speaks with Dayun over the phone. Ijin wants to go to the supermarket with her, but she says that's fine, as she's only buying stuff for tonight's dinner and the grandpa's lunch. She also asks if he wants to eat anything, but he says that he's fine with anything. With that, Ijin closes the call with a smile. Suddenly, a hidden number calls. Ijin picks up, and the caller says that he's the politician, Kim Inbei. This makes Ijin think of all the things that happened. Inbei says that they had a deal, right? So why did he break it? Ijin notes that he was the one who broke it, but Inbei says that he did what he requested. He sent his kids abroad. So in exchange, he should have deleted the dirt he had on him. Ijin says that his children returning wasn't part of the deal, and Haijin also tried to harass his sister again. Inbei sighs and smiles, saying that he's probably so fearless because of his age, so he'll get straight to the point. The damage he caused is considerable. The loss of reputation is something a student like him can't ever imagine, and he also gave permanent scars to his children. Did he think that he could live peacefully after all this? He will now teach him that his decisions have consequences, and that the world isn't so easy. That night, Dusik goes out to have a smoke, but stops Ijin's grandpa and quickly hides it. The grandpa greets him and says that if he finished the food they gave him, he can always ask for more, as they eat the same thing every day. With that, he leaves, and from behind Dusik comes a bike that is going at high speeds. He notices that someone on the bike is holding a metal pipe and going straight for the grandpa. Dusik gets in front and punches them off the bike before they can do anything. He wonders who these guys are and why they were going after the grandpa. His phone suddenly rings and the subordinate says that something bad has happened. Inbai is not after them but after Ijin and his family. Dusik's expression grows sour. While walking home, Ijin thinks of the words Inbai told him. Dusik suddenly calls him and asks if anything has happened to him yet. Ijin looks back and spots a gang with motorcycles and bats behind him. He says that something is happening right now. Dusik says he'll call him again later and closes the call. Dusik orders Sayok to put three of their guys on the high schooler's house. He asks if Inbei would go that far, but Dusik says he definitely will, as he protected the grandpa from an attack earlier. With that, Sayok runs to tell the men. Dusik picks up his phone and calls Inbei. He asks what this sudden call is about, but Dusik gets straight to the point. What is he planning? Inbei tries to feign ignorance, but Dusik is having none of it, and calls him out. Inbei says that he can't do anything to him, so he's just taking care of the rest. Dusik asks why he's going after Ijin, especially his family, who have nothing to do with this. Inbei notes that due to Ijin, 
his family separated. Dusik smirks and says that Ejin wasn't the one who sent the dirt to the press, he was. So they should stop bothering the children and do things properly. Inbei says that he must have forgotten what kind of person he is. Dusik says that he doesn't think about those things, causing Inbei to scream at him. Siok comes back and reports that he told the men to stand by at Ijin's house. Dusik orders him to gather some men as quickly as he can. Sayok says that if he goes after Inbai, he won't be safe. Dusik says that he owes a debt to a guy who's much younger than him. Should he pay that debt back, as an adult? Sayok smiles and agrees. Ijin fights the goons that were after him, and easily takes most of them out. One wonders who this kid is in order to fight like this. But his thoughts get interrupted as Ijin rushes another guy, and with a swift blow to the neck, incapacitates him. The last guy tries to attack Ijin, but with one swift gut kick, he leaves him on the ground with the others. He makes his way home, and when he gets there, he spots a car parked near his house. Inside of it, Dusik's men all lays around, but that's when Ijin smashes the window and grabs one of them. He's ready to fight, but the guy explains that they work for Dusik. Ijin remembers that he saw them previously, and let's go. He asks what they are doing here, and they say that Dusik ordered them to stay around his sister and grandpa. While training, Sukju gets a call from Ijin. He asks what happened, and Ijin wants him to find out where Inbai lives. Now. Sukju asks why he's looking for him all of a sudden, but Ijin doesn't respond. It seems that he's ready to kill. While going to Inbei's residence, Dusik calls Ijin and asks if he has solved the situation. Ijin confirms this and Dusik also notes that he heard he met his people. He put them there because he recently had some issues with someone, so he's protecting his family, just in case. Dusik says that he'll take care of everything, so he shouldn't worry, as he will be sure to finish it for good this time. With that, they close the call. Sayok asks if it's okay to lie. This did happen because of Ijin's actions, after all. Dusik says that it's not his fault. It all started because of Inbei's stupid kids. Inside his house, a large man informs Inbei that Dusik is coming here to attack. Inbei is surprised that Dusik would leave his territory like that, and the man says that he must have gone crazy. The man adds that Inbei used him before, but to think he would betray him when he gave Dusik a golden opportunity. Inbei asks the man if he's confident in his abilities. The man says that this area is under his control, and while Dusik and his men do have skills, in this area, noting can top him. He will make sure this place becomes Dusik's untimely grave. His phone suddenly rings, and says that it's probably the men he sent after Ijin. Inbei urges him to respond, as he wants to find out what happened. He does so, and gets some shocking news. He closes the call, and apologizes to Inbei, saying that his men failed to hurt Ijin and his family. The man notes that after taking care of Dusik, he will personally go after Ijin. This makes Inbei think about Dusik's words from back then. The whole area is filled with guards, some even outside the estate. Ijin arrives and assesses the situation from a distance. He dashes to the side, and that's when a few men spot him, thinking that he's a delivery guy or something. Suddenly he parkers the wall and jumps over it. The men stare, shocked. Ijin lands and another group of men spot him. But before they could do anything, Ijin attacks first, taking two out instantly. More get out, and Ijin runs towards the house. A guy with a blade tries to defend, but gets knocked out in seconds. Inbai and the man notice the commotion outside, and the man think that it's probably Dusik, so they shouldn't worry. But Inbei notices that it sounds like the noises come from the inside, and that's when a man gets thrown through the door. They stare, shocked, and Inbei spots Ijin, who is now brandishing his iconic murderous aura. In another room, the mother is telling Heejin and Kim that they will go after Ijin too, so they should rest assured. Suddenly, a commotion can be heard outside, and they wonder what it is. Inbei notices that the man who just came in is none other than Ijin. He says that even though his face is covered, he's sure it's him. Ijin hears the men following him and tries to dash towards Inbei, but the man stops him and they exchange a few blows. He notes that he's a good fighter, even though he's so young. Ijin stares at Inbei and tries to get over the man once again. He punches him, but it doesn't seem to have an effect on him. Ijin continues to hit him until he missed, giving him the opportunity to punch him in the nose. The man tries to retaliate out of rage, but this leaves him open enough for Ijin to grab his arm. And with a twist and kick, he breaks it. Inbei just looks at this spectacle and thinks, Gu Kuang Suk, a man who controlled this district for well over 10 years, 
is having difficulties with a mere kid? Kuang looks at Ijin and notes that there's not a single ounce of hesitation in his movements. Is he really a high schooler? The other men come into the office and corner Ijin. They advance towards him, but slowly. One by one, Ijin takes them down. Kuang is furious and orders them to kill him this instant. The men try their best, but even with weapons, they hold no candle to Ijin's might and rage. The onslaught of people continues, and now armed with a knife, he cuts through them. The mother comes in tow with Heejin and Kim, and orders them to see what's going on. But when they look inside, the only thing they can express is shock, as the walls are filled with blood. They also spot Heejin, who continues to take out the men one by one, with no mercy. Inbei can only watch, and thinks that Dusik's words were true. His kids really messed with the wrong person. Dusik arrives, and helps put all the men down. He looks at Ijin and notes that his eyes are clearly different. What is he planning? Kuang tries to hit Dusik, but a subordinate comes and strikes him with a metal pipe. Dusik orders his subordinate to give him the weapon, and he does so. He slowly approaches and beats him, continuously. It gets to the point where Dusik seems like a demon. Siok thinks about the conversation they had in the car, where he said that if they mess with people like Inbai, he will surely take revenge. Dusik says that he knows and that's exactly why he plans to end it, with his own two hands. While watching the beating, Seok notes that Dusik is planning to put all the attention on himself. That's why he is being this brutal. He finishes the beating and pulls out a cigarette. That's when Ijin comes from behind and asks what he's doing. Dusik says that he can stay out of this from now on, but Ijin says that it's his business. Dusik says that it's also his, and he's constantly been having trouble with Inbei. He's been meaning to finish this, and the timing seemed good. Dusik assures him, Inbei will never come after his family or him ever again, so he should stay out of this. Ijin tries to retort, but Dusik says that his actions aren't the only way to protect his family. Him having no issues is another way. Ijin's eyes widen. Dusik pushes him away and says that he shouldn't worry anymore. He turns his attention to Inbei, who immediately asks what he wants. He pleads with Dusik, saying that he can give him property, money, anything he wishes for. Dusik says that he tricked him multiple times. How can he believe him now? Inbei sees him go grab the metal pipe and tries to plead and beg, but it falls on deaf ears. Dusik looms over him, and just when he's about to strike, the SW secretary comes in, much to everyone's surprise. The wife, thinking that he came here to help them, tries to explain what happened, but the secretary ignores her completely and goes directly to Ijin. He says that the president found out about this and promised that something like this will never happen again. He should trust in him and go home. Dusik pushes him, saying that he's a student. So why is he out so late? With that, Ijin leaves. Inbei asks if they are here because of that child, and the secretary says that he's misunderstanding something. He came here, true, but the president sent him, so he's the one who's acting right now. While walking home, Ijin gets a call from Dusik who tells him what happened after he left. The corruption that Inbei and his family committed, plus the corruption done by his wife's family, has all been sent to the prosecutor's office. He notes that it's that family, especially so since SW is also involved. Ijin thanks him, but Dusik says that there's no need, as SW were the ones who cleaned up everything in the end. Ijin looks down and thinks about what he said. Dusik says they should go eat some noodles sometimes, and with that, they close the call. He approaches his house, and that's when Ijin spots his grandpa. He approaches and asks what he's doing so late, and he says that he hasn't come home yet, and also wanted some fresh air. The grandpa suddenly apologizes, saying that he didn't want to burden him with this but couldn't help it. And he also thought it would have been annoying to call, so he didn't. Ijin stares, and says that he's out so late because he's worried, right? And if he ever wants to ask him something, he should call him comfortably, as he doesn't mind. The grandpa smiles, and they go inside, where Dayun is talking Ijin's ear off because he had his phone closed. The next day, Yuna is watching something about the game the group plays inside Chie's office. She gets a bit annoyed and asks if this is her playroom. Yuna says that it isn't, and Chia asks why she's here then. Yuna says that she just wanted to see her, and she's also sitting here quietly without bothering her. Chia smiles and asks if that's the real reason she came here, and Yuna blushes, confirming this. Chia says that she has to go to the conference room, causing Yuna to quickly say that she'll stay here for a little longer and leave. Chia says that Ijin is also done with work, 
causing Yuna to jump from her seat and directly to the door. Later, she, Ijin, and Sukju sit in the bus, accompanied by a group of guards. Ijin asks why, and Yuna says that she just wanted to go with him. She also hasn't been in a bus before. Ijin notes that it's hard to protect. Yuna says that she also wants to ride the subway one day, but Ijin says that it's even more dangerous, as there are too many things to consider. Yuna just smiles at him. Sukju spots her smile and can't help but do so as well. At the camp, 005 arrives and notes that there are fewer guards than expected. Did something really happen internally? She continues to walk and thinks about Ijin's words, that she's family to him. A guard tries to stop her, not knowing who she is, but she just punches him and makes her way inside. Mad Dog is surprised at her being here, and that's when she spots 002 sitting opposite to him. He says that it's been a long time since they've seen each other, and 005 asks what he's doing here. He says that's the same reason she is. He heard that the traitor, 001, is still alive and kicking. She asks what they're talking about, and 004 notes that he personally saw 001, even fighting against him. He says that his face was covered, but those movements and characteristics are surely 001. 005 asks Mad Dog what is going on, didn't 001 die? He says that he did, but 004 retorts instantly, is he saying that what he saw was wrong? 002 urges him to stop and asks Mad Dog again, is he positive that 001 died? He confirms this and wonders when and from where 002 found out. 005 thinks that Mad Dog is hiding the truth, and that's when 002 asks her opinion about 001 being alive. She says that if he is, they must kill him, as he is a traitor. 002 smiles and says that her reaction is the same as always. Suddenly the door opens and a man comes in, accompanied by a group of armed men. His name is Randolph, and he says that he just came to say hi. Mad Dog says that there's no need, so he should leave. Randolph says that the camp has this many issues because he keeps the numbered under his wing. He sits down next to 002 and says that he's treating them like he's their mother, so no wonder his children aren't listening. All the numbered there stare. Randolph adds that they are the ones that are doing all the work, but the numbered always take more credit, and furthermore, their pay is different too. Why is he treating them like this when they can't even use them properly? Mad Dog demands he stop blabbering. Randolph agrees and gets up, but that's when he pulls out a gun and points it at 002, saying that he will have to clean this place up. He tells the numbered that they shouldn't even think of coming back to the camp, as from this moment on, they are useless. 002 laughs, and in that second, he grabs the gun and puts a bullet in Randolph's head. 002 smirks. Mad Dog is clearly distraught at his actions, and the other men prepare to fire, but 004 pounces on them, and like a wild animal, he eliminates all of them with joy. Outside, two mercenaries have heard the commotion and want to go inside, but they barely enter the area and are shot down by a sniper. 002 asks Mad Dog if he's going to kill the others too, but he denies this, saying that he will somehow take care of it. 002 says farewell to 005 and leaves with 004. At home, Ejin gets a call from 006, who says that 002 probably knows that he is alive. He says that 004 recognized him when they saved 032 and told 002. 006 apologizes, saying that if he wasn't there, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Ejin says that there's no need to worry, as that was something that had to be done. With that, they close the call, and 032 asks what will happen now. 006 notes that the real problem is that 002 is suspicious. 032 wonders if things won't end up like with 005. Even if he is crazy, 002 always followed 001's orders. 006 says that it won't be the same, as 002 is the angriest at 001's betrayal. 032 says that he knows, as 002 killed the camp personnel after hearing about this. 006 adds that he taught 001 many things, and he had a huge influence on 001's combat style. But in the end, the number of 001 was given to the current one. 032 asks if that's related to the fuss that was caused by the people who followed 002 when receiving the numbers. 006 confirms this, saying that they did all that because they couldn't accept 001 as their leader. But 002 didn't cause any sort of trouble and acknowledged 001 as their leader. 
But that's exactly why 001 betraying them had a bigger impact on 002 than anyone else. 032 looks at him worrisomely and asks what they should do, as 001 was exposed because of them. 006 says that 001 looks so different, to the point that he doesn't seem like the same person. 032 notes that it's probably because he's living with his family now. But because of him, he got exposed while trying to save him. 006 says that he should stop, as nothing will change if he keeps worrying. What's done is done. And 001 also said that he wanted to do that. That's how much he means to him. It seems that these words reassure 032 a little. While sparring at training, one of the guards socks Ejin a good one, much to everyone's surprise. The training leader asks Ejin to come down, and the guy who punches him is extremely puzzled at how he got a punch in. He tells Ejin that it seems that he's thinking about something else during today's training. Ejin apologizes, and the training leader says that even though he's skilled than most, he's still a human. Even if he has so many successful missions, he can lose the person he's guarding out of carelessness, or even die. Ijin sits in silence, and the training leader says that he can go home and rest, as there's no point in training like this. Sukju asks what's wrong, but Ijin dodges the question. He sits in the changing room, and thinks about 006's words. He thinks of how in the camp it was survival of the fittest, and he was regularly outnumbered. But even so, he fought to preserve his life. When he's done fighting, someone comes up behind him, and Ijin instantly throws a punch but it was 002 causing him to retreat. 002 says that he didn't think he would survive this long. He must be crazy. But then again, one must be if they want to survive here. In an undisclosed location, 005 and 006 meet. He asks where 004 and 002 are, and 005 asks what he's going to do with this information. 006 says that he is going to repay his debt to Ejin. 005 wonders if he's going to get rid of them in his sake and 006 notes that Ejin just began his life as a normal human, he can't let anything disturb that again. 005 notes that they might be in a few different places, but says that it's too dangerous for him to go alone. 006 says that he knows, but he has one advantage over all of this. They think he is dead. The next morning, 005 laments telling 006 the information, but it seems that in a moment of weakness, when she taught about the meal she shared with his family, she told him, Suddenly, a knock comes from her door. She picks up a gun and looks through the peephole. It's 002, who says that he has something to tell her. He sits down and urges her to do the same. But 005 doesn't want to, and she demands he spill out what he wants to say already and leave. 002 smiles and agrees. He says that he has an interesting story to tell. 006 is still alive. Isn't this fun? 001, and now 006. People just keep rising from the dead. In another location, 006 is running from someone who keeps shooting, wondering how they knew he was going to come after them. He retaliates until there are no bullets left, and 004 comes in, saying that he was surprised to find him still alive and well. That's when 008 pounces on 006, but quickly get out of the restraint and retreats. 008 smiles. 006 wonders why they are together. While sleeping, Ejin thinks of the fights he went through with 002, who said that he won't last a year. This enrages Ejin, and he tries to attack again, but with a swift palm blow, he knocks him out. Ejin wakes up and gets out of his room. He sees the grandpa, who is getting ready for work, and asks if he can go to the bus station with him, as he is not sleepy anymore. They walk for a while, and the grandpa asks what he's thinking about. He asks, because it seems like he had a lot on his mind. Ejin asks how he knows, and the grandpa says that his face is telling him. He notes that Dayun worries about him as well. Ejin is surprised, as he was used to people calling him an emotionless person, an expressionless demon who walks this earth without any sort of attachment. The grandpa says that he doesn't know what he's thinking about, but if he needs something, he can just tell him. Ejin smiles and agrees. Back to 005's apartment, she says that 006 being alive has nothing to do with 002. He notes that it's probably related to 001, because after they went to Mad Dog to confirm 001 being alive, the dead 006 found their location. 005 thinks that 006 must have failed. 002 notes that it's interesting, as someone who was supposed to be dead appeared, 
despite the risks. That's why he's positive that 001 is alive. 005 asks why he's telling her all this, and 002 notes that she took special care of 001 and 006 so she should know. 005 says that he took care of 001 much more than her. Didn't he kill the people who initially claimed that 001 betrayed them? 002's face sours, and he gets up. He gets straight to the point. She knew 001 was alive, right? 005 instantly says no, but this doesn't stop him, demanding to know where 001 is. 005 pulls out a gun, saying that if he's done spewing words, he can leave. 002 asks if she's going to protect those traitors, and in the same second charges her from the side and hits her. She swiftly gets up, just in time to block a knee attack. They continue to fight, but seem evenly matched. They both retreat and stare at each other. 002 sighs and says that they should stop here for today. 005 doesn't want to let him go, but that's when a laser gets pointed at her, a sniper from the outside. While leaving, 002 notes that it would be in her interest to tell him where 001 is. In the warehouse, 006 continues to fight 008. 004 notes that his skills have surely improved, as he lasted quite a while fighting 008. 006 smiles and says that if he were fighting him, he would have defeated him already. This touches a nerve, and 004 notes that if it wasn't for 002's orders, he would have been dead. 006 mocks him once again, saying that he's still 002's lapdog even after all this time. This pushes 004 to the brink of his patience, and he charges in with a knife. He stabs 006, saying that he always wanted to take his life with his own hands. In their apartment, 032 bites his nails constantly, clearly distraught at 006's silence. That's when their alarm rings, and he looks at the cameras, but sees Ejin coming up the stairs. He gets inside and says that he couldn't make contact, and came here. Ejin asks where 006 is, and 032 tries to dodge the question, but Ejin demands he talk, as he is unable to contact him after their last conversation, and his expressions are different than usual. 032 says that he can't get in contact with him as well. Ejin asks how long it has been since the last contact, and 032 says that it's about three days. His phone suddenly rings, and he takes no time in answering it. 005 tells him directly, 006 got caught. Ejin hears this, and his expression turns serious. In the warehouse, they tie 006 to a chair and 002 says that he didn't think he would meet a dead person like this. 006 agrees, but also finds it strange that so many numbered are gathered here. He adds that if they had a reunion, they should have invited him. 004 punches him, but 006 just smiles, saying that it doesn't make sense to leave people out, right? This peeves 004, but 002 orders him to stop. He says that he sure hasn't changed, but if he was planning to fake his death, he shouldn't have shown his face around here, at least for his brother's sake. But he surely acted because of 001. 006 laughs and asks why he's bringing up a dead person. He notes that he and 005 are the same in the way they are trying to protect 001. 002 tries to leave, but 004 asks if they are going to just leave him alive. Even though there's a rule for the numbered to never kill each other, this bastard tricked everyone. 002 says that they will leave him alive, as 001 will surely come for him. And it seems so, as outside, 001 looks at the building through the binoculars. 005 notes that this is crazy. 002 is waiting for him, and is surely using 006 as bait. 032 says that 006 wouldn't want this either, as all he wanted to do was repay the debt and knew the risks of coming here. So if Ijin puts himself in danger, it would all be for nothing. They should just go back. Ejin notes their defeated expressions, puts his gun down, and unmasks himself. With that, he slowly walks towards the building. He goes inside and comes face to face with everyone. 002 smiles. He approaches and says he gives off the same aura, but he got bigger. Ejin says that he came for 006. If they had business with him, they could have just settled it quickly. 004 points a gun at him, but 002 gets in front, saying that he will handle this. He continues to approach him, saying that he was sad when he heard that he had died, as he wanted to kill him. They stand inches away from each other, 
and 002 says that he should see how much he improved. They exchange blows, but are perfectly matched, even inflicting the same wound on each other. It seems that this fight won't end without one of them being put down. 002 notes that even though he doesn't want to think about it, this reminds him of the old days, where they were together at all times. He notes that even though they weren't loyal to each other, they still had a sense of kinship from surviving that hell. There was only one silent rule, to never betray each other, but he broke it and betrayed them, their one and only leader. He charges in, and they exchange blows. 002 hits Ejin, but he does the same, and with a knee kick, he seems to be at an advantage. 002 retreats, and they stare at each other. 004 watches this, and thinks that Ejin's skills have improved. 002 says that for the five years he was gone, he wasn't fooling around. They both pull out a knife and engage in a dance of blades. They cut each other, but no winner seems to be in sight yet. 004 watches in horror. How can one's knife skills improve so much? Has he trained under a professional all this time? Another numbered suddenly notes Mercenary Jin. 004 says that he can't be, as that guy doesn't stray from his territory. Is he saying 001 is Jin? The numbered guy says that he's only gotten a glance at him, and he was wearing a mask, so he can't be sure. But there's a feeling in the air. 002 stares at Ejin, and asks if he betrayed them and did mercenary work. Ejin stays silent for a second, and then says that his memories have started to come back. This surprises everyone, including 002. Suddenly, someone from the radio says that 005 and 032 are approaching and are telling him not to shoot. They rush into the warehouse and say that they have enemies. 004 demands to know what their blabbering is about, but it seems like their words were true, as the person on the radio says that armed forces are surrounding this place. He identified more than 50 of them, and they are 300 miles away. In the distance, highly geared men approach. They all get ready, with 006 being untied and 005 giving Ejin his equipment. He and 002 give each other a glare. In the camp, Mad Dog gets the news that they are approaching the targets, and they have yet to respond. He says that they must kill them all. Nobody can escape. It seems like he was the one who ordered the killing of the numbered. Outside, it seems like the squadron is back for one last job. With that, they get on the move. 032 looks from above with a drone, and is waiting on the moment where he can tell everyone to strike. They all wait, until 032 confirms that they can shoot. The spray of bullets begins, and the mercenaries can't make heads or tails of where the bullets are coming from. One by one, they all get killed, with the help of the sniper, 016. The squadron continues to fire, but 006 suddenly gets caught in a bad spot. 005 saves him, however, and he thanks her with a wave. 002 continues to clear out two more, until he sees Ejin, who signals to him they should go for a nearby group. They do so, and together, they take out most of them. When the coast is clear of enemies, they immediately point guns at each other, except 002 and Ejin. 005 asks 032 if he's located the sniper, and he confirms this, noting that Ejin is safe from his view. 002 notes that this isn't the end. He will surely make him pay for betraying them. With that, they leave, and 006 wishes them a good life and not to see each other ever again. 004 flips him off, but 008 waves. It seems that our group has survived to see another day. Back at the camp, Mad Dog gets the news that the attempt at the numbered lives has failed. He gets furious and demands to know how they failed in their advantageous ambush. Back at the apartment, 006 notes that they shouldn't have come. 005 gets a bit furious at his comment. He also looks at Ejin and says that he has a debt to pay him once again. Eugene says that he did only what he needed to do. 006 looks up at the ceiling and notes that they managed to survive. 005 smiles and approves. Back at home, Ejin thinks of 002's words. Suddenly, Dayun comes inside and asks if he had a good time with his old friends. He says yes. She notes that it must be nice to see friends after such a long time, causing his eyes to widen. Dayun wonders what that is about, but Ejin smiles and says it's nothing. The next day while school ends, Yung-chan speaks to Ijin and asks if he and Sukju are going to be SW bodyguards. 
Ijin says that he isn't sure. Yung Chan notes that he's jealous of people who know what they want to do in the future. The group comes up to them and Yuna asks if he's going to cram school once again. He gets up and confirms this, so they should go have fun. He walks away, and Ju notes that he's been studying very hard recently because his grades dropped. Yuna says that it's a shame, as she's been losing recently because he's not playing. Lee gets mad and says that it's because she can't use anything, not because of Yung Chan. She notes that he he misses his ultimates sometimes too, and they get into a staring contest. Sukju notes that Yung Chan has seemed anxious recently, but it's the time to be anxious. Ijin thinks of what he said before leaving and looks out the window. Yuna asks if he's going to come play, but he says that he's going to his grandpa's workplace with Dayun. While walking with her, Dayun notes that Young Chan hasn't been with them recently, and it's probably because of his grades. She asks if Lee and Ju are all right, as they should be thinking about stuff like that too. Ijin says that Ju will inherit his father's company, and Lee said that he will think about it slowly. Dayun notes that it's like him to say that, and Ijin says that his Lee's grandfather is the CEO of Kihyun Automotive, surprising Dayun. She notes that she didn't know, as he doesn't dress like a rich person. Ijin asks what she wants to do. They look at each other, and Dayun says that she wants to work as soon as she graduates, anything with a high salary. She adds that she wants the grandpa to rest. He's been working without rest because of her, so she wants to relieve him of this duty as soon as possible. Ijin asks if she talked with him about this, and she says that she did, but he got angry. He said that he couldn't forgive her if she was working for him and not doing what she really wanted to do. She notes that was the first time he's gotten angry at her. Ijin says that she should think about it slowly. Since she has him now, she can take it slow and think about what she wants to do. Dayun smiles and thanks him. That's when they see Grandpa and they have a meal with him. They leave, and one of his co-workers says that he raised his grandchildren well, as most kids don't listen to anything their grandpas say nowadays. He notes that it seems like he needs to let them go from soon, and he'll probably feel upset when they become adults and leave. This leaves the grandpa at a loss for words, and while walking home, he thinks that those words are true. Ijin is an adult now, and Dayun is not far behind. He sits and looks in the distance, noting that time sure flies by. He gets inside the house, and Ijin comes out to greet him. The grandpa pulls on the handle to his door, but stops, and asks Ijin how he wants to live his life. Ijin is surprised at first, and the grandpa says that he's basically asking what his dream is, but he's not good with words and all that. Ijin says that his dream has already been achieved. His dream is to continue living like he is now, with family. The grandpa is surprised at this answer, and smiles gently. At the camp, Everything seems to be in flames and bodies litter the ground. 004 tells 002 that Mad Dog isn't here. He already left. 002's eyes are cold and he's smeared with the blood of his enemies. At his abode, that man gets the news that the numbered annihilated the camp and only Mad Dog was able to escape. That man asks what was the cause of such a thing and his subordinate says that Mad Dog tried to kill the numbered, but the plan backfired. That man sighs, and orders his subordinate to send this information to anyone who has a grudge against Mad Dog, but the subordinate says that he already did. That man congratulates him, and says that until this all blows over, they won't even look at Mad Dog. If they fail, things will become troublesome. In an undisclosed location, Mad Dog fights for his life, as multiple assassins have come to take it. He barely manages to survive the encounter, but not without any injury. He looks at himself in the mirror and shoots it out of rage. He is furious, and thinks that all of this is because of 001. If he hadn't betrayed them, none of this would have happened. While exercising at home, Ijin gets a message from Yuna, who wants him to come to the nearby convenience store. He approaches it, and Yuna spots him and waves. When he's there, she urges him to sit down, as she brought the stuff he usually eats. Ijin asks what's wrong, and Yuna says that she just wanted to talk with him. She smiles and says that she thinks the guys are worried about what to do with their futures. At least Yongchan is. He also said that he's not playing games from now on, probably because his grades dropped. She notes that everyone was surprised to hear that, as he had all the makings of a pro gamer. Sukju says that he's surprised as well, as Yongchan got told to do a test by an actual pro gamer. This makes Ijin thinks about earlier today. Yuna says that he'll work for SW Security, right? 
Ejin says that he hasn't decided yet, but before she could respond, the team leader comes up behind them and says that he should. Sukju encourages this, saying that everyone in SW security thinks the same. Ejin just stares. After a while, he and Yuna walk towards his house, as she wanted to walk for a bit. He asks her what she wants to do, and she says that she's not sure. But right now, her objective is to live diligently. She notes that she likes it. She likes it a lot. With that, they look at each other. 005 gets the news that the camp was destroyed. From 006, who also says that Mad Dog fled. He adds that assassins are on the move to hunt him down as they speak. 032 notes that he was lucky to escape, but he will perish eventually. 006 agrees, saying that the decisions he made from the days of the numbered up until now caused all of this. But since the numbers were attacked and the camp is raised, those who hold grudges against him will not sit idly by. 006 says that even so, Mad Dog isn't the type to die this easily, and 005 agrees. The next day, while sitting in Chiye's office, Yuna thinks about what she did last night, thinking that she wanted to say something else. Chiye asks what she's doing, as she's visiting whenever she pleases. Is she perhaps interfering with her work? Yuna apologizes and leaves, wondering if Ijin finished his training yet. Chiye stares at her, knowing who she was thinking about. Later, while guarding her, Ijin's phone buzzes, and she says that she already allowed him to check. He does so, and it's a message from Dayun saying that they should go buy some apples after work, as their grandpa wanted some. Suddenly, Chiya asks him if he has someone in his heart. Ijin asks what she means, and she says someone he likes or he wants to date. The team leader and driver keep their ears peeled for the answer, but Ijin says that he doesn't. This surprised the team leader. A blunt answer like this, an Ijin classic. Jia notes that he's in his prime, so he should at least have a girlfriend, but he refuses. She says that he's still young, so it would be a waste if he focused on work and studies only. Ijin notes that it's not a waste. He thinks of all the times he took the lives of people he didn't even know in order to survive, and his feelings have dulled. Ijin says that he doesn't know if he has the right to like anyone. This surprises her, the team leader even more so. Later, he goes with Dayun to the store for groceries and also buys the apples their grandpa wanted. While walking home, Dayun notes that Lee said he's going to make a hideout, and he will invite them once it's done. Ijin notes that he wasn't told anything, and Dayun laughs, saying that Lee's too silly. Ijin smiles, but in that second, his expression changes into one of horror. He looks to his right, and what seems like Mad Dog comes out of a corner. But it's worse, as 002 is staring at him from an alley. They stare at each other, and Dayun asks what's wrong. He tells her to go home first, but she wants to know what happened. Ijin demands that she do so quickly, and when she sees his face, she complies. They both get to the walkway and stop in the middle to talk. 002 notes that he's having a pretty fun life here. He adds that when he last saw him, he thought he was someone else because of how he acted, but it seems that he just returned to who he originally was, is it perhaps because that girl is his lover, or perhaps his family? Ejin stares at him, and asks if he came here to spill nonsense out of that mouth of his. Suddenly, Dusik comes from behind him, and asks why he's not crossing the road. Ejin stares at him, and he notes that he's never seen him with these eyes before. Dusik looks to the guy in front of Ejin, who has the same deadly glare. Ejin says that they should change locations, and 002 agrees. They go to a construction site where 002 notes that he's been living a lavish life here, with that girl and that man back there, while forgetting his past. Ijin asks how he found him in the first place, and thinks that it mustn't be any of the numbered, as they wouldn't say a word even if he tortured them. 002 says that he knows what he's thinking, but it's not that. He said some words from time to time when he arrived at the camp. He knew it was Korean, so he deduced that instead of simply hiding after getting back his memories, he would have gone back to where he lives. So with that, he slowly made his way here. Ejin asks why he came then. 002 notes that it's quite obvious to rid of a traitor with his own hands. Although he thinks this rule is useless because he has already abandoned it. But he must do it, as the rules are more important than anything. He throws Ejin a knife and says that as the person who taught the traitor, he will personally get rid of him. 
002 closes the gap, and a clash of blades starts until he uses Ijin's movements against himself and throws him away. 002 is puzzled at his lack of fighting spirit, and notes that if he keeps going like this, he will kill everyone around him, including the girl he was with. Something finally snaps in Ijin, and he maniacally approaches and slashes 002 all around. They continue to fight, but it seems like they are evenly matched, even in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 002 finds an opportunity to pin him down, but Ijin uses this opportunity to land a swift blow, and they both back away. 002 screams, saying that the numbered who went after him shouldn't have died. Although they are not good people, they survived that hellscape, and he led them. This makes Ijin think of the conversation with 005, where he said that he didn't kill them, but he still feels guilty because they died because they followed him so much. 002 pulls out a gun and demands they end this, as this is going on for too long. Ijin's eyes grow dim and notes that he wants one more favor. Leave the people around him alone. 002 asks why he's asking for a favor of that kind. Ijin says that the girl he saw him with is part of the family he met after 10 years, just like him. This comment takes 002 by surprise, and in that moment of hesitation, Dusik tackles him. He tries to wrestle the gun out of 002's hands. He tanks a face punch and wonders why there's a gun in this country. He succeeds in removing the weapon and goes for a punch, but 002 kicks him in the gut and leaves him on the ground. He looks at Ijin one last time and runs away. Dusik asks who that guy was to be fighting him. Ijin says that he's a colleague, much to Dusik's surprise, who wonders what kind of colleague cuts and shoots you. While chilling with a drink, Dusik thinks about Ijin. He knew that his life was different than others. But what kind of life did he lead to be at gunpoint by his own colleague? He asked Ijin if he was fine, and he confirms this. He also thanks him and walks away. Dusik sighs, noting that he's just a high schooler who loves his family very much. Ijin arrives home and Dayun hears it and goes to greet him. But when she sees him, she's quite shocked, as there's blood all over him. Ijin says that he fought with his friend. Dayun asks if it was bad, and he confirms this, leaving her to just stare at him. The grandpa asks if Ijin came home from his room, and Dayun pushes Ijin into his room as to hide the blood. He sits at the door, thinking of 002 and what he was about to do. At a pier, 002 thinks of Ijin and what he said about family. 004 asks where he went, but he doesn't answer, instead asking about Mad Dog. 004 notes that he's not in the country, so he probably isn't in complete hiding, since he has so many people after him. He notes that they should also look for 001 and the other numbered. 002 stops and notes that they will, after they take care of Mad Dog. The next day, while getting changed, Sukju asks if he's going to see his friend group today, as Lee said he created a hideout and told them to come there when they finish. Ijin finally remembers, and Sukju notes that he seems a little lost. Did something happen? He notes that he has something to think about, that's all. Sukju notes that including Yung Chan, everyone has a lot on their minds, although they are an exception since they have their futures as bodyguards set up. Ijin looks a bit puzzled at his comment, and a short silence falls. Sukju seems a little worried and asks Ijin if he's not going to join the team, as everyone thinks he's joining. Later, they arrive at the place Lee indicated, and they see Yung Chan in the same spot. Together, they head inside, where Yung Chan is taken by surprise at setup Lee put together, snacks included. He notes that he bought the best PCs on the market, so they should use them however they like. Now there's no need to go to the PC cafe anymore. Instead, they should just restock drinks and snacks occasionally. Yung Chan notes that the keyboards are the latest model too, and just when he's about to sit down, Lee points him to another seat. He notes that is his seat, and he set up some basic streaming equipment there. Lee says that he wanted to be a gaming YouTuber before, right? So he should try over there. The others are surprised that he wants to become a YouTuber, and they wonder why Lee bought him so much equipment. He says that it wasn't expensive, just some basic stuff. Yung Chan is surprised and tries to say that his situation isn't good, but Lee cuts him off saying that he shouldn't worry about it, and try when he has time. But if he wanted to do it, he should at least try, right? If he will start, he'll become his first subscriber. Sukju notes that he should stock the fridge with some sport drinks next time, and Ijin requests some onigiri, while Yuna something else. They all laugh, and Yung Chan just stares at them, 
He apologizes and says that he will head out for now, much to everyone's surprise. The next day, Yung Chan isn't present at school, making everyone worry for him, noting that his expression has been quite dim recently. Lee gives him a message, but the phone is in another room, as Yung Chan is taking care of his sick mother. She says that he should have gone to school, as she's just a bit tired. Yung Chan notes that he's worried, as fevers as high as hers don't come just from feeling tired. This is also the first time she closed the shop because of how sick she felt. His mother agrees, noting that she must be getting old, as her body isn't what it used to be. Yung Chan notes that it's because she works so hard trying to raise him by herself, and a short silence falls, until his mother says that he still has to go to cram school. She also asks how his studies are going, and Yung Chan says that he's doing his best, but not that well. The mother gets up and says that if he gets into university, she will be able to pay for his fees, so there's no need to worry. While at cram school, Yung Chan thinks about his future and notes that it would be better to get a job after graduation. He's jealous, as people who already have their futures set won't think like him, right? He walks home, and that's when he gets multiple messages from the group. He tries to reply, but that's when he bumps into someone. Before he could apologize, the guy bashes him for not looking where he's going. Yung Chan apologizes, and the bully's classmates smirk and laugh at him. Other people just look, until Lee and the gang pull up. Lee sees what's going on, and bumps hard into one of the bullies, saying that he should watch where he's going. This causes them to flee, and Lee turns his attention to Yung Chan, noting that they can't leave him alone. Ju notes that he's been leaving them on read recently, and Yung Chun says that he was just about to reply. While walking, Ju says that they heard his mother was sick, as they stop by the shop for a bit. Yung Chan notes that it was closed today, but Ju says differently. Lee suddenly apologizes for yesterday, thinking that he left because he told him to try streaming. He notes that he didn't mean to be noisy, he just wanted to see him try. Yung Chan says that it's fine, as he was actually really thankful. He didn't know he would do so much for him, but he isn't in a position to do it. He was also jealous of them, so he doesn't know why he ran away, but he felt like he couldn't stay. He notes that he wants to find a job quickly, to help ease his mom's burden. But as a streamer, nothing is certain, and it's also not a good job for a guy like him, who's an introvert. His grades have also recently dropped, so he's all over the place, but thanks Lee for thinking about him so deeply. They continue to walk while chatting and Ijin smiles from behind them. That night, Yung Chan's mother tells him that his friends came by earlier. She notes that the two boys were really handsome, and the girl was super pretty, to the point where she thought they were celebrities. She also heard that he's good at gaming, to the point where he would be able to go pro. She thinks of all the times he played at home, but gets serious, asking why he didn't tell her he wanted to do something. Is it because he was thinking of her? Yung Chan notes that she worked really hard to raise him, so he wanted to help. The mother pats him on the head and notes that he's a good kid. But if he wants to try something, he should, as it will be much harder when he's older. Yung Chan asks how people do everything they want to do. Her as well. She had something she wanted to do but couldn't. The mother says that she's doing it right now. Yung Chan asks if running a snack shop is her dream, but she says no. All she wanted is to raise him well, and she also wants to see him do what he wants. So why not give it a go? The next day, the group shows Ijin and Dayun to the door, as they are leaving the hideout. Yung Chan notes that he was surprised, as he thought Ijin would join the SW security team. Everyone agrees, including Sukju, who says that the seniors were also really upset. He also thought he would join due to the training and time spent together, so he's quite shocked as well. While walking home, Dayun asks Ijin if it's true he hasn't decided if he is going to work for SW or not. Ijin confirms this, and she says that he needs to decide on his career soon. He smiles and thinks of the hellish training he had to partake in, and on a particular day, two people died, leaving everyone in a sour mood. Ijin tells them that before they can think of surviving, they should be grateful they survived today instead. Dayun pulls him out of this memory and asks if it's because he wants to do something else. Ijin smiles and says no, leaving her quite puzzled. That man gets the news that President Andrea will be going to Korea. He notes that in the end, he will compare them with SW. His subordinate notes that when they heard the news, other companies were in an uproar, as if he signs a contract with SW, their position will surely grow. 
That man notes that if he's going to visit, this has already begun. It's damaging to them because the Beret family, which has been contracted to them all this time, is going elsewhere to test the waters. He thinks, how dare President Andrea do this? He clenches his fist and tells his subordinate to contact Forrest and tell him that he wants to see the skills of the guys he's been training. At the SW building, all the bodyguards get informed about what's going to happen. Andrea Bore, the head of the Bore family, is going to come here in order to inspect an SW subsidiary, the Defense Factory. This event will have a huge impact on the exportation of SW weapons, so they will be escorting them even though they will bring their own security team. The team leader changes the slide and says that Andrea's family members are more of a concern, as they will also be coming here due to a recent interest in the country. They will also escort them closely and discreetly. A few days later, Andrea and the owner exchange formalities. While Chia is taking care of his family, they say that they don't need to do any formalities, as they just want to spend some personal time here. The girl's eyes dart around in the corner of the room. The man says that he understands where SW is coming from, but his sister really wants to look around quietly so they don't need that many guards. They also have a guide and their own team of security guards, so there's no need to worry. Chia notes that this situation is quite troublesome, as she can't say she'll respect their decision. The sister suddenly tugs on his shirt and whispers something to him. He smiles and says that since this is an awkward position, how about they take that guard? He points to Ijin, and the sister blushes and looks away. Jia thinks that she knows why she wants Ijin to come with them. But this is good, as they can get reports from him while he's on duty. While in the car, the sister introduces herself to Ijin as Sophia, and asks for his name. He tells her, and she asks if he has any places he could recommend. Ijin says no, causing her to be surprised at the swift answer. He notes that he doesn't know many places because he just recently came here after living abroad. The brother says they should just go to the place they first decided on, and Sophia agrees. He also asks for Ijin's age, thinking that he's the same as Sophia. He says that he's 19, causing the brother to note his aptitude. He must be incredibly skilled to be a bodyguard at such an age. Truly amazing. Ijin notes that it's all thanks to SW for going easy on him. The brother notes that a security team like that would not have accepted him if they were leninant. He looks at Sophia, who is staring deeply at Ijin. They continue their day by sightseeing all around, and Sophia even offers Ijin some cotton candy. He is hesitant to take it at first, but her brother comes up and nods at him. So he picks it up, causing her to walk away happy. A while later, Ijin reports to Ji Ye, who already heard that it went quite well. President Bure also wanted to thank him personally, so it must have. Ijin looks down and thinks of Sophia. He notes that it did seem like she was having a fun time, even though it was just simple sightseeing. But he won't take all the credit, as the guide and the security team also knew of her needs and made preparations in advance. Jia and the team leader sweat a bit at his response, and she says that it didn't seem like that. At first, it was suspicious that Beret thanked them personally because his daughter did something like sightseeing, but after she heard what happened, she understood. It seems like Sophia keeps people aside from her family at a distance due to an incident of the past. If she tries to go outside, she gets extremely scared and paranoid, so she stays home. Even on vacation, she can't stop these anxiety attacks. So for her to move around this freely and comfortably, it's no wonder her father is thankful for him, that is. Ijin keeps his position firm saying that it's because of the preparations of the other people, not him. Chiye doesn't even try to explain anymore, and notes that he can leave. While walking away, he meets Sophia's brother, who says that he has a favor to ask. Can he be more chill during the two remaining days? Eugene apologizes and says that he wouldn't be able to do his job properly if he did that. The brother apologizes and says that he worded it strangely. He just wants Eugene to be a bit friendlier with Sophia, as she seems to like him quite a lot. He explains that in the past, she was kidnapped, and despite using every bit of the family's power, they couldn't find a trace of her. It got to the point where they just gave up. They did find her eventually, but she developed severe trauma and started hating people, so she finds it hard to approach people and hates leaving the house. He notes that he brought her here in hopes that it would help her heal, but to see her so comfortable is a first. 
so it's probably because of him. Ejin says that he can only give him the same answer. He just did his job. The brother smiles and says that he doesn't mind if he does what he did today. The next day, Sophia wakes up in a daze as she overslept quite a bit. She gets a message from her brother asking if she's going to come down. She worrisomely taps the phone and notes that she just woke up and will be down shortly. He is taken aback by this. Did she really sleep so much in a place other than home? He apologizes to Eugene, e saying that the schedule will be a bit late due to his sister oversleeping. Sophia comes down running and notes that besides sleeping well, she also had no nightmares. The brother says that she always dreams of that incident when she sleeps in another place, and she confirms this, but strangely, not this time. The brother is surprised and thinks of the many times she woke up screaming and shaking and how he comforted her every time. He smiles and says that this is great news. It was a good idea to come here then. Ejin comes next to her, and she awkwardly asks if he slept well, and he responds with a yes. While in the car, the brother asks Ejin what his family is like, who responds that he lives with his grandfather and little sister. Sophia inquires more about the sister, and he notes that she's 17. The brother says that they have something in common and also asks what his relationship with her is. He says it's good, and she takes care of him quite a bit. The brother says that she must be a nice sister, and Sophia also takes care of him a lot. She notes that he is the one who takes care of her. Later, the guide shows them around, and Sophia drags Ejin everywhere. They finish their schedule and try to go home, but that's when a van in front of the convoy swerves, and this causes all the cars to stop. From one of the vehicles, the guide takes out all of the bodyguards inside and looks like she's prepared to kill. That man gets the news that it started. Apparently Forrest sent someone who has a high evaluation within Forrest and is accompanied by other mercenaries. That person is surprised that they sent only one person and his subordinate notes that this is their first official job. So Forrest must have sent someone with admirable skill. That man says that Forrest is the place they prepared after the camp so now they can finally test if they are useful or not. The guide comes out of the vehicle, and Ejin notices instantly that she's holding a firearm. They give each other glares, and a few dozen people come up behind her. Ejin urges the siblings to get ready to move. The brother says that he shouldn't worry, as the security team will surely take care of this. Ejin says that there are only two bodyguards who are allowed to hold guns. One of them is in front, and he's the only one who is holding one now. Suddenly, the men behind the guide pull out their straps and begin dumping lead into the bodyguards. Ejin moves swiftly and gets the siblings out of the car. The guide notices and tries to aim at them, but doesn't get the opportunity to. With that, the hunt begins. They continue to run until Ejin urges them to go on without him. The siblings urge him to come with, but he says that he must do his job, making the brother think about his words previously. He says that they should go, as he is just protecting them. Sophia looks at him one last time and asks him to be careful. They leave, and that's when one of the mercenaries turns the corner and spots them. But before he can do anything, Ejin knocks him out in an instant. The guide and another mercenary pop out, and Ejin picks up the gun and dodges the oncoming fire. He returns it in earnest and manages to hit the mercenary. The guide says that he should stay here and fight this bodyguard while she goes after the target. He nods, and she runs away, but Ejin notices right away and before the mercenary can take aim, he moves out of the oncoming fire and into the street. He thinks that due to the time that has passed, they are about 200 meters from the VIP. He turns the corner and meets face to face with the guide, and they begin exchanging bullets with no bother, until he runs out of bullets and backs away. She spots that he doesn't have any left in the chamber and asks who he is to be shooting with no hesitation at such a young age. She was quite speechless when she saw how young he was for a bodyguard, but to also be able to shoot? Just who is he? Before Ejin can hit her with the just a normal high schooler line, he tricks her by looking in another direction. This causes her to panic, and this gives Ejin ample time to tackle her to the ground and remove the weapon. They engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and she's surprised he's skilled in this domain as well. She kicks him and thinks that she has the advantage, but that's when Ejin grabs her leg and hits her in the knee. They both back away, with the guide's leg clearly hurting. They both look at the gun, but she's the one to grab it first, so Ejin has no choice but to retreat. The guide thinks that she let her guard down like a dumbass. She thought he was just a kid getting some work experience, but it seems otherwise. She gets a call, 
and two other mercenaries come up behind her. So, they move to clear out the targets. Ijin continues to run until a shadowy figure catches his attention. It's the brother. He escorts him to where they were resting and says that they are waiting for backup, as Sophia can't run that much. Ijin looks at her, and the other bodyguard commends him for getting them off his trail. Ijin says that he was lucky, but the guard says that luck doesn't work on a trained enemy. The brother asks why the guide was one of the people who attacked them, and the guard says that the security team said they did thorough background checks, but it seems they missed this one. Ijin says that her true objective is to probably kidnap them both. This causes Sophia to shiver. If they really wanted them dead, the person impersonating the guide already had a lot of opportunities to do so. The guard is surprised he thought about all of that while fighting. Ijin asks how long until backup arrives, and the guard responds in a strange way, and says that in about 20 minutes, causing Ijin to stare at him with intent. The guide and the other mercenaries come out of the shadow, guns out and everything. Ijin suddenly dashes to somewhere, but instead of attacking them, he puts the guard they were with in a dangerous situation. The siblings are shocked at this, and the guard even more so. Ijin, seeing that he's resisting, cuts him a bit, causing the guard to put his hands up. The brother asks what caused him to do this, and Ijin explains that there are a lot of empty roads and buildings in this place. Isn't it strange that they found them so quickly? The guard says that he could have been followed for all he knows, but Ijin retorts and asks if a veteran bodyguard like himself wouldn't scout the area beforehand to see if they were followed. The guard says that he must be crazy to accuse him over such a flimsy reason. The brother says that it must be a misunderstanding, as Gilbert has been guarding them for three years. Eugene suddenly pulls out the gun from his holster and points it at his back. He notes that Gilbert here wasn't one of the people allowed with a gun, and there also wasn't time to secure one. The guide says that things weren't supposed to be interfered with by that useless pig, who's only good at spending money. Sophia looks at Gilbert and wonders if this is really the same person they had at their doorstep for three years. She just watches in horror, but that's when Ijin signals to her that he will attack and she should run away. Sophia knows this because Ijin has told her previously, the first time she was kidnapped. They give each other knowing looks. The guide smirks and asks what his objective is, as he doesn't seem like a normal bodyguard. That's when Ijin aims at them, and his eyes grow cold. The guide immediately gets out of the way and allows one of the mercenaries to be shot. In that second, Sophia steals herself and takes charge of running away with her brother. Ijin continues shooting, causing the guide to think that he must not be right in the head. How could he draw a gun when the person he's supposed to be protecting is there? Did he perhaps know they weren't after their lives? Ijin suddenly notices that the mercenary he shot is pulling out a gun, so they exchange fire, causing Gilbert's life to end giving Ijin ample time to run away. The guide chases after him with the remaining mercenary, and she smirks. That guy isn't a guard dog like any bodyguard. He is a hunter, just like her. The siblings make their way up, and Ijin follows suit. The brother notes that they have nowhere left to run, and Ijin urges them to hide in that corner for the time being. Sophia stops for a second and calls him by his mercenary name, Jin. Ijin looks at her and notes that now isn't the time, they should focus on getting out of here. This scene reminds her of the past, where he said a similar thing to her. A tear runs down across her face, and the brother asks if Ijin is the same mercenary who saved her previously. The mercenary makes his way up and sweeps the area, but Ijin takes him by surprise and incapacitates him with a shot to the leg and a hit to the face. That's when the guide slowly points a silenced firearm at his head. But before she can shoot, Ijin swiftly causes her to miss and disarms her. That's when she cuts his hand with a karambit, and he gets into position to fight. She notes that he must also be a hunter, but they should find out who is the better one. They begin fighting, and she seems to be on the winning side, until Ijin pulls out the small blade he had before and punctures her. She notes that it's the same weapon he used on Gilbert, and they continue to exchange blows, but he seems to be outclassing her in every way possible. How can this happen? Even in that forest, she was acknowledged by others and went through a lot of real battles, but is now pushed back by a mere child. She lunges out of frustration, giving Ijin the opportunity to strike her in the face. The cops can suddenly be heard, and she promises they will meet again. With that, she runs away, and the situation seems to be resolved. The next day, the brother thanks Ijin profusely for what he did. 
Ejin says that he just did what needed to be done, and the brother says that at first, he thought he was just a responsible person, but after hearing that story, he knows how heavy those words can be. He also notes that Gilbert got into gambling recently, so they approached him with a large sum to coax him, so he fell to the temptation. Sophia is the most shocked, as the person who protected her for three years betrayed her. She must be feeling really bad. He notes that due to this incident, they will have to go back today, but it's unfortunate, as they wanted to spend more time with him. The brother shakes a bit, and notes that Sophia was saved by a single person back then, an amazing achievement considering the situation. He and Sophia tried to find that person, but couldn't. Could he be the one who saved Sophia back then? Ejin looks at him and notes that he is mistaken. The brother looks around and smiles, taking this as his final answer. They go outside where Hiya meets with them one last time. But just as Sophia is about to get into the car, she rushes to hug Ejin tightly, surprising everyone there. She thanks him and calls him Jin, saying that she's glad he's doing well. He smiles and says the same. They look at each other one last time, and she gets into the car, leaving the other guards to stare with a tinge of jealousy at Ejin. The brother notes that he's glad they came to Korea, and Sophia agrees. With that, they leave. After everyone is dismissed from training, they come up to Ejin, and they talk about how Ejin shared his bonus with everyone on the team. They say that they would rather he come here after graduation, that's the only thing they really want. Ji Ye looks at him and says that he can't understand him. The president rewarded him separately for this incident. The team leader notes that he isn't ordinary, that's for sure. But he has a great influence on the whole team. After he joined, the teamwork has increased, and even if they raise the difficulty of training, everyone can keep up. Not only does he have skills, but he's also a good influence. Suddenly, something grabs Ji Ye's attention. Yuna, accompanied by Dayun, and Chi Ye stares at her for a while. She asks the team leader if she's Yi Jin's sister, and he confirms this. She greets the team and they do the same, saying that Yi Jin and her definitely look alike. He smiles gently, and Chi Ye sighs, thinking that he always makes that expression towards family. They go to the store, where Yi Jin catches a few looks from passers-by. Dayun asks him what he wants to eat, and he says anything is fine. She frowns and notes that he always says that, but it's hard for the person making the food. Ijin is surprised and says that he will cook in her place, as he knows how to. Dayun refuses and says that she will do it. She explains that the grandpa has raised her since she was a baby, and whenever she looked at him, she would feel like a burden more than anything. So after some thinking, the only thing she could do for him was cook. It wasn't that good at first, but it was helpful. She can never forget Grandpa's face when he first had her cooking. Ejin looks at her and smiles slightly, causing the other people in the store to blush at his reaction. Later, while training, he thinks of the talk he had with 006, who said that 002 and the others are still looking for Mad Dog, but they can't find a single trace of him. He and 032 tried to look it up themselves, but nothing came of it so they will surely contact him if they find out anything. He continues training and thinks of the time he ignored Mad Dog's orders as he sent him to kill innocent civilians. Mad Dog warned him, this is the first and last time he overlooks this. If he goes against his orders again, only death will await him. He stops training and notices that he is sweating quite a bit, so he takes his shirt off. That's when Dayun comes into the room with some apple slices and she notices he's shirtless so she swiftly tries to excuse herself. But when she takes another look, only horror can be read from her eyes, and she drops the fruit. She sees the countless scars Eugene has, and the only thing she can do is cover her mouth and ask why his body is like that. The grandpa, hearing some commotion, comes inside and is just as surprised when he sees Eugene. Dayun asks why he has so many scars. Eugene looks down and thinks that he can't tell her about all the grueling battles he went through. But the grandpa saves him by saying it must have been from the plane crash, and he confirms this. He comes next to him, shaking, and wonders how much pain he has gone through. He asks Ejin if they are fine now. Do they still hurt? He says that they don't, and grabs the grandpa's hands. The next day, while going to school, someone looks at him from above. That someone is none other than Mad Dog. At school, Lee invites Ejin to play some games, since he doesn't have any training today. 
He apologizes and says that he has to go see his grandpa today. Lee scratches his head and notes that because of Yung Chan, they've played so much recently that he just wanted to play comfortably, as he wanted to record some videos. Yung Chan notes that what he says is not that funny, and he can only play, so he was thinking of creating a persona or something. Yuna notes that it's a good plan, but he's just beginning, so he should try different things. Perhaps put Lee next to him, as he talks quite a lot. Lee notes that he should also play with her, as she will surely destroy the game. But even so, she's related to SW, so she's bound to bring in some views. Ijin looks at their squabbling and smiles. Later, he waits for Dayun at the school gates, and when she arrives, they make their way to the grandpa. But on the other side of the road, Mad Dog stares intently at Dayun. Ijin somehow notices and looks in that direction, but finds nothing. Dayun saw that he turned his head fast and asks if everything is fine, so he confirms it. At the grandpa's workplace, his co-workers commend his grandchildren for coming to eat with him, as not even children do that nowadays. But Mad Dog is also there, listening carefully. While having some food, Dayun says that her classmates keep asking for Ijin's phone number. This causes grandpa to ask if she has someone she likes. She blushes and denies it. Ijin smiles, but his senses tingle again, and when he looks in that direction, nothing is there. While walking away, Mad Dog thinks of 001, when they first brought him to the camp, and he barely managed to survive training. That guy, who survived so much in that hell zone, is entirely weak now, but he can still give him the worst pain ever. Later, while chilling at the house, Dayun talks about how much Grandpa enjoyed the food. Ijin asks if it's not tiring, but she says that thinking of what to make is all good, and the Grandpa also eats everything well, so she can make anything. She also notices that he is quite late, so she picks up her phone to call him. With that, Ijin goes to his room and picks up the phone he calls 006 with, and it rings. He notes that they found traces of Mad Dog all over Asia, and their best bet is that he is looking for him. They might be wrong, but he should practice caution from now on. With that, he closes the call, and Dayun says that the grandpa isn't picking up, so she will go look for him. Ijin urges her to stay home, as he will go. While outside, he also tries to call him, and he picks up. But his grandpa isn't at the phone, so Ijin demands to know who this is. He shakes when he hears Mad Dog talk, who notes that Ijin must be his real name. He says that when he finally found him, he almost didn't recognize him because of how much he changed. But did he really think that after ruining him like this, he would let him live a life of peace? He asks why he isn't inquiring about the hostage, being that he's family and all. What should he do? He's also saved as my dear Ijin on this phone. This causes him to falter and ask what happened to the hostage. Mad Dog says that he's alive, but all of that depends on his actions from now on. Ijin says that he wants to hear his voice, but Mad Dog says that he's in no position to ask him anything, and from now on, he must do what he is ordered to. He shouldn't even think of contacting or requesting help, if by chance, he sees a trace of someone helping him. The hostage will die. He also won't be using this phone in the future, so if he gets a call from an unknown number, he must pick it up. And after hanging up, he will tell him what to do through messages. Ijin agrees, and Mad Dog says that the girl he lives with is also very cute. Is she perhaps his sister? Ijin eyes grow dark, and he rushes to the house, fearing the worst. And when he gets there, his fears come true, as he only finds footsteps and Dayun's phone on the ground. He gets a message with a location, and that he must arrive in 20 minutes. Ijin looks at this and rushes to call Sukju, but he remembers what Mad Dog said, so he decides against it. He rushes outside and grabs the motorcycle, and so he speeds away. He arrives at the location and his phone rings instantly. He picks up, and Mad Dog notes that it doesn't seem like he called for help either, making Ijin believe that he is being monitored somehow. Mad Dog says that he will give him a reward for obedience, the reward being letting the grandpa talk to him. He screams that he shouldn't come, not even think of him. Ijin's whole world crashed down on him while hearing this. The woman who Ijin fought previously, the one who was sent to assassinate the siblings, shuts the grandpa up with a punch to the face. Mad Dog says that he will send him the next location and not be late. He closes the call, and the grandpa asks why they are doing something like this to them. Mad Dog says that it's because of his dear grandson, they go way back. 
but he mustn't know that, right? The forest woman laments helping Mad Dog when they could just take him out now. Why help him? Ejin moves from place to place, swerving through cars with no attention to his own life. He arrives at another location, thinking that this is the fifth time already. So Mad Dog is probably doing this to see if he will call for help and tire him out in the process. The phone rings, and Ejin asks for the next location. But Mad Dog says that this is his final destination. He will find the person he's looking for in here. He wishes good luck to 001, causing the forest woman to flinch and ask Mad Dog if he just said what she thinks she said. Mad Dog smiles and confirms that he indeed spoke to 001, the same she wanted to surpass in Forest. So why doesn't she try and capture him? She pulls out a gun and demands to know what nonsense he is talking about. Wasn't 001 killed? He says that he thought the same, causing her to inquire further. Mad Dog doesn't answer and instead says that they don't have time to talk like this, as 001 was the best among the numbered. She stares at him and orders every team to get ready for a hunt. Every team responds, but Delta says that the guys outside aren't answering, as Ejin has taken all of them out. She is surprised, and Mad Dog laughs, saying that he told them. He's the 001. The forest woman asks why he is just letting 001 act on his own. Don't they have a hostage they can use? Mad Dog notes that Forrest is hunting the numbered now, right? So is she really going to use a hostage to catch him? She's a bit shaken, and a smile permeates through her mask. She says that if they move properly, they have no intention of capturing him alive. Mad Dog encourages them, and her smile is all too visible now. She orders her men to kill Ejin on sight, and thinks that this is a golden opportunity. If they eliminate 001, they will surely rise through the ranks. Ejin gets inside and wonders where Mad Dog is, underground or up. The phone rings, and he tells Ejin that there are forest guys here and urges him to survive and come to where he is. If he fails, he is just going to kill the hostage, as he will serve no purpose if he dies. They close the call. That's when a few armed men come up some stairs. Ejin gets into position and swiftly takes care of them. He decides to descend those stairs, where he finds more armed men, and they suffer the same fate. He grabs another gun and gets moving. Another tries to shoot him, but Ejin tackles him and shoots him. Two more men open fire, and he barely manages to move out of the way. Ejin looks around and notices that this isn't where Mad Dog is. He exchanges fire with the men until he finds the opportunity to move and run away. One of the men reports his location and says that he is currently on the run. The forest woman thinks that he made a bad decision and orders Team Charlie to go to the basement and capture the enemy with Team Delta. The grandpa can do nothing but sit and watch as his grandson is hunted down. The two armed men come up the stairs, and Ejin shoots one of them until he runs out of bullets. The other, he tackles, and manages to graze him slightly, but it's not enough as Ejin knocks him out. The other man is still alive, and he aims his firearm at Ejin. He notices it in the last second and kicks it away. With that, he took care of two more, but exhaustion is visible on his face now. He looks up as he hears a lot of steps and wonders what to do. A group of men descends the stairs, half of them split up to stay on a floor, and the others continue to go down. But when they hear some commotion, they swiftly make their way up. But it is too late, as Ejin has already taken care of them. That's when they get sprayed by a storm of bullets and fall down. The two remaining men approach slowly, and it seems that Ejin has run out of bullets. Just as a man is about to turn the corner, Ejin grabs his gun and points it at him. The other man takes a while to notice, but does so too late, as Ejin shoots him through the other one. He kills him off too, and two other men suddenly shoot at him, forcing him to take cover. He gets out of cover and slides on the ground, giving him the opportunity to take some clean shots. He makes his way to the other men, and one after another, takes care of them. The forest woman gets the news that Team Charlie has been eliminated, and Team Bravo is also extremely injured. But before the man on the radio can say anything else, he gets shot dead. She notes that not a lot of time passed, but three teams are already down. Mad Dog asks if Forrest wasn't supposed to surpass their camp. Their camp trains soldiers, who can be used for military purposes and assassination. Too bad Forrest separated its soldiers and trained them, especially ones like her, who excel in assassinations. He shrugs and says that the guys she brought are only trained to carry out ops missions, 
She demands to know what he's talking about, and Mad Dog says that they are being systematically taken out by just one numbered. And this also isn't a place that needs good strategy, so. The forest woman asks him to shut his mouth. And why is he so proud when he's also running away from the very people he trained? She scoffs. Zero, zero, one of the numbered? She will have to personally kill him then. She orders the other man to stay here, as she will be more than enough to complete this hunt. Ejin makes his way through the building, but suddenly his senses scream at him to prefire a spot, and he manages to hit something. The forest woman notes that he used that timing to shoot. It seems like he's not called 001 for nothing. She speaks to him, and says that her name is Anna, a codename from Forest. She also heard a myriad of things about him, including that he's the best from that camp, and also a traitorous dog. Ejin uses this opportunity to lean in and shoot at her. He runs away, leaving her to think that the same man who protected the siblings is also 001. They continue to exchange fire, and she notes that his being 001 makes sense. Anna also asks if he remembers his voice, and it seems that he does. She notes that she failed her mission due to him so she was quite annoyed, but didn't think that an opportunity like this would come. That's when she throws a flashbang, lighting the whole floor with white. She tries to use this and eliminate Ejin, but he is too swift and throws the clothes at her, using this opportunity to shoot at her. She dodges and he tries to recover from the flashbang. Anna asks what he's doing hiding in such an apparent place, and throws another. Ejin tries to run, but she manages to tag him in the shoulder. He retaliates and hits her arm, giving him the opportunity to tackle her to the ground. She gets out of it and tries to kill him, but Ejin slaps her arm out of the way and cuts her legs. She knows that this is over, and Ejin doesn't stop there, as he also cuts her arms. But when he's just about to kill her, she screams about the hostage. If she were to die, the hostage will also be eliminated. He looks at her with a fire in his eyes and leaves her in a pool of blood. She says one last comment. No matter what he does, he will still lose. Ejin makes his way to Mad Dog, who is glad to see him. Ejin spots the countless men aiming guns at him, and his grandpa, but not Dayun. He asks where she is, but Mad Dog notes she's in a safe and different location. He says that he has grown quite a lot in the past five years. He asks Ejin if he knows what has become. Everything he built is destroyed, and the people he raised are now after his life. What does he think about this, huh? Why did he have to go through all of this because of him? Ejin demands he let the hostage go, as this is between them. This enrages Mad Dog, and he screams that he won't release the hostage with just meager words. Isn't he curious why he was told to come here specifically? He points a gun at the grandpa's head and says that it's because he will kill his family in front of his very eyes. To make him experience a pain worse than death. He lost everything because of a brat like him, yet he lives life like a normal person. He won't let that happen and will kill this old man now, and then his sister. Ejin's eyes are disturbed, and his head goes through all of the scenarios in order to save his grandpa. That's when the men that encircled him get killed. By 002, who descends on a rope. He asks what Mad Dog is doing here, and the other number descend from above. 002 says that he shouldn't move, if he doesn't want his head blown off, that is. Ejin can only watch, as these people who are after him seem like guardian angels now. 002 notes that Mad Dog is quite amazing. To think that he would be in bed with Forrest and take someone hostage. He turns his attention to Ejin and asks if he forgot how to properly take care of an enemy after living peacefully. 004 notes that it's fine, as he had a lot of fun cleaning up for him, especially with that forest woman. 002 asks if he deteriorated so much that he didn't think that if there were survivors, it would have become more dangerous. Mad Dog laughs, and notes that he didn't think others would come here as well. He speaks to Ejin, and hopes that he hasn't forgotten that his sister is in a different place right now. So if he wants to save his sister, kill these guys and save him. Ejin shivers and looks at all the numbered there. He reluctantly shuts his eyes and clenches his fist. Mad Dog is furious and demands he do it. Does his sister really not matter to him? 002 shoots him in the leg to shut him up and says that he has become quite talkative. Mad Dog screams that if they don't get a call from him, his men will kill his sister. 004 notes that they cannot, as the ones who could have killed the hostage are all dead. There were about three people and judging by their skills, they weren't seasoned forest soldiers. 
Mad Dog's whole world is shattered, and 008 puts him to sleep with his leg. He notes that his cute sister will be in a black van when he goes out. Ijin is extremely surprised and relieved. 002 says that she was at the place they thought Mad Dog would be, that is all. They leave, with 008 and other number tapping him on the shoulder. The next day at the SW building, the secretary tells the owner that there were no bodies at the scene, but there were traces of a gunfight and blood. Somebody surely cleaned up the bodies, and looking at the traces of the fight, something intense happened. The owner asks if the results of Eugene's family have come out yet, and the secretary notes that his sister is fine, and besides an internal cut and some bruises, the grandpa is also okay. His sister seemed to be unconscious, so it seems like she doesn't know what happened, and the grandpa also didn't see much. He also says that besides his past as mercenary Jin, he has another, so he's planning on investigating him further. The owner says that he shouldn't, and they should wait for him to tell them. At the hospital, Ijin sits in front of the room where Dayun and the grandpa are hospitalized. He looks down and gulps once. He reaches for the door handle and opens it. They are both surprised to see him and ask him if he's fine with his injuries. Ijin looks at how much they worry for him and apologizes. He is extremely sorry. The grandpa hugs him tightly and says that it's all right. He doesn't need to talk about it. He will tell them all about it when he wants to. They sit down, and Ijin explains that after the plane crash, he was a mercenary before regaining his memories. The grandpa notes that he was only nine, so from such a young age. They both look at him in horror, and he notes that this whole incident was because of someone who had a grudge against him during his mercenary years, and the people who helped him were his comrades. Because of him, they were both put in dangerous situations, so he apologizes. The family both look at him with shocked expressions, and the grandpa shakes a bit. He says that it must have been hard to confess something like this, so he congratulates him for it. Ijin walks out of the room with a sad expression, and the owner meets with him, asking if he's getting discharged today. They go outside, and Ijin thanks him for the help in all of this. The owner says that he didn't do much, as most of the cleanup was done when he went to the scene, he only took care of the remaining traces. They sit in silence for a bit, and he asks if he told his family. Ijin notes that he told them about his days as a mercenary, as it's best if they don't know about the other stuff. The owner inquires about the other things, and Ijin asks if he doesn't know about the other jobs he did before becoming a mercenary. The owner says that if he asks, will he answer? Ijin apologizes, and he smiles. In an undisclosed location, the numbered interrogate Mad Dog but he won't spill a word, so they will have to go to his hideout to find some answers. 004 agrees and notes that the guy who ran the camp won't talk this easily. But forget that. What will they do with 001? They all sit in silence until the sniper speaks and says that back then, 001 didn't move. When Mad Dog told him to kill them if he wanted to rescue his family, he didn't move a muscle. 004 notes that they don't know if he was thinking of killing them and if they didn't interfere, he would have surely moved. The sniper asks if that's not enough already. If 001 really thought of them as his enemies, he would have struck the second he heard that. 002 says that they will decide what to do with him after they finish this. At another location, a man gets the news that Mad Dog and Anna have gone missing, along with the guys they sent out. A man there notes that they cannot get in contact with them, so they were most likely attacked by someone. The man who seems to be in charge orders them to find out what happened, whether Mad Dog stabbed them in the back or someone else messed with them. The family arrives at their home, and Ijin urges them to go inside, as he will be right behind them. They agree, and Ijin looks behind him, where 005 and 006 are waiting. 006 notes that he heard about what happened, but when they found out, it was already too late. But is his family safe? Ijin says that they are in shock, but okay. He also got help from 002. This surprises both of them, and 005 says that she talked with him not long ago about the numbered who chased after him and perished. She told him that he just made them incapable of fighting, and that he was also shocked when he got the news. 006 asks what his reaction was, and 005 says he had none, as she can't really read that guy. Ijin thinks of what he said about his sister and looks down. 
006 notes that the other numbered also know about his family now, so they won't know if things will be okay. Ijin notes that if they want something settled, they will come to him, but they should keep an eye on Forrest from now on. 006 says that they will, as they've been popping up recently and are weary of the numbered, so they can't just ignore them. Ijin says that Mad Dog is working with Forrest, surprising both of them. 005 wondered from where Mad Dog got his help, and 006 notes that since they lost a lot of good people, they will surely send someone here to investigate. The next day, Ijin prepares them quite a large breakfast, and Dayun notes that he doesn't usually cook. Ijin says that he just followed some tutorials, so he doesn't know if they will taste good. Dayun gives it a taste, and sure enough, it seems really good. The grandpa also likes it, and notes that it must have been tiring to get up so early and make these. Dayun says that's not often, but he should challenge himself by cooking new food sometimes. Ijin agrees, and thinks of the conversation he had with 006, where he said that his life will now become much more difficult. But he doesn't want to think about that this morning. He just wants to be with his family. Somewhere else, Mad Dog seems to be at death's door, and 002 waits for some answers. Mad Dog says that all of this is pointless, as they won't be able to get any information from him. 002 says that nobody is going to rescue him, so when he does tell them something, he will die. He just needs to answer this, and he will have a merciful death. The numbered who died on the day 001 ran away. Who really killed them? Mad Dog notes that this is quite the foolish question given the situation, but 002 doesn't care and demands an answer. Mad Dog looks at him and notes that he mustn't think 001 did it. This is quite an unexpected situation, as he didn't realize the numbered who were suffering and breaking down during training would form trust between each other. His thoughts were filled with how many would survive, and how to increase their combat capabilities. He finally answers 002's burning question. He doesn't know. That's the final answer. And he doesn't know if all of this is meaningless now, but he is sure it wasn't 001. 002 gets up and puts a gun to his head. Mad Dog asks one last question before he dies. Why did they believe in 001? 002 notes that, as he said, they are probably broken. Mad Dog laughs, and all of his memories come flooding back. And his life ends with a large bang. All of the numbered wait for him in another room, including 006, 032, and 005. They ask if he killed Mad Dog, and he in turn asks why these guys are here. 004 notes that they suddenly showed up and started talking about 001 and how he's in a tight spot because of Forrest. The other numbered says that Forrest will do a proper investigation due to the amount of soldiers lost, and 001's identity might be revealed, and his family will surely be in danger. 004 says that this is all on 001, so what does it have to do with them? 005 screams that his life will end, and 004 retorts by saying it doesn't have anything to do with them, as he was the one who chose to betray them. They all look at each other silently for a few seconds, and the sniper talks and says that it's good that at least one of them is living like that. One day, 001 started to obsess over them in order to rescue them. It got to the point where he wouldn't hesitate, even if it meant immediate execution. He willingly came to save them, those who were left behind on a mission and became hostages. He knew that if they took the injured, the mission would fail, but he decided to anyway. And for those who had no more chances at life, he let them pass away peacefully. If there was ever a comrade who still lived, he would try his utmost and stay with them. The higher-ups always thought of this and meaningless and punished him, but 001 still persisted. They all saw his actions, and now that 001 has a grandpa and a little sister. His memories are slowly returning, and he's back with his family. 001 has the right to live in peace, and even if he didn't say all of this out loud, they all think the same, right? 002 says that they are going to attack the forest base that they learned about, but there's no need to go overboard. Instead, they will go after the smaller sized bases first, 004 and 005, and he will be the leader of three teams and move separately. Forest is also after them, so they cannot afford to sit still. They all smile, and agree. Ejin gets a phone call from 002, who tells him what they are about to do, so Forrest won't be able to look after him. But he must prove that the life he's living right now 
the life he got after betraying them, is worth it. Ejin is left shocked, and 002 closes the call. Ejin doesn't know what to do, as he looks at the phone, seemingly lost. He begins training for a while to get his mind off of this, but it doesn't really help. Dayun suddenly comes into the room and asks if they can talk a bit. He agrees, and she sits down. She asks if the people who saved her were his comrades, and he confirms this. Dayun notes that he should thank them for her. She was knocked out when she was kidnapped, and doesn't remember anything besides someone being in their home. But when she woke up, she found herself tied up, and was extremely scared. But not long after that, a ruckus could be heard outside, and someone untied her hands and leg. The person who saved her said this, It is all over, so he will take her to her brother. His voice was very cold, but she was not scared. They also said that they couldn't remove her blindfold as she wasn't allowed to see them. But during the whole way back, they were extremely careful with her. And while she was inside the car, they were very careful in case she lost balance or hurt herself. Ijin processes all this information, and Dayun notes that it seems like he was very close to them. His eyes widen, and he says that they were family for him. Dayun smiles, and says that he should tell them thanks on her behalf. A forest official gets the news that three of their bases were hit, and they were attacked at the same time on the same day, even though the bases were countries apart. The official notes that this is no mere coincidence, but who would attack them? The subordinate says that it was most likely the numbered, as it seems they are sending them a warning for helping Mad Dog. The official notes that they can safely say that Mad Dog, Anna, and the rest are dead. They should be careful for now, but not go after them just yet. The next day, while walking to school, two girls come up to Ejin and ask for his number. He looks at them for a good second and says that he doesn't give his number to strangers. Yuna watches all of this from a distance, and Lee notes that this is not the second time he starts his day like this. He understands he's handsome and all, but isn't it too much when it happens several times per day? Yuna asks if he's jealous, and he confirms that a little, yes. But is she okay? Doesn't it bother her to see that? It would certainly bother him. Yung-chan concurs, and Yuna asks why any of this would bother her. They all stare in silence at her, including Sukju. Lee demands to know if she thinks they are idiots. Ju says that whenever they are with Ijin, she always glances at him. So how can they ignore that she likes him? Yung Chan notes that before, if Ijin didn't come to the PC cafe or hideout, her face would drop, and when he was there, she would be happy. Yuna is extremely embarrassed, and the guys continue to talk about how obvious her love was, until she screams at them to stop. She's fine, so they shouldn't worry, okay? With that, she stomps away, and Lee says that she is unexpectedly shy about all of this. He thought that she would be much more confident. While in class, Yuna thinks about what they boys said and looks at Ijin. He looks back and she immediately breaks eye contact. While Ijin continues his bodyguard training, Yuna sits in Jie's office and asks how her relationship with her fiancé is going. She says that if she wants to talk about that, she can leave. Jie also asks why she is waiting for Ijin to finish training in here, and Yuna says that she isn't. She's just here to see her. Jia knows she's lying, but lets it go, and instead asks if it's nice living without thinking about the company. Yuna confirms this, saying that it's like a weight was lifted from her chest. Jia says that she's glad, and just when Yuna is about to take a sip of her drink, she asks if she confessed to Ijin yet. Yuna is embarrassed and asks why she would confess to Ijin and why she is looking at them that way. Jia notes that he's very popular, much more than she thinks. Seoha who's from their subsidiary, is interested in him, and Sophia, who came not long ago, was very interested. Yuna is surprised by all this, and thinks about how many opponents she has. Jie sighs, and notes that it might be better that she hasn't confessed, as Ijin said that he doesn't know if he has the right to like someone. Yuna jumps heaps through her mind, and comes to the conclusion that he's with someone else, somehow. Jie continues talking, but Yuna doesn't even try to listen, and storms out of the room with a sad expression. Sukju and Ijin walk out of the building having finished training, and they meet with Yuna, who thinks that he said that because he must have someone overseas, having lived there a long time. Sukju asks what's wrong, but she says it's nothing. They go to the hideout, where Lee bashes Yuna for playing poorly, but she doesn't really care, as she's in a sour mood. 
Ijin asks if she's not feeling well and she confirms that she isn't. Lee gets mad that she answered Ijin the second he asked. Sukju, like a true wingman, says that she should go home and Ijin should be the one to take her. He agrees, and while walking, Yuna apologizes for making him leave so early. Ijin says that it's fine, and she wonders if she can ask something. She says that she's curious about something, but if she asks, will he answer honestly? Ijin looks at her and notes that she will, if it's something he can answer. She finally musters up the courage to ask if he has someone he's dating. Ijin is surprised to hear this from her mouth, but confirms that he doesn't have anybody. Yuna is extremely happy at this information and grabs his hand, noting that they should go to the convenience store to eat some noodles. Ijin asks if she's feeling okay now, and she confirms this. While at their hideout, the numbered look at pictures of Yuna and notes that she's the granddaughter of the CW owner, who has recently entered the military industry as well. The other numbered notes that she's in the same class with 001, and judging by the pictures they have of them, it seems like he's living a little too well. At a funeral parlor, Dusik's subordinate waits outside in the rain, while Dusik himself looks at his grandfather's ashes and thinks of his words. He apologizes, saying that he's still living as usual. A woman suddenly greets him and asks if he's here because it's their grandfather's death anniversary. Dusik confirms this, saying that he would have nagged him all night if he didn't. He asks if she is well and about Hyunsu. The woman says that she's still the same, and Hyunsu is busy with work so he couldn't come today but he wouldn't have even if he hadn't. With that, Dusik leaves, and his subordinate rushes to cover him from the rain. Dusik says that he should have stayed inside the car, instead of waiting outside in the rain. While driving away, he thinks of the time he tried to steal a motorcycle from the grandpa, who screamed at him for doing it. But when he heard he didn't have any parents, he put on a front, and said that he will work at the shop to repay what he owes. We see that even when he got tangled with the police, the grandpa always came to his defense and apologized for him. Dusik's thinking gets cut short as they spot Ijin's grandpa working in the rain. Dusik tells the subordinate to stop the car, and he immediately goes to the grandpa, saying that he should do all of this later. The grandpa notes that if he does it later, the trash will pile up, so it's more comfortable for him to do it now. Dusik drops his umbrella and begins helping, much to the grandpa's surprise, who notes that his suit will get ruined. He also thanks him for always helping, but he hasn't seen him in a few days. Dusik says that he was in his hometown, as he had something to do. The grandpa suddenly collapses, and Dusik tells the subordinate to grab the car quickly. They get to the hospital, and Ijin arrives later, wet due to the rain. He asks the grandpa if he's okay, and he notes that he is, so he should have stayed at school. Dusik comes and says that he hurt his back pretty badly so he needs at least a few days of rest. The grandpa says that he will be fine after resting, so he should be the one to tell Dayun properly, as not to shock her with the news. Outside of the room, Ijin thanks Dusik for doing this, and for also helping the grandpa regularly. Dusik says that it's fine, as they aren't strangers anymore. They ask if he skipped school to get here, and he confirms this. Dusik notes that they didn't know why he collapsed, so they decided to call him. He stares at Ijin, and says that when he looks at him, he gets reminded of how he was. An awkward silence falls, and Dusik explains that he meant he also had a grandpa. But never mind that, they should go eat something, since a shop is not far away. Ijin offers to buy, but Dusik notes that a high schooler couldn't have any cash. The subordinate notes that SW bodyguards get paid quite well, and his phone rings. While he picks it up, Dusik asks if he can handle him ordering some beef rib soup. Ijin confirms this, but it seems that they are busy, as the subordinate tells Dusik that they have to return to the shop, as Hyunsu just stopped by. While at the shop, he bashes the waiters for bringing him such cheap beverages, until Dusik arrives and looks at him with an almost disapproving look. Hyunsu asks if he's been well and that he should discipline his guys, as they served him some frankly cheap alcohol. Dusik tells him to not worry about that and instead say why he came here in the first place. Hyunsu says that he wants some money for a business he's been thinking about. Dusik says that he already gave him some before, but Hyunsu notes that last time he didn't plan thoroughly, so this plan is bound to be successful. Dusik says that he already told him before, that was the last time. Hyunsu gets mad and asks how he can forsake him in this way. He cannot do this to him after how much Grandpa looked after him. 
Dusik notes that this is exactly why he gave him money previously, because of Grandpa. But since it's been a good while since they last saw each other, he will give him some pocket money, but nothing for business ideas, as he doesn't have any money either. Hyunsu asks how he doesn't have enough, as he owns multiple businesses. Dusik says that business is not going that well, and he also doesn't work that much, so he pays the guys who work hard and manage everything instead. Hyunsu notes that he heard about it, how the guy who followed him started his own business, how can he choose to look after them and not him? Dusik looks at him with an angry look and demands silence. He notes they are guys who have followed him for several years despite not being blood-related. They retired, and even if he had to go bankrupt, he would have given it over to them. Hunisu says that the grandpa did the same to him. They held no blood relation yet looked after him more than his own grandson. This makes Dusik think of his first paycheck, where he asked the grandpa if he wasn't supposed to work for the stolen motorcycle. The grandpa notes that he wouldn't slave away a kid like that, so he should work diligently from now on. Dusik sighs and says that he will give him some pocket money, that's all, and he should leave, as he's tired. Hunisu leaves and thinks that after his grandpa took in that worthless orphan and made him into a man, he still doesn't want to help. He moves everyone out of the way until he spots Ijin and wonders why this young kid is here. He tries to slap him for glaring, but Seok stops his hand and urges him to leave. Dusik comes and asks what Ijin is doing here, and he says that he told him to come after work so they could eat together. He remembers, and after that he asks Seok how much it would cost to open up a chicken shop. A decent sized one at least. Seok asks if it's for Hyunsu and urges him not to, as he will run the shop into the ground. If he were someone who worked hard, yes. But how many times has he taken money from him? With that amount, he could have opened several businesses. Suddenly, Yurim calls Dusik, the girl from before, and asks if Hunsu came to visit him. She apologizes on his behalf, as she knows he asked for money again, and she also knows he helps him every time. Dusik says that it's just his conscience, and Yurim notes that he's been acting strange lately, as he borrowed from her a lot more than usual. Furthermore, he came back to ask for more, and she heard that he also borrowed from multiple people, almost seeming desperate for cash. So that's why she wants Dusik to help him, if in any way. Hyunsu gets out of a bus and notes that he needs to get more money as he doesn't have enough. Suddenly, someone by the name of Siokbai calls him, but he chooses to ignore it. However, it catches up to him, as Siokbei's goons come and demand he come with them, as he wants to see him. They go to Siokbei's place, and Hyunsu is trembling with fear. He asks why he didn't pick up the phone. When he came to borrow money, he was always here. But now that it's time to repay, he's ghosting him. Hyunsu explains that he went to Seoul because he was going to get some money from his brother. Siokbei's ears perk up at hearing this, and he asks if he went to meet Dusik. He thinks of the time his grandpa told him he would give him the shop when he was thinking of retirement. Dusik notes that he's still healthy and also has Hyunsu. Why not give it to him? The grandpa notes that he would just sell the shop and gamble the money away. It pains him to talk about his own grandson like this, but these are just facts. He wants to believe he will change, but he doesn't have much time left, so this is what he decided. But he also won't give it to him for free. He needs to keep running the shop and provide Yurim and Hyunsu with living expenses for a few years. Dusik gets woken up from his reminiscing by a phone call from Hyunsu. He asks if he's free tomorrow, as he is holding a soft opening for his shop and would like for him to come. Dusik is surprised and asks how he got the money. Hyunsu notes that he borrowed from here and there, as it was getting quite difficult to live like this. So he wanted to turn around and live properly. Dusik is happy for him and says that he will come. He just needs to send him the address. Seok notes that it looks like something good happened, and Dusik confirms this. Hyunsu is clenching his phone and shaking at the thought of what he just did. Seokbei congratulates him and says that he will forget about the five grand since he called Dusik. If he were to stab him, the $400 million he borrowed and the gambling debt would be cleared away. They will take care of the cleanup and everything. That's all he needs to do. Hyunsu tries to make sense of all of this, thinking that it was Dusik's fault in the first place, as he was the one who picked a fight with this guy. If it weren't for him, his life wouldn't have been so twisted. His grandpa gave the shop to someone who's not even blood-related. It must have been senility that caused him to choose Dusik. He didn't know that Seokbei approached him because of Dusik, 
and yet he continued to borrow money and gamble. He justifies this by saying that this is all because of Dusik. While walking to the car, Sayok asks if he will be okay driving by himself. Dusik says that he will be fine, as he's just going to see Hyunsu for a moment and return. Sayok notes that he's probably going to give him some money too, right? Since the guys saw him at the bank earlier. Dusik says that he finally started living how he should, so he decided to help him out a bit. Sayok notes that if he were that kind he wouldn't believe him in the first place. Dusik says that the grandpa would have been extremely happy to hear Hyunsu turn his life around and gets into the car. He gets there, and Hyunsu greets him, but he spots that he's injured and asks what happened. Hyunsu says it's nothing and grabs his hand, saying that they should hurry. They get inside, but Dusik instantly feels that something malicious is going on. Hyunsu notes that these are all just old friends, and just when he's about to look at them closer, Hyunsu stabs him. He notes that he made him do this and Dusik throws him over a table. The guys get up, and Seokbae arrives. Seok calls Yurim to ask her something. He just needs the address of Hyunsu's new shop, as he wants to send some flowers, but Dusik isn't picking them up. She notes that this is the first time she's heard about this, and slowly, Seok finally gets what's going on. He rounds up some men, and gets them into cars. That's when Ijin arrives with some side dishes from his sister. In the past, while Dusik was coming into the shop, he saw the grandpa give some money to Seokbae. Dusik bows down, as they are already old acquaintances. Seokbae puts his hand on his shoulder and notes that he always has a place with him, so he can come anytime. Dusik asks the grandpa if he borrowed money from that guy, and he confirms this, saying that he did because of Hyunsu's incident. It wasn't much at first, but the interest was too high, and it turned out like this. That night, Dusik goes to Seokbae's office where he explains how his scheme works. Now he just needs some capital funds, and this is the best way to do it. Dusik asks if he did the same to Hyunsu, and he doesn't say yes, but says that this is just business, basically confirming that he did. Dusik asks how much the debt is, and Seokbai says that it's a little over 4,000, and the principal is about 3,000. Dusik notes that the grandpa has been paying back constantly. Just how much is the interest? Seokbe asks to know what he wants to say, and Dusik asks if he can't just take pity on him and nullify the debt. Seokbe says that if he does this, he will leave a precedent, and it will be hard to run the business. Dusik gets up and thinks that he should check how much money he has saved. That's when Seokbe notes that if he were to work for him, he would forget about the loan. He can do at least this much. Dusik accepts, and so begins his life of violence, crime, and business. He also tried to reach out to the grandpa, but it seems that he was ignoring him due to him being a gangster now. Dusik continued his life of bloodshed until one day, when the grandpa collapsed straight into a coma. Dusik asks Yurim what happened, and she says that he couldn't pay the money he borrowed, and they seized the building, so he collapsed from the shock. Dusik notes that everything was paid back. Did he just borrow again? Yurim says that he didn't, and on top of that the store wasn't doing well, so they took the shop as collateral. Dusik thinks that Seokbae told him that he would take care of that debt. Did he lie? He asks about the money he sent, but Yurim says that the grandpa said that he earned that money, so they should never use it. He said that he felt guilty and didn't have the strength to face him because he knew why he quit. He even said he would repay him, and even took a job at a labor factory to do it. Dusik thinks about all of this, and something inside of him snaps. He goes to Seokbae's office and leaves it painted red. He finds Seokbae and brandishing a demon's appearance, he asks why he didn't clear the debt. Seokbe notes that he already told him. Businesses cannot be run if he were to take pity. He rushes with the knife, and Dusik defends himself, but Seokbe finds the opportunity to slash him, giving Dusik his scar. But all of this ends when Dusik hits him multiple times with all his might, the culmination of all the violence he went through. With that, he leaves the office, and on that day, Seokbe swears revenge. Back to the present, Seokbae notes that they haven't seen each other in well over 10 years. Dusik asks what he wants, and Seokbae notes that they have some unfinished business, don't they? Dusik notes that he's still the same, a gangster. One of Seokbae's subordinates gets mad, but he calms him down and says that he heard he was doing very well, but now he's at his downfall. Dusik asks if he had to wait until he wasn't doing well to do something, and to top it off, he used Hyunsu because he couldn't do anything himself. 
That's why he's calling him a gangster, because he's still doing things like this. Siokbe's subordinate has had enough and charges Dusik, but even in his injured state, he defeats him easily. Dusik says that he is doing something wrong. He is not in his downfall. He's just living the quiet life. Siokbe orders his guys to attack, but Dusik holds his own, surprising even Hyunsu, who didn't know he was this strong. Dusik takes out the first wave and thinks that it's getting harder and harder to move. Was his intestine perhaps punctured? The next wave rushes in, and when fighting, a little bit of his old self permeates through his attacks. But even with that, some still manage to strike him, and the fight continues. Siok and the men rush to Dusik's location, hoping to arrive in time. Dusik manages to defeat most of the guys, but he is reaching his limit and can barely stand up anymore. He notes that if his body were fine, he would have given them a good beating, just like before. Seokbai orders Hyunsu to come to him, and he gives him a knife. He demands that he stab Dusik with it. At first he is hesitant, but he thinks that he can't back down now, as all of this wouldn't have meaning if he did. The door suddenly opens and Ijin comes into the room carrying the food. Sukbai asks if someone ordered food, but they all deny it. Dusik finally notices who this guy is, and Ijin says he's here to deliver some side dishes. Sukbai asks which bastard ordered side dishes without reading the room first. Ijin looks around and spots that Dusik is wounded pretty badly. Siokbei finds it annoying that he will have to clean up another body, and orders one of his men to bring that guy over here, as it will be quite annoying if he were to run his mouth somewhere. He tells Ijin that he should consider himself unlucky, but it's quite fortunate, as this life is not worth living anyway. The man puts his hand on Ijin's shoulder, but he grabs it and headbutts him, knocking out a few teeth in the process. Ijin asks him to repeat what he just said and puts the side dishes down. Two other goons swarm him, but one after another, they fall down. Sukbai and Hyunsu are very surprised at his prowess, and Ijin charges in, knocking out anyone who tries to stop him. Seeing that the situation is dire, more rush to him, but not a single one can touch him, and Siokbei can only watch as his men basically get butchered. Just who is this powerful bastard? Dusik sits down and notes that the unfortunate one isn't Ijin, but him. He messed up extremely badly, as this guy isn't a simple gangster he can just deal with. Ijin stands before his defeated enemies, and Yunsu shakes while holding the knife wondering how a simple delivery man beat every single gangster here to a pulp. Ijin looks at him, and Hyunsu spots that he has the same figure as that high schooler. But that's Dusik's man swarming in, asking if he's alright. He says that he's fine for now, but they need to finish things here now. More and more of Dusik's men get inside, and Sukbai can only shake, as there's nothing left to do in this situation. Dusik gets up, and slowly makes his way towards Sukbai, who now fears the worst. But Dusik passes him and begins talking to Hyunsu instead, making Sukbei extremely angry. Dusik says that he thought quite a lot about what he should do with him, and Hyunsu, like the coward he is, drops the knife immediately, apologizing for everything while doing so. Dusik notes that he shouldn't apologize, as this is all his fault in the first place. It's really his fault, as if he truly knew him. He wouldn't do such a foolish act. That's when Dusik punches him hard, causing Hyunsu to fall to his knees. While grabbing a metal bar, Dusik says that if he was begging like a dog before that, acting like this towards him doesn't make a lick of sense. Hyunsu demands that he wait and think about their grandpa, but Dusik has had enough and notes that he's mostly doing this for him. The beating commences, and the metal pipe can be heard throughout the restaurant. Hyunsu is left in a pool of his own blood. Dusik warns him, if he ever gambles, he dies. If he's going around asking for money again, he dies. Oh, and if he were to ask Yurim for money, he will die in seconds. Dusik turns to Seokbai and notes that he should have done this earlier. They both look at each other, and Seokbai can only think of the little runt he raised into such a beast. Dusik passes him once again and orders his men to take care of him and make sure he can never do anything foolish again. Seokbai has had enough of this blatant disrespect and doesn't want things to end like this. He pulls out a knife and bolts straight for Dusik, but Seok intercepts this attack and constantly kicks him to the ground, noting that he must have lost his mind to do something like this in the situation he's in. Dusik gets out and spots Ijin, who is sitting next to the motorcycle with side dishes in hand. He asks why he came here, and Ijin says that he just came to bring him some side dishes. 
Dusik asks if he's actually joking, but Ijin just hands him the side dishes and says that his sister told him to bring them quickly, and he also thanks him for helping Grandpa. Dusik finds all of this quite surprising and notes that he should be the one to thank her. He also spots the motorcycle he rode here and says that he's using it quite well. Ijin says he will return it, but Dusik has already told him time and time again that he can keep it, as it doesn't suit his age anymore, and he honestly never rode motorcycles, even when he was young. Ijin asks if he stole it, but Dusik denies it. Ijin is still quite skeptical, however. Dusik scratches his head and thinks of the time he spotted this motorcycle and bought it. He notes that it just reminded him of the good old days, but he never truly rode it after purchasing it. Ijin looks at him, and Sayok urges Dusik to go to the hospital now, as he's quite injured. Dusik thanks Ijin for everything he has done today, and while in the car, Sayok notes that it's probably not the best idea to leave things like this regarding Hyunsu, as he almost passed away because of that greedy bastard. Why is he going this far? Hasn't he done enough for that shameless person? And also, he spent only two years with that grandfather. Dusik looks out of the window and says that after living in the orphanage his whole life and then entering the real world, the first person who ever believed in him was that old man. He thinks of the first time he got a bike working, and the grandpa congratulated him while also teaching him a few tricks. That's when he asked why he keeps teaching him stuff and letting him work, and the grandpa noted that he's not really that special, but he knew about him and how often he would get into fights, so what would he see in him? Besides him being a gangster, of course. Dusik looks down, but the grandpa notes that he should believe in him, as an old person like him should trust in him, so he gets the chance to live like a normal human being, right? This touched Dusik deeply, and he notes that he can never forget those words. Never. Sayok smiles and says that now he understands perfectly. The next day, somewhere entirely different, one of the numbered sits in a dark room with a woman, and he asks if she's the VIP. She confirms this, and he says that they should confirm the deal, as he will be guarding her until she leaves the country, so for three days, right? The woman confirms this and says that she also wants to ask something. He asks what it is, and she asks if he's really the only person guarding her. He sighs and notes that he's plenty, but why is she asking this? Is she perhaps worried? She denies this and instead notes that she's a little sad, that's when she pulls out a gun and shoots him. Who is this woman to take me by surprise? At the forest campsite, the commander gets informed that Alice has started to move of her own free will and is now acting independently after hearing about what happened. The subordinate says that he already knows how Alice can be, so it's difficult to restrict her movements. The commander still demands they bring her in as fast as possible, but the subordinate says that they cannot contact her or trace her location. This leaves the commander to think about what she can do. The numbered managed to barely survive, and he thinks of how he hid from Alice, who clearly knew all of this time that he was one of the numbered. The door suddenly burst open, and he pointed a firearm at it, ready for anything. But 008 comes in and asks him, what happened? As he was quite shocked when he got the call. He notes that he got shot, and she must have been after him from the start. 008 asks if he knows who she is, but 018 denies this but she is quite skilled, so they need to return and find out. 008 notes that they should move and asks him if he can walk, but due to his injuries, he barely got here. 008 slowly picks him up, but that's when they both notice something is wrong, and countless bullets start coming out of the door as Alice shoots through it with an SMG. Shortly after, she throws in a flashbang and makes her way inside. She searches the area but finds nothing. That's when 008 comes at her with a table and manages to strike but he can't finish the job, as the flashbang has affected his eyesight. This gives Alice ample opportunity to aim and shoot, but 018 moves 008 out of danger with the last of his strength, and they manage to leave the room. She tries to follow them, but just as she gets through the doorway, someone grabs her gun and pins her to the wall while also aiming square for her head. In her eye reflection, the culprit can be seen. 002. He pulls the trigger and she barely manages to move away. She drops herself down but swiftly gets ready to strike, but nobody is coming out of the doorway just yet. 002 signals 018 and 008 to get out of there, and they do so. Alice laments not being able to kill at least one, and says that she doesn't know about the others, 
but he knows him quite well. 002, the current leader of the numbered. He asks who she is, and she doesn't want to answer. 002 notes that she's most likely from the forest, so she must be the rumored Alice, right? He heard about her, and how she was the best assassin in the forest. And seeing that she's here and armed, does this mean that they will be warring with the forest? Alice demands he stop spouting nonsense, as they were the ones who started this first. 002 in turn asks her to stop talking crap, as the forest helped Mad Dog in numerous ways, such as where to find them, and also gave him a few soldiers too. Is she really denying all of this? This is the first time Alice hears about all of this, and 002 says that as a warning not to get involved further, he ended that with a couple of warning shots, but it clearly wasn't enough. Alice still doesn't believe him, and 002 leaves, noting that she will find out what's real and what's not soon enough. If they really want to go to war with them, he won't sit by and avoid it. At the forest facility, countless soldiers are strewn about, knocked out. More and more suffer the same fate, and Alice is the culprit, who made her way to the commander's office by force. He asks what she wants, and she demands to know if he really helped Mad Dog with the numbers, and if Anna and their agents got hurt in the process. The commander is hesitant to answer, making Alice think that what 002 said was true. How can he be called Commander when he sacrificed so many men to the numbered, who are on the verge of collapse as it is? The Commander asks why she's acting like this, and she notes that their men suffered as well as her. He says that she just needs to follow orders like she always has. Isn't that right? Alice sits in silence for a second and says that he isn't. The Commander gives her one last warning. Were she ever to disobey and act on her own again, he wouldn't let it slide and would make sure she wouldn't be able to do it ever again. Alice agrees, and she turns away. The subordinate says that in terms of skills, she's a gem, but her lack of self-control is the problem, as she even ignores specific safety measures. The commander asks if she has a specific mission, and the subordinate notes that he plans to put her on standby as punishment for breaking orders. The commander says that they can't waste such a valuable resource, and they should use her to infiltrate that place. At the SW building, the other bodyguards are happy to see Ejin, noting that he's no longer the youngest in terms of how long he's been here. Ejin looks at Sukju, who explains that today, new rookies have joined the bodyguarding duties. Ejin asks why he's the one who graduated from being the youngest, as they are the same age. Sukju notes that he has more years of service than him, and is clearly very proud of this fact. They all look at the rookies, and the team leader notes that this time, they hired only experienced veterans and they will also go through several months of training. But among them, that girl is quite amazing, and the team looks at her, noting how beautiful she is. While she stands next to her fellow rookies, she thinks of the orders she got from the commander to infiltrate SW and wait for further orders. She shouldn't worry, as her skills and information are perfectly concealed, so nobody will discover her. The team leader comes next to the other team leader and notes that his team is acting like children, and wants to have a welcome party now, as they want to know more about their potential colleagues. He tells the rookies that they will start a welcome party now and head to the gym. Ejin asks what a welcoming party is, and the other bodyguards note that it is only for making the rookies feel at home and adapt faster. Ejin agrees, and notes that they will probably do a group beating, as it's quite a common way to welcome someone, right? They can only sit in silence at what he just proposed, and they all go to the gym. A bodyguard notes that they should start with a few friendly spars, as he's sure these rookies aren't afraid to get hurt. The team leader looks at the rookies, and Alice looks at Ejin, noting that he and the other kid are quite young to be bodyguards. One of the bodyguards jumps into the ring, and a rookie accepts his challenge. The team leader gives them the rules, and so the bodyguard closes the gap instantly and begins bashing the rookie again and again. The rookie tries to counter-attack, but this gives the bodyguard the opportunity to pin him to the ground. With that, the fight ends, and the bodyguard celebrates his perfect victory. Alice thinks that these guys are quite skilled, and says that she'll be next, while thinking that she needs to avoid drawing attention, so she needs to choose her opponent very carefully. She notes that she heard SW is quite skilled, and to assess the situation, she will have a fight with that kid. Unfortunately for her, she just pointed at Ejin, and the whole team thinks that she skipped all of the side quests and went straight for the final boss. Alice thinks that Anna wanted to kidnap someone from here, but because of the bodyguards, 
She failed, and quite miserably at that. Since her superiors told her to just infiltrate in here though, she needs to adjust to this place fast. However, they all look quite worried about this match. Are they perhaps worried about this child? She should try and not hurt him bad at least to improve her image. The gong rings, and she lunges forward with a light jab. Ijin in turn also uses a jab, but she recognizes that his had much more power put behind it. That's when he gets on top of her and tries to end the fight, but she uses her free arm to try and hit Ijin in the head. He managed to block the attack and making some distance. They both look at each other, and Alice wonders what's up with this kid, as he seems well informed and experienced in close combat. They start brawling once again, and she uses a feint to make him dodge, allowing her the opportunity for a savage strike. Everyone looks at the fight eagerly, as Ijin has caught her hand perfectly. He uses it to twist it a bit, and she now, she knows. This guy is not only well informed and skilled, but he's also a straight up pro. She charges in once again, and notices that Ijin was going for an uppercut, which she just barely gets out of the way of. They distance themselves, and everyone in the team is shocked at the skill and finesse they both exerted. The team leader says that the match will stop here, as both of them must be getting too worked up. Ijin complies and turns to leave quickly, while Alice thinks that she didn't know such a gem was working as a bodyguard, as his skills are comparable to people from Forest. Perhaps SW didn't choose him on a whim, like she originally thought. Chiya and Yuna arrive at the scene, and the team leader welcomes them. Chiya notes that they are all quite unsettled. Is this perhaps the welcoming party? He confirms it, and she says that was the first time she saw someone who could spar with Ijin that well. The team leader notes that although it was but a simple spar, they could see their combat skills quite well. And even though she doesn't have much experience at the moment, since she's done bodyguarding work before, She's one they need to look forward to. Alice looks in their direction and spots Ji Ye, remembering that she's the president's daughter. Judging by the current mood, she seems to frequent this place quite often. She notices Yuna as well. This place will be a good spot for observing SW's VIPs if she is to infiltrate this place. A while later, when Ijin is talking with his colleagues, she comes next to them and introduces herself as Rubia Crystal. Ijin shakes her hand and does so as well. She says that judging by that display of skill earlier, he seems quite competent. But how long has he been a bodyguard at this place for? Ijin explains that he's been on field practice for around six months. This surprises her quite a bit, as even if he's not an official bodyguard, he's doing field practice. Does it mean something else from what she thinks it is, perhaps? The colleagues come next to Ijin and explain that, just for her information, he's a high schooler. Now she's just at a straight-up loss for words. While Ijin and Yuna have a walk, with a few guards behind them for protection, Alice, who is stalking them, thinks that they seem quite close. She looks at Yuna's expression and knows all too well what it means. Yuna says that recently, Yungchan has started his YouTube channel, where he also uploaded a video of him when they played together. Ijin notices that something is watching them, so he turns his head to where Alice was, only to find nothing. She barely managed to get out of his sight and thinks that this child is no mere bodyguard trainee, not in the least. Her phone suddenly rings, and when she picks up, the forest leader asks how the infiltration is going. She explains that she has encountered no issues so far, and he urges her to be aware of SWVIPs at all times. She asks if she should continue with the previous failed commission, but he says that's not needed, so she doesn't need to do a thing. She asks if all she really needs to do is infiltrate and stare, as she's not an infiltration agent last time she checked. The leader notes that that he already told her numerous times. This is an order, so she better not disappoint. With that, the call ends. That night, Ijin gets the news that 018 was attacked from 006 and 032, who explain that the injuries are quite heavy, so the recovery will take some time, but if they were a second late, he would have died. The opponent this time was Alice, one of the best assassins from Forest. He also heard that she's hard to control due to her skills, and there's a round that Forrest manages to control her because they know their weakness. Forrest itself also stated that this attack wasn't official work from them. Ijin notes that official or not 002 won't just stand still when a numbered was attack, right? 006 explains that the other guys think the same, that they shouldn't stand still and show Forrest who the numbered really are. However, 002 is being more careful than usual. 
but it is true that the camp is basically gone, and that don't have that many members left. It's quite obvious that with this amount of change, 002 did so as well. With a final warning from 006, to be careful just in case, they end the call, and Ijin picks up his other phone. He messages Dayun and asks if she's finished. She confirms that she is, and is heading home as they speak. This causes him to smile. While walking to somewhere, he thinks of the past, to a time where he was basically out of energy and will, but nobody cared. However, 002 did, as he gave him a food bar, noting that even if he has to force it down, he should. That way he will get through all of this. He meets with Dayun, who is at a crossroads, and waits for her to pass. The light turns green, and she starts making his way towards him. That's when a man driving a scooter, who is clearly not looking at the road, but rather at his phone, drives very fast towards her. Ijin notices and rushes as fast as he can to her, but he can't make it. Just before Dayun is hit, Alice saves her, noting that guys like that shouldn't be on the road. Dayun thanks her for the rescue, and Alice is quite surprised to see Ijin here as well, who also thanks her. She asks what for, and Ijin explains that the girl she saves is his sister. They go to the convenience store, and Dayun notes that she was quite surprised when she found out she worked with her brother. Alice notes that has only been for two days, and she's a junior compared to her brother. Ijin asks what brings her around these parts, and she says that she lives around here, same as them, right? Ijin says that indeed they do, and he opens Dayun's soda, which she was having difficulties with. Alice looks at them, and thinks that now, at this time, they both seem to be normal, especially him, who looks just like a normal high schooler. This makes her think of someone important in her life, and thinks that she should ask if she can meet him sometime. 004 and 008 walk around the nearby streets, and 004 notes that he hopes they haven't heard anything about this just yet. 008 advises him to wait, as it's the place where the forest agents were killed, so if they haven't already, they will surely be here soon. Cameras have also been installed nearby, so if Alice makes her presence known, they will be the first to notice. 004 really wants her to be caught in this trap, as he's extremely furious because of what happened with 018. 008 asks if what they are doing is really okay, as 002 will certainly not like this, at all actually. 004 explains that he told them to not attack the forest base, but nothing about Alice. This is a simple get back, as what she did then wasn't officially tied to forest. 004 asks why he wanted to come with him so much, and 008 notes that he just wanted to see 001, since they are in the area and all that. That's when they spot him having a few drinks with his sister and someone else, but 008 noticed that the blonde girl is Alice, he's sure of it. 004 looks at 001, and asks why he's with her in the first place. Judging by what they saw, 001 has joined forces with Forrest. They call 002, and tell him the news, who tells them to wait until he gets there, and that they shouldn't approach 001 at all. Will this misunderstanding be cleared out? 008 sits in a nearby location, and wonders if Ijin really betrayed them, and tells 004 that 002 is now on his way. But he's nowhere to be found, and he knows exactly where he went. Ijin walks out for a run, and spots 004, who demands he follow. They arrive at the construction site, and Ijin asks what this is about. 004 doesn't answer, and Ijin feels something is wrong. He barely manages to dodge a lethal knife attack, but 004 doesn't stop there, as he lunges and slashes at Ijin constantly, who is surprised and is losing his footing. This allows 004 to kick him in the abdomen and try to end his life once and for all, but Ijin grabs his hand and uppercuts him. They both stare at each other, and 004 says that he should have killed a rat bastard like him a long time ago. He pulls out a gun and notes that even after that incident, the others still believe in him, like the fools they are, and he dares betray them again. Ijin wonders what he's talking about, but 004 thinks that he's just playing dumb, but he also has no intention to talking any further, so he should just die. Before he can shoot, 008 tackles him, and notes that 002 will be here soon, so they should do as they were ordered and wait until he arrives. 004 looks at Ijin one last time, and reluctantly leaves. He asks 008 what's going on, who notes that something came up, but they will talk next time. Later, after patching himself up, 
Ejin calls 005 and tells her what happened. She thought that his pent-up hate towards him had vanished, but seeing as how he did that, and suddenly too, it appears that he's still the same. Ejin notes that this time it might be different, as he said that he betrayed them once again. 005 is quite puzzled by this, and asks if this is really what he said. He confirms it, and she explains that she will find out soon enough. The call ends, and Ejin thinks of the training he did with 004, who was quite ruthless in his ways, and usually beat the snot out of him, while also belittling him at any chance he got. Until one day, when Ejin had enough, and his eyes let out that he was only thinking about making him suffer. 004 liked that quite a lot, and explained that in a knife fight, nobody knows the outcome until the end, and even if one is to die, they can still make their enemies suffer with one successful attack. 004 still isn't calm, as he's very mad, but 008 notes that something is off about this whole situation. 004 explains that 001 betrayed them before, so a second time wouldn't be that hard, right? 008 notes that even if it's so, 001 explicitly told everyone that he wanted to leave this world and wanted to live with his family peacefully. That's when he remembers that his sister was also there. Would 001 really let his sister meet a forest assassin like that? 004 says that maybe Alice hid her identity and approached 001. That does make more sense. That's when their alarms start beeping, as Alice was captured on camera. She looks around, and sure enough, not a lick of evidence was found, but still, they couldn't hide the bullet trace as well. She notices that all of the bullets came from above, as the holes indicated. He must have made his move from the bottom quite recklessly, and dealt with the opponents on top. But why did he choose the stairs, out of all possible routes? Either way, one thing is for certain. She doesn't see any signs of gunfire up here, meaning that the bullet placement was so precise, he hit only his opponents. It's impossible that all of the intruders were this skillful, so was it just one extremely skilled man who did all of this? But that also doesn't make sense at all, as one man couldn't just defeat all of her agents, including Anna. Just what happened in this place for the outcome to be what it is. She makes her way to the last floor, and thinks that the situation around here was quite different, as there are bullet holes everywhere. She walks towards a window and thinks that the shooter must have shot from here, as the agents couldn't have reacted in time. She hears something and turns her head instantly to a pile of cardboard boxes. She removes them and reveals a camera. Due to this, she notes that the best course of action right now would be to get out this place, ASAP. Before Alice can take a single step, bullets come flighting towards her, but she manages to dodge and retaliate. 004 says that it's known that she's the best Forrest has, and it seems to be true. She doesn't recognize his voice and asks who he is. He just tries to shoot her again, making her think that he's one of the numbered. 004 says that she's correct, making her think that he's out here for revenge. She suddenly grabs his gun and tries to shoot him, but he smacks her hand and she kicks him. Without weapons, she tries to attack him with a knife, but she suddenly notices that she's been injured. Now, she knows who he is exactly, 004. He's quite surprised that she knows him, and Alice explains that she heard there's a man among the numbered who is very skilled with the knife. So his movement just now was just to ensure a knife fight, right? 004 says that guns are something that even an amateur can use to kill a professional. So when he goes against the best Forrest got, it would be a shame to use them, right? She finds him to be a real psycho, and they exchange blows. But she's on the receiving end, as his strikes are precise and fast. 004 charges forwards to end the fight, while screaming that her skills are terrible. But she steps on his foot and uses her coat to block his sight. He removes it swiftly, but a little too late, as she's ready, with gun in hand. 004 is surprised she had a spare, and she notes that nobody uses knives anymore when there's this modern and efficient way of killing. Alice starts shooting at him, and he runs away while throwing a few daggers, forcing her to take cover. This, however, doesn't stop her relentless assault of bullets, forcing him to get into cover. This gives her the opportunity to leave, and he tries to follow after her, but she notices and makes sure he stays put. Alice thinks that if 004 is here, the other numbered also must be nearby, so she needs to get out this place as quick as possible. 004 arrives back at their base of operations and thinks that he was too careless. 002 notes that it seems he has failed in capturing Alice. 004 looks at 002 with tired eyes, and a silence falls, 
where they both just look at each other, while 008 just stands there. Finally, he apologizes, although he clearly didn't want to. 002 notes that it can't be helped, as they wouldn't have had the time to wait for him in the first place. 004 just agrees with him, but wonders why he isn't saying anything about this. As usually, he would tear off his ear and start disciplining him until he dies. 008 asks what they should do now, that they are free, perhaps go talk with 001 first. 002 ponders the situation and seems to have come to a conclusion. Later he goes to Ejin and shows him the picture of Alice. He asks if this really is the lady from Forest, and 002 confirms it. Ejin finally gets why 004 attacked him and said that he betrayed them once again, which seemed to have hurt him quite a lot. He says that he didn't have a clue about her real identity, and 002 notes that he already knows. If he knew who Alice truly was, he wouldn't have introduced her to his sister like a fool, so he shouldn't worry, as nobody is suspecting him anymore. However, how did he come to know her in the first place? Ejin explains that she is a freshly hired recruit for the SW security personnel. 002 notes that SW security must have did a thorough check on her, so it seems that she hid her true identity really well. Forrest certainly did a good job on this one, that's for sure. Ejin asks if he knows anything about why Alice chose to approach him, and 002 denies that he does, but he is certainly planning to find out soon enough. Ejin notes that if her real motive was to get rid of him, then she wouldn't have approached her in such an inconvenient and quite unusual way. 002 gets up and says that he agrees with his deduction, as things were too awkward. He also tells him to not get involved further, as this isn't his battle anymore. Ejin tries to convince him otherwise, but 002 notes that now, his sister is involved, so he can't risk her like he did with that dog. More importantly than this, however, he needs to find out just how much she knows about him, so that they can be sure can make plans if necessary. Ejin is quite surprised that he cares so much, and 002 walks away, noting that, this time, he should leave it to them. While at training, Alice thinks about the situation, as she didn't expect for the numbered to be in this country of all places. She remembers 004's words, who didn't seem scared at all, and rather, it seemed like he was waiting for her since the very beginning. Suddenly, the team leader screams at her and demands that she focus, as if she was on the job right now. Something extremely bad could have happened, and she wouldn't be able to do anything. She apologizes for inconveniencing the team, and Ejin looks at her from the distance. He thinks that if Forrest really wanted him dead, they didn't have to use such an awkward process to do so, since they can assassinate him after looking into his info. This whole situation with Alice being sent to be a trainee is plain unnecessary, since they can use his family as hostage and take advantage of him, like what happened before. If she looked into him, she would have known about his grandpa and Dayun, and she can use those two as hostages and not have to go through being yelled at by the team leader, right? Just what could her reasoning be for doing something like this? The training comes to an end, and the team leader congratulates everyone for their work. Alice walks around and thinks of the conversation she had with the forest leader yesterday evening. She wanted to leave, as this country is filled to the brim with numbered, but the leader asked her if they found out about her infiltrating SW. She noted that she can't be certain about that, and that's when the leader told her to simply continue with her mission. She demanded to know why, and he explained that they have invested a large sum of money in order for her to get into that position, so Forrest will lose quite a lot if she wants to leave simply because of some baseless assumptions. At that point, she didn't say anything, but she clearly didn't like it. What would they even want, though? What is their true objective? She walks up to Ejin and notes that he said that they should go to the supermarket together one day. Well, she is free right now, so what does he think about it? Ejin looks at her and notes that he is free as well, so he agrees to go with her. While they walk to the supermarket, she asks if she put him in a difficult situation because she asked so suddenly, but he confirms that she didn't, so she shouldn't worry. Suddenly she starts sweating quite a lot and Ejin notices that she also has a stern look on her face. Her change of face is because of 002, who is waiting for her at a corner. She thinks that he finally revealed himself, meaning that she became fully exposed, and they also must clearly know about her working at SW. She tells Ejin to go ahead to the supermarket, as something has come up, 
and she needs to leave for a bit. Ijin just looks at her, and she walks into 002's direction. Alice explains that the kid she was walking with has nothing to do with her, so they shouldn't worry about him at all, as he is just someone who is associated with her because they have the same workplace. 002 asks if that really is the case, and she urges him to look into it. He is just a trainee for SW security, so if he doesn't believe her, he can most certainly look into it. The numbered aren't people who aim for things recklessly, just because of suspicion, or so she heard. 002 looks at her, and then at Ijin, who is also looking at him. He walks away, and notes that they need to change location, right now. They do so, and arrive at the construction site. Alice says that if he wanted her dead, he wouldn't have exposed himself like this. So what brings him to her? 002 notes that he should be the one asking that question, not her. She explains that she's here simply to investigate the scene. 002 notes that there also must be something else, as she didn't infiltrate SW for no reason, right? Alice says that she was the one to tell him that anyways, but she did it because if she got exposed, she would have to leave, so keeping it to herself seems like a dumb idea. 002 looks at her sternly and notes that it must be so. With that, he simply walks away, which puzzles Alice quite a bit, prompting her to ask why he is leaving. 002 urges her to get lost, while he is still letting her live. This takes her back, but she certainly won't refuse the opportunity. Later, 002 calls Ijin and explains that the reason Alice is here has nothing to do with him. She also doesn't know about his identity as 001, though he probably guessed that already. Ijin notes that indeed he did, and the thing that she pulled when she saw 002 basically confirmed it. He notes that he is in a much safer position because of this situation, since Alice is only aware of him being a bodyguard. With that, they close the call, and 004 asks him if this is why he didn't scold his ear off when he told him that he lost Alice. Did he really want to make Alice a witness on purpose? 002 explains that it isn't so, it's just that, the fact that he made a mistake during a crucial time isn't that surprising anymore. This leaves both 004 and 008 quite shocked, and with that out of the way, 002 leaves. The next day, 006 calls Ijin and notes that he heard the news, and he's quite speechless, as he never expected that the Alice from Forest infiltrated SW with such ease, and also that they instantly thought that he was getting involved with Forest just because he saw him with her, is just plain crazy. How can such a strange situation even happen? If 004 suddenly appeared and said that he wanted to kill him, he certainly would have been shocked. Ijin smiles as he appreciates his worry. 006 asks what he is going to do about Alice, and Ijin notes that she didn't come to the training today, so she is most likely gone. 006 explains that since she got exposed by the numbered, she had no real choice, but to withdraw from SW. Also, after doing a completely separate situation, the rumors about Alice turned out to actually be real. Although she is a skilled assassin with expert skills, she is certainly not easy to control. What he doesn't get is that if she is somebody they can barely even control, and she has amazing skills, she should be categorized as someone unnecessary to the organization. Ijin says that if reason is using her, it means that she is much more skilled than they previously thought. 006 notes that it's precisely it, and Forrest is controlling Alice because they have access to her weakness, so she has no choice but to follow what they order her to do. Ijin ponders deeply about this, and wonders what it is. That night he goes for a run, and thinks about what 006 said before they closed the call. This rumor isn't really confirmed, but he thinks that her weakness is her family. Suddenly, a ray of light comes closer to him, and Ijin's eyes widen. That ray of light was from Alice's motorcycle, who is also quite surprised to see him at this time of night. However, she notes that this is some great timing, as she is leaving right now, and she really wanted to say goodbye. Ijin asks why she's leaving so suddenly, and she explains that something personal popped up, so she can't stay here any longer. She was just about to leave, when they fortunately ran into each other. Ijin just stares at her, like he usually does with anything. Alice asks him to take care of himself, with a rather melancholic smile on her face. That's when Ijin asks her if she has any family to speak of. This question takes her by surprise, as she didn't expect it from him, but she notes that she does, a younger brother, 
who is around the same age as him. Actually, when he looks at him, it reminds him of her little brother. Ijin stares silently once again, and Alice encourages him to stay on this path, the path of being a real bodyguard, as he has a ton of talent for it. With that, she puts her visor back on and sprints away into the night. Ijin is now left alone to think about everything. The next day, after finishing training, the team leader thanks everyone for their hard work. A teammate comes next to Ijin and asks how he was today. Did he perhaps improve in any way? Ijin explains that if he's asking if anything has changed from what he was before, then he is not too sure if he's being honest. The teammate's hopes are shattered and the others laugh at him, noting that Ijin just can't lie about these types of things. It's just in his nature. Suddenly, Ijin spots the lieutenant standing at the door, which makes him smile. They walk while talking, and Ijin notes that he is doing pretty well right now, as his colleagues are helping him a ton with a lot of stuff. The lieutenant is glad to hear that, as the platoon was very worried about him leaving. Ijin notes that he will make time to visit soon, to cull those worries. He also asks him if he is here to meet his fiance, Chi Ye, but he explains that he is actually here to see him for something important. He heard that the chief is sick, and it doesn't seem to be just a simple illness, and he most likely doesn't have that much time left. He just thought he should know, since they were close. Ijin stares at him, and processes the notion. The lieutenant asks if he is going to visit, and Ijin confirms that he will, after telling his family, he will be leaving. The lieutenant smiles, and notes that he thought he would say something of the nature, so he already got him a plane ticket. Ijin thanks him, and later, they are both on the plane. The lieutenant breaks the silence, and notes that the chief helped him a lot when he said he was heading home and leaving that place. But back then, he didn't understand what he did that helped him so much, as he thought he was a simple con man, who was planning to use him. However, since they have the time now, he will ask, what is his relationship with him? Ijin notes that he just saved him, and says only that. However, this makes him think of the first time he met him, when he was extremely injured, and woke up in a strange place so he was very weary. Suddenly someone said that if he moved so suddenly, his injuries will bleed again, as they will open up. The man who said that is the chief, who was holding a towel, some bandages, and a tray of water. Ijin immediately picked up the most available weapon and got ready to defend himself, something which was second nature to him. The chief noticed that his wounds opened up again, so he walked towards him. While putting the tray down, the chief asked Ijin if he is really going to stab the person who saved him and carried him several kilometers with some scissors. This made Ijin stop, and the chief urged him to think rationally about this situation. If he wanted him dead, he would have killed him by now. And if he wanted to do something with him, he would have been tied up, right? He gets to treating his wounds and explains that he brought him here after finding him just floating in the river with immense injuries. He was extremely lucky, however, as at first, he was barely able to breathe, and thought that he was going to die on the spot. Ijin looked at him with a much calmer but still dangerous look. The chief noted that he shouldn't think about something so ridiculous, and focus on getting better as fast as he can. And when his injuries are fully healed and he can stand up fully once again, he needs to leave, and quickly. Eventually, Ijin healed enough to get up from his bed and walk out, where he saw tons of mercenaries, some staring at him, others minding their business but most were intrigued by his appearance. Suddenly a girl comes next to him and is surprised that he is able to move now. But is it really fine to do that with such injuries? She previously thought he was dead when their chieftain brought him here. But how did he end up being so hurt in the first place? Ijin, who was much colder than he is in the present, just stared at her. And she thinks that his throat must have also been injured, or he doesn't know how to talk yet. Suddenly the mercenaries come next to them, and tell the girl, Everine, to not go near that boy. She asks why, and the man explains that he is an outsider, so they do not know the extent of what he can do, and what he is currently thinking. He also tells Ijin that he can't just walk outside because he just wishes to, as they themselves will bring him outside once he is fully recovered. All he needs to do is stay put until that happens. Everine smiles and asks why they are so cautious about him anyway, as he is just an injured kid. The man laughs at this notion, as those scars can't be attained just by playing around, like a kid should. They both stare at each other with the same eyes. The eyes of a killer. Everine notes that she gets it already, so she won't go near him. 
While leaving, she tells Ijin to not push himself at all and focus on recovery. The chief comes next to him and explains that, although he was the one who healed him, it was that girl who stayed beside him through the night while he was still unconscious. She was looking after him the whole night, most of the time, so the least he can do is show her an ounce of respect. The others are reacting like this because this village is pretty secluded, so people get weary when a stranger like him arrives, but it doesn't mean he needs to be on full alert the entire time, like he is currently. Even though these people are making those faces, they won't bring him any harm, unless he does something stupid, of course. Ijin spots the military gear and the weapons, so he asks if he is in a military base. The chief is surprised by his question, but he can see why he asked that, but no, he is not. However, this is not just an ordinary village. He also isn't from this place, but he has been here for a while, treating the casualties from the war. But as time passed and passed, a small town was formed by the people who gathered here, thought there are still some people like Everine, who have no place to live except in here. The chief continues to explain that this is a town of mercenaries, and people here mostly work as mercs. And since this is a town that is formed by war casualties at its center, most people earn their living based on their skills. A few cars pull up, and a few men ask the chief to hurry, as they don't want to be late. While doing that, the chief tells Ejin a few other words. This is why he asked him to leave after he got treated, because everyone here has no choice but to continue living in here, unlike him. With that, he leaves, and the mercenaries start to bicker around waiting so much. Ejin looks at them, and something grabs his attention. Everine, who insists that he focuses on recovery. That night, while Ejin sleeps in his bed, a large explosion awakes him, and he is now in full alert. Outside, two trucks filled with men attack the village, which can't hold that much resistance, as this attack has taken them by surprise. The mercenaries try to hide the innocents, and that's when a large man, who seems to be the leader, orders his men to bring everyone out. Another soldier comes next to him, and notes that the intel is correct. All of the hard-hitting mercenaries in this town are gone for the time being. The leader commands them to bring everyone outside and kill them, so that they can set an example for these dogs. Also, they will set those explosives in here, and detonate them once they return. A little surprise. With this, the price for opposing him all of this time will be paid, in blood. Ejin hides and looks outside, but that's when the door slowly creaks open. It's Avarin, who tells him to run away from here, as there are looters outside. Ejin asks what looters, but there is no time to explain, as he needs to get out of here, right now. Ejin asks what she will do, and Avarin starts crying. Her mother was already captured, so she can't leave, so at least he should escape. Suddenly a few soldiers get in front of the house and scream that they will be searching this one. Two men bust the door open and look around, where they spot Avarin quivering, and their smiles grow wide. Suddenly Ejin grabs the weapon of the first man and hits him in the elbow. The other tries to shoot, but can't because his comrade is in front of him. Ejin hits him with the butt of the gun, which instantly knocks him out, and also does the same to the other. Ejin looks at the both of them, and Avarin at him. They were right. This is no ordinary kid. In another place, while the chief and the head mercenary of the village talk about potential deal, one of the mercs rushes in, which makes the head mercenary note that he should be shamed for interrupting him with a client. The mercenary apologizes, but he has some urgent news that need attending now. The looters are attacking the town as they speak, so they should get moving, while they still can. After hearing this, the head mercenary announced that they are all heading back, and to tell everyone to pack up, now. In the village, Ejin grabs whatever he can from the looters, most importantly, ammo, and one of the firearms. Avarine looks at him in shock, as the moves that he performed just now, they were that of mercenaries, as he saw the others from this town do the exact same thing. Is this perhaps why they were so fearful of him when he first got here? She remembers when she looked after him, the chief told her to not get attached, but she notes that she knows that he is going to leave this place soon enough, so he shouldn't be worried. The chief looked down and said that this is not what he meant, which puzzled her at the time. She also remembers when the head mercenary observed how many scars he has, which can only be achieved by fighting. Suddenly, Ejin breaks her out of her head by telling her to keep focused and that she should follow him as they are leaving this place as fast as humanly possible. Avarine tells him to stop and asks him to save her mother, 
also the other people from the village too. She knows already that what she's asking may be something impossible, but he's truly the only person left that she can ask for help at this point. The looters are going to butcher everyone from this town soon enough, and that would be the end of it. Ijin asks if that is a formal request, as he heard that this is a town of mercenaries. This answer takes Avrin by surprise, but nonetheless she responds. She does not have any money to hire him for his services, but the others might, once they return. Ijin stops her, and says that money isn't needed. The kindness he owes her, that can be what he is paid in. With that, he turns his back away from her, and thinks that she stayed besides him the whole night, and now it's time to repay that debt. Shortly after making it outside, he starts killing off the looters. He takes one down with a pair of scissors, and when another comes around, he throws it in his chest and knocks him out before he can do anything. Even if he is swift and powerful, his wounds have not healed fully, and they start to open again. However, he doesn't have a choice but to move on, so he grabs the pair of scissors from the body and moves on. The looters round up everyone left alive and put them in front of their commander. One of the looters asks him if they should start to just kill them off, but the commander notes that they will wait, as the execution will begin once everyone else is here, just because he wants to see their frowning faces as they see their loved ones die. Eventually, Ijin makes his way around, killing more and more looters, but arrives at the spot where the people from town are kept, and spots their commander, as it's pretty obvious which one it is. Seeing that the looters are preparing to kill everyone there, he puts his firearm down and moves swiftly forwards. He waits in an obvious spot, and eventually two looters catch him, exactly what he planned. They also bring him into the group of townspeople, but forgot tying his hands up, which is a surprise, but a most welcome one. The looters lays around for a while, but the moment on of them announces that they found some dead bodies, Ejin slits the throat of a nearby looter and rushes in on the commander with killing intent. The looters try to shoot him down, but he is too swift and manages to get behind the commander, which disables them from shooting in his direction. He throws half of the scissors into the neck of the one close to the commander and gets on top of him. He slowly but surely brings the commander to his knees and threatens everyone to not move, or they will have to elect another leader. Time freezes as everyone watches what is happening with surprise and most with anticipation. The commander screams at his man to lay their weapons down and they reluctantly do so. The commander notes that, for a little kid like him, he is quite skilled, but maybe because he is too young, he is still too dumb, as what is he going to do after this? Even if he does want to end his life, this puny weapon he is threatening him with is useless, unless he hits his vital spot in one hit. Additionally, even if he were to die, his men will shoot him down the moment he gets up, so all roads lead to death. However, if he stops right now, he may be able to take him in and raise him as a strong warrior. He will allow him power. He couldn't even imagine for his age, something that even those much older than him yearn to have. If he's not convinced yet, he will also let everyone from here go, to commemorate taking such a gem in. Slowly, Ejin looks at the plunderers around him. Two on the left, two on the right, and two more in the front. The commander thinks that since this guy is only a child, he will probably take his offer as it's something he can't realistically refuse. He tries to talk with him, but in that moment, Ejin pulls out his gun from the holster and aims it at the plunderers. Three shots go out, and three people are killed. Swiftly, two others are killed, and with his aim, Ejin manages to take out most of them, with only a few remaining. Out of fear for his life, one starts spraying the bullets around Ejin's head, but even when a bullet grazes him, he remains motionless and kills him and the last three that remain. Silence falls after this, as the townspeople look in amazement, and some in shock at what just happened. Before the commander can even think of doing anything, Ejin shoots him in the back of his head with the last bullet of the gun, which is now smoking from all of the action it just did. The townspeople look at him, unsure of what to do at this point, but Ejin tells them to pick up their guns, as there is definitely going to be stray plunderers around, so they should at least defend themselves. With that, they get to arming themselves, and eventually the head mercenary and his group get back to the town, where they find a lot of bodies, mostly on the enemy's side. The mercenaries that remain greet the head mercenary, and he asks, What happened? Did the plunderers attack in few numbers? The man explains that this is not the case, as there were more than 40 people, and Immortal himself led them into battle. 
The head mercenary is extremely shocked by this, as he didn't expect for the immortal to actually come here. The chief thinks that, regardless of that, he had been previously increasing harassments against this town, but he didn't think that he would actually act now. The head mercenary explains that no matter how they manage to stop him this time, they will certainly attack again, and will bring even more troops, to make sure that it will be a success. One of the mercenaries explains that will never happen, as they have take care of all of his troops, and also him, Immortal is officially dead. The head mercenary, and everyone around him, are quite shocked by this revelation, and they find that very hard to believe. The mercenaries note that the entire town was on the brink of annihilation after the attack, as they were all captured. But that child took care of Immortal, along most of the plunderers, thus saving their lives. That child is Ejin, who is just sitting on a bench, with a firearm still in hand. The head mercenary asks if he's talking about that boy the chief saved, and the mercenary tells him that's him, and that, out of all the plunderers, they only managed to finish off less than ten. Everything calms down eventually, and Ejin watches with a tired expression as Averin reunites with her mother, something which seems to awaken something in him. Suddenly the chief comes next to him, and thanks him for everything. This is the first thing he felt he should say to him. Ejin notes that he was the one who helped him first, which makes the chief look at him and sigh. He explains that his name is Lucas, and that this village was created when he started his medical practice. And directly because of that, people who started gathering around him called him the chief, even though that title just doesn't seem to suit him. He also asks Ejin for his name, but he sits in silence for a while and looks at Avrin's mother, who is comforting her with a warm smile. This unlocks a bit of his past memory. When the plane crashed, his mother held him tightly and told him that she and his father love him more than anything else in the entire world. They love him, and no matter what, he will always be their Jin. The memory fades before he find out anything else, and his eyes turn hollow for a second as his brain tries to return back to normal. With nothing left, he tells Lucas that his name is Jin, from what he remembers at least. In the present, Ejin arrives back at the village, and all of the mercenaries look at him, while whispering to each other that this must be the Jin of legend, the one who saved their town. Suddenly, Avarin appears, and before anything, she rushes to hug him, something that he doesn't know how to respond to. The lieutenant also looks at this with a giddy expression, surely wondering if there's something between these two. Avarin asks Ejin what brings him here, and he explains that he heard the chief is sickly, so he came to visit him. Avrin smiles and tells him to follow, as the chief will be very happy to see him. While they walk, he asks how his condition is, and Avrin explains that it's not great, as he cannot move his eyes, and at this point, can barely see. Eventually they arrive, and Avrin tells the chief that Jin is back, who is now standing besides him. Slowly, he opens his mostly blinded eyes, and asks him, why did he come back? Avrin notes that he came after he heard he was sick, and the chief says that he knew already that his health isn't good. This is only the cycle of life, his body is frail, and his time is approaching. After hearing this, Avarine notes that she will go get some air, but Ejin can see that she's barely holding her tears in. The chief asks Ejin, has he met his family, and how did they welcome him? Ejin explains that he is currently staying with his family, and they welcomed him very warmly. He has a younger sister, and a grandfather, with both of them treating him well, too well, in his opinion. Also, his real name is Yu Ijin. Silence falls, and the chief tells him that he is very glad to see him doing well. But he has one last request, one thing he wants from him, to go back right now and never look back. And no matter what, never, ever, come back to this place. Ijin tries to deny this, but the chief musters any strength he has left to tell him sternly, this is his last wish, the last things he wants done before he dies. Ejin looks at him with a sad expression and accepts his request. He starts walking away, but the chief notes that, even with this, it was nice to see him before he departs from this world. This makes Ejin suddenly jolt, but he doesn't say anything and leaves. When he gets out, the lieutenant asks if he's fine, which makes Ejin muster a smile and say that he thinks it's time to go back now, as he has done what he wanted to do. That's when the head mercenary comes around and asks, Why did he come? Is this a place where he can leave and enter as he pleases, 
Is this some sort of exotic vacation for him? Averin tries to tell him that he only came for the chief, but the head mercenary doesn't even listen to her, as that has nothing to do with him. He is the one who abandoned the chief in this town because he didn't need them anymore. He acts like a loved ally, but once he got his memories back, he left them behind like trash. Isn't it natural for them to regard him as a traitorous dog? He is not welcomed in here anymore, so he should leave, now. The others look at him, and they all share the same sentiment, that he is a traitor. Averine tries to jump to his defense, but Ejin says that it's fine, as he was going to leave now anyways. She tries to stop him, but he turns around, look into her eyes one last time, and tells her to take care, with a gentle yet fake smile. With that, both him and the lieutenant get back into the car. Avrin watches all of this and starts screaming at everyone. Just what the hell is their problem? His memory came back, and he has somewhere to call home now, so they should be happy for him now, right? The head mercenary explains that naturally, he is also glad for him. There is not a single person here who isn't happy to hear that he got his memories back, and even when he left, all of them were hoping that he could finally meet his family and live a normal life. He helped out all of them, personally or not. They are all basically indebted to him. Averine asks them, why treat him like that? They may never be able to see him again after this. The head mercenary notes that, if they don't do it like this, properly, that little bastard will become attached to this place. He should just forget this place even existed and live a happy life with his family. He hopes he does that at least. Averin now understands, and they all look forwards, as even if this was a sad ending to all of this, it will allow him to move on and find peace. While sleeping, Ejin remembers the time when the chief invited him to stay in the town for a while, if he has nowhere to go while also bandaging his wounds. However, there is one condition to all of this. The moment he has a place to go back to, he leaves, no matter what. Ejin agreed at the time, but shortly afterwards, he requested to be a mercenary, something which infuriated the chief, as he wasn't asking him to be a merc when he told him to stay. Ejin explained that statistically, there is no reason not to. He has higher combat abilities than anyone else in this town. Isn't this the practical choice here? The chief got even madder, and told him that this is not about efficiency or things like that. It's about him, still being a child. Ejin said that he heard this is the only choice if they want this town to survive. Additionally, their combat power has dwindled due to recent events, so this is a problem that is directly related to the survival of this town, right? The chief's expression turns from an angry one to a sad one, as he wondered, just what kind of life has this child been living? Eugene suddenly wakes up from his slumber, as his phone is ringing, as the lieutenant is calling him. First, he asks if he made it back safely, and the lieutenant confirms that he did, but he has some news. The chief passed away just as they left town, in fact. Ejin doesn't know how to take this information, so he sits in silence. Eventually, he thanks the lieutenant for telling him, which makes him asks, is he really okay? Ejin confirmed that he is, so the lieutenant leaves him with a last message that the chief wanted him to hear. The contents of this message are hidden from us, but after it is done, Ejin closes the call and looks down with an awfully sad expression. Suddenly, Dayun knocks at his door, and tells him to come and eat, as they have dinner ready. He says that he will come now, but before leaving, she looks at him for a bit, which makes him ask what's wrong. She says that it's nothing, so he should follow her to the table. They all have a good meal while talking, and nothing seems to be wrong, as Ejin tries to hide his sadness with smiles. After dinner, Dayun offers to do the dishes, while the grandpa notes that they should walk for a bit. Ejin agrees, and while they do so, the grandpa asks if he's okay, as he looks like he's having a hard time holding something in. Ejin is surprised by this, and asks what he means. The grandpa explains that ever since he came back to Korea from his trip, he looked sad, but earlier, he looked much worse, which surprised him a bit. Dayun also worried about him a lot too, so did something happen, as he said he was going to see someone he had met before. Ejin takes a breath in, and explains that the person he went to see now, is the same who saved his life. He was the one that took care of him a lot before he came here, and the one who fed him a lot of food to stay healthy, even if he didn't want to eat that much. When he finally got his memories back, he told him, and he immediately told him to go back, to his family, his loved ones. Since he wasn't feeling well due to his old age, he went to see him for a bit, but just now, 
he got received news that he passed away. The grandpa smiles gently and notes that he must have been someone dear to him, right? If he feels sad, however, he should just let it all out at once and cry. Ejin is surprised by this proposition, but tears already start rolling down on his face, something which shocks him further, as this is a first. The grandpa hugs him tightly as he gently cries on his shoulder. The contents of the message the chief left him are as follows. Thank you for making me feel like a father again. Thank you for watching. See you next time.